Volume One, Chapter One of Emma. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Emma by Jane Austen. Volume One, Chapter One. Emma Woodhouse, handsome, clever, and rich, with a comfortable home and happy disposition, seemed to unite some of the best blessings of existence, and had lived nearly twenty-one years in the world with very little to distress or vex her. She was the youngest of the two daughters of a most affectionate, indulgent father, and had, in consequence of her sister's marriage, been mistress of his house from a very early period. Her mother had died too long ago for her to have more than an indistinct remembrance of her caresses, and her place had been supplied by an excellent woman as governess, who had fallen little short of a mother in affection. Sixteen years had Miss Taylor been in Mr. Woodhouse's family, less as a governess than a friend, very fond of both daughters, but particularly of Emma. Between them it was more the intimacy of sisters. Even before Miss Taylor had ceased to hold the nominal office of governess, the mildness of her temper had hardly allowed her to impose any restraint, and the shadow of authority being now long passed away, they had been living together as friend and friend very mutually attached, and Emma doing just what she liked highly esteeming Miss Taylor's judgment, but directed chiefly by her own. The real evils, indeed, of Emma's situation were the power of having rather too much her own way, and a disposition to think a little too well of herself. These were the disadvantages which threatened alloy to her many enjoyments. The danger, however, was at present so unperceived, that they did not by any means rank as misfortunes with her. Sorrow came, a gentle sorrow but not at all in the shape of any disagreeable consciousness. Miss Taylor married. It was Miss Taylor's loss which first brought grief. It was on the wedding-day of this beloved friend that Emma first sat in mournful thought of any continuance. The wedding over and the bride-people gone, her father and herself were left to dine together, with no prospect of a third to cheer a long evening. Her father composed himself to sleep after dinner as usual, and she had then only to sit and think of what she had lost. The event had every promise of happiness for her friend. Mr. Weston was a man of unexceptionable character, easy fortune, suitable age and pleasant manners, and there was some satisfaction in considering with what self-denying, generous friendship she had always wished and promoted the match. But it was a black morning's work for her. The want of Miss Taylor would be felt every hour of every day. She recalled her past kindness, the kindness, the affection of sixteen years. How she had taught and how she had played with her from five years old. How she had devoted all her powers to attach and amuse her in health, and how nursed her through the various illnesses of childhood. A large debt of gratitude was owing her. But the intercourse of the last seven years, the equal footing and perfect unreserve which had soon followed Isabella's marriage, on their being left to each other, was yet a dearer, tenderer recollection. She had been a friend and companion such as few possessed, intelligent, well-informed, useful, gentle, knowing all the ways of the family, interested in all its concerns, and peculiarly interested in herself, in every pleasure, every scheme of hers one to whom she could speak every thought as it arose, and who had such an affection for her as could never find fault. How was she to bear the change? It was true that her friend was going only half a mile from them, but Emma was aware that great must be the difference between a Mrs. Weston only half a mile from them, and a Miss Taylor in the house. And with all her advantages, natural and domestic, she was now in great danger of suffering from intellectual solitude. She dearly loved her father, but he was no companion for her. He could not meet her in conversation, rational or playful. The evil of the actual disparity in their ages, and Mr. Woodhouse had not married early, was much increased by his constitution and habits, for having been a valetudinarian all his life, without activity of mind or body, he was a much older man in ways than in years, and though everywhere beloved for the friendliness of his heart and his amiable temper, his talents could not have recommended him at any time. Her sister, though comparatively but little removed by matrimony, being settled in London only sixteen miles off, was much beyond her daily reach, 
and many a long October and November evening must be struggled through at Hartfield, before Christmas brought the next visit from Isabella and her husband and their little children, to fill the house and give her pleasant society again. Highbury, the large and populous village almost amounting to a town, to which Hartfield, in spite of its separate lawn and shrubberies and name, did really belong, afforded her no equals. The woodhouses were first in consequence there. All looked up to them. She had many acquaintance in the place, for her father was universally civil, but not one among them who could be accepted in lieu of Miss Taylor for even half a day. It was a melancholy change, and Emma could not but sigh over it, and wish for impossible things, till her father awoke and made it necessary to be cheerful. His spirits required support. He was a nervous man, easily depressed fond of everybody that he was used to, and hating to part with them, hating change of every kind. Matrimony, as the origin of change, was always disagreeable, and he was by no means yet reconciled to his own daughter's marrying, nor could ever speak of her but with compassion, though it had been entirely a match of affection, when he was now obliged to part with Miss Taylor, too. And from his habits of gentle selfishness, and of being never able to suppose that other people could feel differently from himself, he was very much disposed to think Miss Taylor had done as sad a thing for herself as for them, and would have been a great deal happier if she had spent all the rest of her life at Hartfield. Emma smiled and chatted as cheerfully as she could, to keep him from such thoughts. But when tea came, it was impossible for him not to say exactly as he had at dinner. "'Poor Miss Taylor! I wish she were here again! What a pity it is that Mr. West never thought of her!" "'I cannot agree with you, papa. You know I cannot. Mr. Weston is such a good-humoured, pleasant, excellent man, that he thoroughly deserves a good wife. And you would not have had Miss Taylor live with us for ever, and bear all my odd humours, when she might have a house of her own." "'A house of her own! But where is the advantage of a house of her own? This is three times as large. And you never have any odd humours, my dear." "'How often we shall be going to see them, and they coming to see us! We shall be always meeting. We must begin. We must go and pay wedding visit very soon." "'My dear, how am I to get so far? Randall's is such a distance. I could not walk half so far." "'No, papa, nobody thought of your walking. We must go in the carriage, to be sure." "'The carriage? But James will not like to put the horses to for such a little way. And where are the poor horses to be while we are paying our visit?" "'They are to be put into Mr. Weston's stable, papa. You know we have settled all that already. We talked it all over with Mr. Weston last night. And as for James, you may be very sure he will always like going to Randall's, because of his daughter's being housemaid there. I only doubt whether he will ever take us anywhere else. That was your doing, papa. You got Hannah that good place. Nobody thought of Hannah till you mentioned her. James is so obliged to you." I am very glad I did think of her. It was very lucky, for I would not have had poor James think himself slighted upon any account, and I am sure she will make a very good servant. She is a civil, pretty-spoken girl. I have a great opinion of her. Whenever I see her, she always curtsies and asks me how I do in a very pretty manner. And when you have had her here to do needlework, I observe she always turns the lock of the door the right way, and never bangs it. I am sure she will be an excellent servant, and it will be a great comfort to poor Miss Taylor to have somebody about her that she is used to see. Whenever James goes over to see his daughter, you know, she will be hearing of us. He will be able to tell her how we all are." Emma spared no exertions to maintain this happier flow of ideas, and hoped, by the help of backgammon, to get her father tolerably through the evening, and be attacked by no regrets but her own. The backgammon table was placed, but a visitor immediately afterwards walked in, and made it unnecessary. Mr. Knightley, a sensible man about seven or eight and thirty, was not only a very old and intimate friend of the family, but particularly connected with it, as the elder brother of Isabella's husband. He lived about a mile from Highbury, was a frequent visitor, and always welcome. And at this time more welcome than usual, as coming directly from their mutual connections in London. 
He had returned to a late dinner, after some days' absence, and now walked up to Hartfield to say that they were all well in Brunswick Square. It was a happy circumstance, and animated Mr. Woodhouse for some time. Mr. Knightley had a cheerful manner, which always did him good, and his many inquiries after poor Isabella and her children were answered most satisfactorily. When this was over, Mr. Woodhouse gratefully observed, "'It is very kind of you, Mr. Knightley, to come out at this late hour to call upon us. I am afraid you must have had a shocking walk.' "'Not at all, sir. It is a beautiful moonlit night, and so mild that I must draw back from your great fire.' "'But you must have found it very damp and dirty. I wish you may not catch cold.' "'Dirty, sir? Look at my shoes! Not a speck on them!' "'Well, that is quite surprising, for we have had a vast deal of rain here. It rained dreadfully hard for half an hour while we were at breakfast. I wanted them to put off the wedding.' "'By the by, I have not wished you joy. Being pretty well aware of what sort of joy you must both be feeling, I have been in no hurry with my congratulations. But I hope it all went off tolerably well. How did you all behave? Who cried most? Oh, poor Miss Taylor! Tis a sad business. Poor Mr. and Miss Woodhouse, if you please, but I cannot possibly say, poor Miss Taylor. I have a great regard for you and Emma. But when it comes to the question of dependence or independence, at any rate, it must be better to have only one to please than two. Especially when one of those two is such a fanciful, troublesome creature," said Emma playfully. "'That is what you have in your head, I know, and what you would certainly say if my father were not by." "'I believe it is very true, my dear, indeed,' said Mr. Woodhouse, with a sigh. I am afraid I am sometimes very fanciful and troublesome." "'My dearest papa! You do not think I could mean you, or suppose Mr. Knightley to mean you. What a horrible idea! Oh, no! I meant only myself. Mr. Knightley loves to find fault with me, you know. In a joke, it is all a joke. We always say what we like to one another." Mr. Knightley, in fact, was one of the few people who could see faults in Emma Woodhouse, and the only one who ever told her of them, and though this was not particularly agreeable to Emma herself, she knew it would be so much less to her father, that she would not have him really suspect such a circumstance as her being not thought perfect by everybody. "'Emma knows I never flatter her,' said Mr. Knightley. "'But I meant no reflection on anybody. Miss Taylor has been used to have two persons to please. She will now have but one. The chances are that she must be a gainer." "'Well,' said Emma, willing to let it pass, "'you want to hear about the wedding, and I shall be happy to tell you, for we all behaved charmingly. Everybody was punctual, everybody in their best looks, not a tear and hardly a long face to be seen. Oh, no! We all felt that we were going to be only half a mile apart, and were sure of meeting every day." "'Dear Emma bears everything so well,' said her father. "'But, Mr. Knightley, she is really very sorry to lose poor Miss Taylor, and I am sure she will miss her more than she thinks for.' Emma turned away her head, divided between tears and smiles. "'It is impossible that Emma should not miss such a companion,' said Mr. Knightley. "'We should not like her so well as we do, sir, if we could suppose it. But she knows how much the marriage is to Miss Taylor's advantage. She knows how very acceptable it must be, at Miss Taylor's time of life, to be settled in a home of her own, and how important to her to be secure of a comfortable provision, and therefore cannot allow herself to feel so much pain as pleasure. Every friend of Miss Taylor must be glad to have her so happily married." "'And you have forgotten one matter of joy to me,' said Emma, "'and a very considerable one, that I made the match myself. I made the match, you know, four years ago, and to have it take place, and be proved in the right, when so many people said Mr. Weston would never marry again, may comfort me for anything." Mr. Knightley shook his head at her. Her father fondly replied, "'Ah, my dear, I wish you would not make matches and foretell things, for whatever you say always comes to pass. Pray do not make any more matches.' "'I promise you to make none for myself, papa. But I must indeed for other people. It is the greatest amusement in the world. And after such success, you know! Everybody said that Mr. Weston would never marry again. 
Oh, dear, no! Mr. Weston, who had been a widower so long, and who seemed so perfectly comfortable without a wife, so constantly occupied either in his business in town or among his friends here, always acceptable wherever he went, always cheerful. Mr. Weston need not spend a single evening in the year alone if he did not like it. Oh, no! Mr. Weston certainly would never marry again. Some people even talked of a promise to his wife on her deathbed, and others of the son and the uncle not letting him. All manner of solemn nonsense was talked on the subject, but I believe none of it. Ever since the day, about four years ago, that Miss Taylor and I met with him in Broadway Lane, when, because it began to drizzle, he darted away with so much gallantry, and borrowed two umbrellas for us from Farmer Mitchell's, I made up my mind on the subject. I planned the match from that hour. And when such success has blessed me in this instance, dear papa, you cannot think that I shall leave off matchmaking." "'I do not understand what you mean by success,' said Mr. Knightley. "'Success supposes endeavour. Your time has been properly and delicately spent, if you have been endeavouring for the last four years to bring about this marriage. A worthy employment for a young lady's mind. But if, which I rather imagine your making the match, as you call it, means only your planning it, your saying to yourself one idle day, I think it would be a very good thing for Miss Taylor if Mr. Weston were to marry her, and saying it again to yourself every now and then afterwards, why do you talk of success? Where is your merit? What are you proud of? You made a lucky guess, and that is all that can be said." "'And have you never known the pleasure and triumph of a lucky guess? I pity you. I thought you cleverer. For, depend upon it, a lucky guess is never merely luck. There is always some talent in it. And as to my poor word, success, which you quarrel with, I do not know that I am so entirely without any claim to it. You have drawn two pretty pictures, but I think there may be a third, a something between the do-nothing and the do-all. If I had not promoted Mr. Weston's visits here, and given many little encouragements, and smoothed many little matters, it might not have come to anything after all. I think you must know Hartfield enough to comprehend that." "'A straightforward, open-hearted man like Weston, and a rational, unaffected woman like Miss Taylor, may be safely left to manage their own concerns. You are more likely to have done harm to yourself than good to them by interference." Emma never thinks of herself, if she can do good to others," rejoined Mr. Woodhouse, understanding but in part. "'But, my dear, pray do not make any more matches. They are silly things, and break up one's family circle grievously." "'Only one more, papa. Only for Mr. Elton. Poor Mr. Elton! You like Mr. Elton, papa. I must look about for a wife for him. There is nobody in Highbury who deserves him. And he has been here a whole year, and has fitted up his house so comfortably, that it would be a shame to have him single any longer. And I thought, when he was joining their hands to-day, he looked so very much as if he would like to have the same kind office done for him. I think very well of Mr. Elton, and this is the only way I have of doing him a service." "'Mr. Elton is a very pretty young man, to be sure, and a very good young man, and I have a great regard for him. But if you want to shew him any attention, my dear, ask him to come and dine with us some day. That'll be a much better thing. I dare say Mr. Knightley will be so kind as to meet him." "'With a great deal of pleasure, sir, at any time,' said Mr. Knightley, laughing. "'And I agree with you entirely that it will be a much better thing. Invite him to dinner, Emma, and help him to the best of the fish and the chicken, but leave him to choose his own wife. Depend upon it. A man of six or seven and twenty can take care of himself. End of chapter one. Volume one, chapter two of Emma. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Emma by Jane Austen. Volume one, chapter two. Mr. Weston was a native of Highbury, and born of a respectable family, which for the last two or three generations had been rising into gentility and property. He had received a good education, but on succeeding early in life to a small independence, had become indisposed for any of the more homely pursuits in which his brothers were engaged, 
and had satisfied an active, cheerful mind and social temper by entering into the militia of his county then embodied. Captain Weston was a general favourite, and when the chances of his military life had introduced him to Miss Churchill, of a great Yorkshire family, and Miss Churchill fell in love with him, nobody was surprised, except her brother and his wife, who had never seen him, and who were full of pride and importance, which the connection would offend. Miss Churchill, however, being of age, and with the full command of her fortune, though her fortune bore no proportion to the family estate, was not to be dissuaded from the marriage, and it took place, to the infinite mortification of Mr. and Mrs. Churchill, who threw her off with due decorum. It was an unsuitable connection, and did not produce much happiness. Mrs. Weston ought to have found more in it, for she had a husband whose warm heart and sweet temper made him think everything due to her in return for the great goodness of being in love with him, but though she had one sort of spirit, she had not the best. She had resolution enough to pursue her own will in spite of her brother, but not enough to refrain from unreasonable regrets at that brother's unreasonable anger, nor from missing the luxuries of her former home. They had lived beyond their income, but still it was nothing in comparison of Anscombe. She did not cease to love her husband, but she wanted at once to be the wife of Captain Weston, and Miss Churchill of Anscombe. Captain Weston, who had been considered especially by the Churchills as making such an amazing match, was proved to have much the worst of the bargain, for when his wife died, after a three years' marriage, he was rather a poorer man than at first, and with a child to maintain. From the expense of the child, however, he was soon relieved. The boy had, with the additional softening claim of a lingering illness of his mother's, been the means of a sort of reconciliation, and Mr. and Mrs. Churchill, having no children of their own, nor any other young creature of equal kindred to care for, offered to take the whole charge of the little Frank soon after her decease. Some scruples and some reluctance the widower father may be supposed to have felt, but as they were overcome by other considerations, the child was given up to the care and the wealth of the Churchills, and he had only his own comfort to seek, and his own situation to improve as he could. A complete change of life became desirable. He quitted the militia and engaged in trade, having brothers already established in a good way in London, which afforded him a favourable opening. It was a concern which brought just employment enough. He had still a small house in Highbury, where most of his leisure days were spent, and between useful occupation and the pleasures of society, the next eighteen or twenty years of his life passed cheerfully away. He had by that time realised an easy competence, enough to secure the purchase of a little estate adjoining Highbury, which he had always longed for, enough to marry a woman as portionless even as Miss Taylor, and to live according to the wishes of his own friendly and social disposition. It was now some time since Miss Taylor had begun to influence his schemes, but as it was not the tyrannic influence of youth on youth, it had not shaken his determination of never settling, till he could purchase Randall's, and the sale of Randall's was long looked forward to. But he had gone steadily on, with these objects in view, till they were accomplished. He had made his fortune, bought his house, and obtained his wife, and was beginning a new period of existence with every probability of greater happiness than in any yet passed through. He had never been an unhappy man, his own temper had secured him from that, even in his first marriage, but his second must show him how delightful a well-judging and truly amiable woman could be, and must give him the pleasantest proof of its being a great deal better to choose than to be chosen, to excite gratitude than to feel it. He had only himself to please in his choice, his fortune was his own, for as to Frank, it was more than being tacitly brought up as his uncle's heir, it had become so avowed an adoption as to have him assume the name of Churchill on coming of age. It was most unlikely, therefore, that he should ever want his father's assistance. His father had no apprehension of it. The aunt was a capricious woman, and governed her husband entirely, but it was not in Mr. Weston's nature to imagine that any caprice could be strong enough to affect one so dear, and as he believed, so deservedly dear. He saw his son every year in London, and was proud of him, and his fond report of him as a very fine young man had made Highbury feel a sort of pride in him too. He was looked on as sufficiently belonging to the place to make his merits and prospects a kind of common concern. Mr. Frank Churchill was one of the boasts of Highbury, and a lively curiosity to see him prevailed, 
though the compliment was so little return that he had never been there in his life. His coming to visit his father had been often talked of, but never achieved. Now, upon his father's marriage, it was very generally proposed, as a most proper attention, that the visit should take place. There was not a dissentient voice on the subject, either when Mrs. Perry drank tea with Mrs. and Miss Bates, or when Mrs. and Miss Bates returned the visit. Now was the time for Mr. Frank Churchill to come among them, and the hope strengthened when it was understood that he had written to his new mother on the occasion. For a few days, every morning visit in Highbury included some mention of the handsome letter Mrs. Weston had received. I suppose you have heard of the handsome letter Mr. Frank Churchill has written to Mrs. Weston. I understand it was a very handsome letter indeed. Mr. Woodhouse told me of it. Mr. Woodhouse saw the letter, and he says he never saw such a handsome letter in his life." It was, indeed, a highly prized letter. Mrs. Weston had, of course, formed a very favourable idea of the young man, and such a pleasing attention was an irresistible proof of his great good sense, and a most welcome addition to every source and every expression of congratulation which her marriage had already secured. She felt herself a most fortunate woman, and she had lived long enough to know how fortunate she might be well thought, where the only regret was for a partial separation from friends, whose friendship for her had never cooled, and who could ill bear to part from her. She knew that at times she must be missed, and could not think without pain of Emma's losing a single pleasure, or suffering an hour's ennui, from the want of her companionableness. But dear Emma was of no feeble character. She was more equal to her situation than most girls would have been, and had sense and energy and spirits that might be hoped would bear her well and happily, through its little difficulties and privations. And then there was such comfort in the very easy distance of Randalls from Hartfield, so convenient for even solitary female walking, and in Mr. Weston's disposition and circumstances, which would make the approaching season no hindrance to their spending half the evenings in the week together. Her situation was altogether the subject of hours of gratitude to Mrs. Weston, and of moments only of regret. And her satisfaction, her more than satisfaction, her cheerful enjoyment was so just and so apparent, that Emma, well as she knew her father, was sometimes taken by surprise at his being able to still pity poor Miss Taylor when they left her at Randalls in the centre of every domestic comfort, or saw her go away in the evening attended by her pleasant husband to a carriage of her own. But never did she go without Mr. Woodhouse's giving a gentle sigh, and saying, "'Ah, oh, poor Miss Taylor! She would be very glad to stay.' There was no recovering Miss Taylor nor much likelihood of ceasing to pity her, but a few weeks brought some alleviation to Mr. Woodhouse. The compliments of his neighbours were over, he was no longer teased by being wished joy of so sorrowful an event, and the wedding-cake, which had been a great distress to him, was all at up. His own stomach could bear nothing rich, and he could never believe other people to be different from himself. What was unwholesome to him he regarded as unfit for anybody and he had, therefore, earnestly tried to dissuade them from having any wedding-cake at all, and when that proved vain, as earnestly tried to prevent anybody's eating it. He had been at the pains of consulting Mr. Perry, the apothecary, on the subject. Mr. Perry was an intelligent, gentlemanlike man, whose frequent visits were one of the comforts of Mr. Woodhouse's life, and upon being applied to, he could not but acknowledge, though it seemed rather against the bias of inclination, that wedding-cake might certainly disagree with many, perhaps with most people, unless taken moderately. With such an opinion, in confirmation of his own, Mr. Woodhouse hoped to influence every visitor of the newly married pair. But still the cake was eaten, and there was no rest for his benevolent nerves till it was all gone. There was a strange rumour in Highbury of all the little Perrys being seen with a slice of Mrs. Weston's wedding-cake in their hands, but Mr. Woodhouse would never believe it. End of chapter 2《ボリューム1》Chapter 3 of《Emma》。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett.《Emma》by Jane Austen. Volume 1, Chapter 3. Mr. Woodhouse was fond of society in his own way. He liked very much to have his friends come and see him, and from various united causes, from his long residence at Hartfield, and his good nature, 
from his fortune, his house, and his daughter, he could command the visits of his own little circle in a great measure as he liked. He had not much intercourse with any families beyond that circle. His horror of late hours and large dinner-parties made him unfit for any acquaintance but such as would visit him on his own terms. Fortunately for him, Highbury, including Randalls in the same parish, and Donwell Abbey in the parish adjoining, the seat of Mr. Knightley, comprehended many such. Not unfrequently, through Emma's persuasion, he had some of the chosen and the best to dine with him, but evening parties were what he preferred, and unless he fancied himself at any time unequal to company, there was scarcely an evening in the week in which Emma could not make up a card-table for him. Real, long-standing regard brought the Westons and Mr. Knightley, and by Mr. Elton, a young man living alone without liking it, the privilege of exchanging any vacant evening of his own blank solitude, for the elegancies and society of Mr. Woodhouse's drawing-room, and the smiles of his lovely daughter, was in no danger of being thrown away. After these came a second set, among the most come at table of whom were Mrs. and Miss Bates, and Mrs. Goddard three ladies almost always at the service of an invitation from Hartfield, and who were fetched and carried home so often, that Mr. Woodhouse thought it no hardship for either James or the horses. Had it taken place only once a year, it would have been a grievance. Mrs. Bates, the widow of a former vicar of Highbury, was a very old lady, almost past everything but tea and quadrille. She lived with her single daughter in a very small way, and was considered with all the regard and respect which a harmless old lady, under such untoward circumstances, can excite. Her daughter enjoyed a most uncommon degree of popularity, for a woman neither young, handsome, rich, nor married. Miss Bates stood in the very worst predicament in the world for having much of the public favour, and she had no intellectual superiority to make atonement to herself, or frighten those who might hate her into outward respect. She had never boasted either beauty or cleverness. Her youth had passed without distinction, and her middle of life was devoted to the care of a failing mother, and the endeavour to make a small income go as far as possible. And yet she was a happy woman, and a woman whom no one named without good will. It was her own universal good will and contented temper which worked such wonders. She loved everybody, was interested in everybody's happiness, quick-sighted to everybody's merits, thought herself a most fortunate creature, and surrounded with blessings in such an excellent mother, and so many good neighbours and friends, and a home that wanted for nothing. The simplicity and cheerfulness of her nature, her contented and grateful spirit, were a recommendation to everybody, and a mine of felicity to herself. She was a great talker upon little matters, which exactly suited Mr. Woodhouse, full of trivial communications and harmless gossip. Mrs. Goddard was the mistress of a school not of a seminary, or an establishment, or anything which professed in long sentences of refined nonsense, to combine liberal acquirements with elegant morality, upon new principles and new systems, and where young ladies for enormous pay might be screwed out of health and into vanity, but a real, honest, old-fashioned boarding-school, where a reasonable quantity of accomplishments were sold at a reasonable price, and where girls might be sent to be out of the way, and scramble themselves into a little education, without any danger of coming back prodigies. Mrs. Goddard's school was in high repute, and very deservedly, for Highbury was reckoned a particularly healthy spot. She had an ample house and garden, gave the children plenty of wholesome food, let them run about a good deal in the summer, and in winter dressed their chilblains with her own hands. It was no wonder that a train of twenty young couple now walked after her to church. She was a plain, motherly kind of woman, who had worked hard in her youth, and now thought herself entitled to the occasional holiday of a tea-visit, and having formerly owed much to Mr. Woodhouse's kindness, felt his particular claim on her to leave her neat parlour, hung round with fancy-work whenever she could, and win or lose a few sixpences by his fireside. These were the ladies whom Emma found herself very frequently able to collect, and happy was she, for her father's sake, in the power, though as far as she herself was concerned, it was no remedy for the absence of Mrs. Weston. She was delighted to see her father look comfortable, and very much pleased with herself for contriving things so well. But the quiet prosings of three such women made her feel that every evening so spent was indeed one of the long evenings she had fearfully anticipated. 
as she sat one morning, looking forward to exactly such a close of the present day, a note was brought from Mrs. Goddard, requesting, in most respectful terms, to be allowed to bring Miss Smith with her. A most welcome request! For Miss Smith was a girl of seventeen, whom Emma knew very well by sight, and had long felt an interest in, on account of her beauty. A very gracious invitation was returned, and the evening no longer dreaded by the fair mistress of the mansion. Harriet Smith was the natural daughter of somebody. Somebody had placed her several years back at Mrs. Goddard's school, and somebody had lately raised her from the condition of scholar to that of parlour boarder. This was all that was generally known of her history. She had no visible friends but what had been acquired at Highbury, and was just now returned from a long visit in the country to some young ladies, who had been at school there with her. She was a very pretty girl, and her beauty happened to be of a sort which Emma particularly admired. She was short, plump, and fair, with a fine bloom, blue eyes, light hair, regular features, and a look of great sweetness, and before the end of the evening, Emma was as much pleased with her manners as her person, and quite determined to continue the acquaintance. She was not struck by anything remarkably clever in Miss Smith's conversation, but she found her altogether very engaging, not inconveniently shy, not unwilling to talk, and yet so far from pushing, showing so proper and becoming a deference, seeming so pleasantly grateful for being admitted to Hartfield, and so artlessly impressed by the appearance of everything in so superior a style to what she had been used to, that she must have good sense, and deserve encouragement. Encouragement should be given. Those soft blue eyes, and all those natural graces, should not be wasted on the inferior society of Highbury and its connections. The acquaintance she had already formed were unworthy of her. The friends from whom she had just parted, though a very good sort of people, must be doing her harm. They were a family of the name of Martin, whom Emma knew well by character, as renting a large farm of Mr. Knightley, and residing in the parish of Donwell very creditably, she believed. She knew Mr. Knightley thought highly of them. But they must be coarse and unpolished, and very unfit to be the intimates of a girl who wanted only a little more knowledge and elegance to be quite perfect. She would notice her, she would improve her, she would detach her from her bad acquaintance, and introduce her into good society, she would form her opinions and her manners. It would be an interesting, and certainly a very kind undertaking highly becoming her own situation in life, her leisure and powers. She was so busy in admiring those soft blue eyes, in talking and listening, and forming all these schemes in the in-betweens, that the evening flew away at a very unusual rate, and the supper-table, which always closed such parties, and for which she had been used to sit and watch the due time, was all set out and ready, and moved forwards to the fire, before she was aware. With an alacrity beyond the common impulse of a spirit which yet was never indifferent to the credit of doing everything well and attentively, with the real good will of a mind delighted with his own ideas, did she then do all the honours of the meal, and help and recommend the minced chicken and scalloped oysters, with an urgency which she knew would be acceptable to the early hours and civil scruples of their guests. Upon such occasions poor Mr. Woodhouse's feelings were in sad warfare. He loved to have the cloth laid, because it had been the fashion of his youth, but his conviction of suppers being very unwholesome, made him rather sorry to see anything put on it, and while his hospitality would have welcomed his visitors to everything, his care for their health made him grieve that they would eat. Such another small basin of thin gruel as his own was all that he could, with thorough self-approbation, recommend, though he might constrain himself, while the ladies were comfortably clearing the nicer things, to say— Mrs. Bates, let me propose your venturing on one of these eggs. An egg boiled very soft is not unwholesome. Searle understands boiling an egg better than anybody. I would not recommend an egg boiled by anybody else. But you need not be afraid, they are very small, you see. One of our small eggs will not hurt you. Miss Bates, let Emma help you to a little bit of tart, a very little bit. Ours are all apple tarts. You need not be afraid of unwholesome preserves here. I do not advise the custard. Mrs. Goddard, what say you to half a glass of wine? A small half-glass put into a tumbler of water. I do not think it could disagree with you." Emma allowed her father to talk, but supplied her visitors in a much more satisfactory style, and on the present evening had particular pleasure in sending them away happy. The happiness of Miss Smith was quite equal to her intentions. 
Miss Woodhouse was so great a personage in Highbury, that the prospect of the introduction had given as much panic as pleasure, but the humble, grateful little girl went off with highly gratified feelings, delighted with the affability with which Miss Woodhouse had treated her all the evening, and actually shaken hands with her at last. End of chapter 3《Volume One, Chapter Four of Emma. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Emma by Jane Austen. Volume One, Chapter Four. Harriet Smith's intimacy at Hartfield was soon a settled thing. Quick and decided in her ways, Emma lost no time in inviting, encouraging, and telling her to come very often, and as their acquaintance increased, so did their satisfaction in each other. As a walking companion, Emma had very early foreseen how useful she might find her. In that respect Mrs. Weston's loss had been important. Her father never went beyond the shrubbery, where two divisions of the ground sufficed him for his long walk, or his short, as the year varied. And since Mrs. Weston's marriage, her exercise had been too much confined. She had ventured once alone to Randall's, but it was not pleasant, and a Harriet Smith, therefore, one whom she could summon at any time to a walk, would be a valuable addition to her privileges. But in every respect, as she saw more of her, she approved her, and was confirmed in all her kind designs. Harriet certainly was not clever, but she had a sweet, docile, grateful disposition, was totally free from conceit, and only desiring to be guided by any one she looked up to. Her early attachment to herself was very amiable, and her inclination for good company, and power of appreciating what was elegant and clever, showed that there was no want of taste, though strengthening of understanding must not be expected. Altogether she was quite convinced of Harriet Smith's being exactly the young friend she wanted, exactly the something which her home required. Such a friend as Mrs. Weston was out of the question. Two such could never be granted. Two such she did not want. It was quite a different sort of thing, a sentiment distinct and independent. Mrs. Weston was the object of a regard which had its basis in gratitude and esteem. Harriet would be loved as one to whom she could be useful. For Mrs. Weston there was nothing to be done, for Harriet everything. Her first attempts at usefulness were in an endeavour to find out who were the parents, but Harriet could not tell. She was ready to tell everything in her power, but on this subject questions were vain. Emma was obliged to fancy what she liked, but she could never believe that in the same situation she should not have discovered the truth. Harriet had no penetration. She had been satisfied to hear and believe just what Mrs. Goddard chose to tell her, and looked no farther. Mrs. Goddard, and the teachers, and the girls, and the affairs of the school in general, formed naturally a great part of the conversation, and but for her acquaintance with the Martins of Abbey Mill Farm, it must have been the whole. But the Martins occupied her thoughts a good deal. She had spent two very happy months with them, and now loved to talk of the pleasures of her visit, and describe the many comforts and wonders of the place. Emma encouraged her talkativeness, amused by such a picture of another set of beings, and enjoying the youthful simplicity which could speak with so much exultation of Mrs. Martin's having— Two parlours! Two very good parlours, indeed! One of them is quite as large as Mrs. Goddard's drawing-room! And of her having an upper maid who had lived five and twenty years with her! And of their having eight cows! Two of them Aldenies! And one a little Welch cow! A very pretty little Welch cow, indeed! And of Mrs. Martin saying, as she was so fond of it, it should be called her cow! And of their having a very handsome summer-house in their garden, where some day next year they were all to drink tea! A very handsome summer-house, large enough to hold a dozen people. For some time she was amused, without thinking beyond the immediate cause, but as she came to understand the family better, other feelings arose. She had taken up a wrong idea, fancying it was a mother and daughter, a son and son's wife, who all lived together. But when it appeared that the Mr. Martin, who bore a part in the narrative, and was always mentioned with an approbation for his great good nature in doing something or other, was a single man, that there was no young Mrs. Martin, no wife in the case, she did suspect danger to her poor little friend from all this hospitality and kindness, and that, if she were not taken care of, she might be required to sink herself for ever. With this inspiriting notion, her questions increased in number and meaning, and she particularly led Harriet to talk more of Mr. Martin, and there was evidently no dislike to it. 
Harriet was very ready to speak of the share he had had in their moonlight walks and merry evening games, and dwelt a good deal upon his being so very good-humoured and obliging. He had gone three miles round one day in order to bring her some walnuts, because she had said how fond she was of them, and in everything else he was so very obliging. He had his shepherd's son to the parlour one night on purpose to sing to her. She was very fond of singing. He could sing a little himself. She believed he was very clever and understood everything. He had a very fine flock, and while she was with them, he had been bid more for his wool than anybody in the country. She believed everybody spoke well of him. His mother and sisters were very fond of him. Mrs. Martin had told her one day, and there was a blush as she said it, that it was impossible for anybody to be a better son, and therefore she was sure whenever he married he would make a good husband. Not that she wanted him to marry. She was in no hurry at all. "'Well done, Mrs. Martin,' thought Emma. You know what you are about." And when she had come away, Mrs. Martin was so very kind as to send Mrs. Goddard a beautiful goose, the finest goose Mrs. Goddard had ever seen. Mrs. Goddard had dressed it on a Sunday, and asked all the three teachers, Miss Nash and Miss Prince and Miss Richardson, to sup with her. Mr. Martin, I suppose, is not a man of information beyond the line of his own business. He does not read? Oh, yes! That is, no. I do not know, but I believe he has read a good deal, but not what you would think anything of. He reads the agricultural reports and some other books that lay in one of the window-seats, but he reads all them to himself. But sometimes of an evening before we went to cards, he would read something aloud of the elegant extracts, very entertaining, and I know he has read The Vicar of Wakefield. He never read The Romance of the Forest, nor The Children of the Abbey. He has never heard of such books before I mentioned them, but he is determined to get them now as soon as ever he can." The next question was, "'What sort of looking man is Mr. Martin?' "'Oh, not handsome, not at all handsome. I thought him very plain at first, but I do not think him so plain now. One does not, you know, after a time. But did you never see him? He is in Highbury every now and then, and he is sure to ride through every week on his way to Kingston. He has passed you very often.' That may be, and I may have seen him fifty times, but without having any idea of his name. A young farmer, whether on horseback or on foot, is the very last sort of person to raise my curiosity. The yeomanry are precisely the order of people with whom I feel I can have nothing to do. A degree or two lower, and a creditable appearance might interest me. I might hope to be useful to their families in some way or other. But a farmer can need none of my help and is therefore, in one sense, as much above my notice, as in every other he is below it." "'Oh, to be sure! Oh, yes! It is not likely you should ever have observed him. But he knows you very well indeed. I mean by sight." "'I have no doubt of his being a very respectable young man. I know, indeed, that he is so, and as such, wish him well. What do you imagine his age to be?' "'He was four-and-twenty the eighth of last June. And my birthday is the twenty-third, just a fortnight in a day's difference, which is very odd." "'Only four-and-twenty. That is too young to settle. His mother is perfectly right not to be in a hurry. They seem very comfortable as they are, and if she were to take any pains to marry him, she would probably repent it. Six years hence, if he could meet with a good sort of young woman in the same rank as his own, with a little money, it might be very desirable." Six years hence! Dear Miss Woodhouse, he would be thirty years old." "'Well, and that is as early as most men can afford to marry who are not born to an independence. Mr. Martin, I imagine, has his fortune entirely to make, cannot be at all beforehand with the world. Whatever money he might come into when his father died, whatever his share of family property, it is, I dare say, all afloat, all employed in his stock, and so forth. And though with diligence and good luck he may be rich in time, it is next to impossible that he should realise anything yet." "'To be sure, so it is. But they live very comfortably. They have no indoors man, else they do not want for anything, and Mrs. Martin talks of taking a boy another year." "'I wish you may not get into a scrape, Harriet, whenever he does marry. I mean as to being acquainted with his wife, for though his sisters from a superior education are not to be altogether objected to, it does not follow that he might marry anybody at all fit for you to notice. The misfortune of your own birth ought to make you particularly careful as to your associates. 
There can be no doubt of your being a gentleman's daughter, and you must support your claim to that station by everything within your own power, or there will be plenty of people who would take pleasure in degrading you." "'Yes, to be sure, I suppose there are. But while I visit at Hartfield, and you are so kind to me, Miss Woodhouse, I am not afraid of what anybody can do." "'You understand the force of influence pretty well, Harriet. But I would have you so firmly established in good society as to be independent even of Hartfield and Miss Woodhouse. I want to see you permanently well connected, and to that end it will be advisable to have as few odd acquaintance as may be. And therefore, I say, if you should still be in this country when Mr. Martin marries, I wish you may not be drawn in by your intimacy with the sisters to be acquainted with the wife, who will probably be some mere farmer's daughter, without education." "'To be sure! Yes! Not that I think Mr. Martin would ever marry anybody but what had had some education, and been very well brought up. However, I do not mean to set up my opinion against yours, and I am sure I shall not wish for the acquaintance of his wife. I shall always have a great regard for the Miss Martins, especially Elizabeth, and should be very sorry to give them up, for they are quite as well educated as me. But if he marries a very ignorant, vulgar woman, certainly I had better not visit her if I can help it." Emma watched her through the fluctuations of this speech, and saw no alarming symptoms of love. The young man had been the first admirer, but she trusted there was no other hold, and that there would be no serious difficulty on Harriet's side, to oppose any friendly arrangement of her own. They met Mr. Martin the very next day as they were walking on the Donwell Road. He was on foot, and after looking very respectfully at her, looked with most unfeigned satisfaction at her companion. Emma was not sorry to have such an opportunity of survey, and walking a few yards forward while they talked together, soon made her quick eye sufficiently acquainted with Mr. Robert Martin. His appearance was very neat, and he looked like a sensible young man. But his person had no other advantage, and when he came to be contrasted with gentlemen, she thought he must lose all the ground he had gained in Harriet's inclination. Harriet was not insensible of manner. She had voluntarily noticed her father's gentleness with admiration as well as wonder. Mr. Martin looked as if he did not know what manner was. They remained but a few minutes together, as Miss Woodhouse must not be kept waiting, and Harriet then came running to her with a smiling face and in a flutter of spirits, which Miss Woodhouse hoped very soon to compose. "'Only think of our happening to meet him! How very odd! It was quite a chance, he said, that he had not gone round by Randalls. He did not think we ever walked this road. He thought we walked towards Randalls most days. He has not been able to get the romance of the forest yet. He was so busy the last time he was at Kingston that he quite forgot it, but he goes again to-morrow. So very odd we should happen to meet. Well, Miss Woodhouse, is he like what you expected? What do you think of him? Do you think him so very plain?" He is very plain, undoubtedly, remarkably plain. But that is nothing compared with his entire want of gentility. I had no right to expect much, and I did not expect much. But I had no idea that he could be so very clownish, so totally without air. I had imagined him, I confess, a degree or two nearer gentility." "'To be sure,' said Harriet, in a mortified voice, "'he is not so genteel as real gentlemen. I think, Harriet, since your acquaintance with us, you have been repeatedly in the company of some such very real gentlemen, that you must yourself be struck with the difference in Mr. Martin. At Hartfield you have had very good specimens of well-educated, well-bred men. I should be surprised if, after seeing them, you could be in company with Mr. Martin again without perceiving him to be a very inferior creature, and rather wondering at yourself for having ever thought him at all agreeable before. Do not you begin to feel that now? We're not too struck. I am sure you must have been struck by his awkward look and abrupt manner, and the uncouthness of a voice which I heard to be wholly unmodulated as I stood here. Certainly, he is not like Mr. Knightley. He has not such a fine air and way of walking as Mr. Knightley. I see the difference plain enough. But Mr. Knightley is so very fine a man." Mr. Knightley's air is so remarkably good, that it is not fair to compare Mr. Martin with him. You might not see one in a hundred with gentlemen so plainly written as in Mr. Knightley. But he is not the only gentleman you have been lately used to. What say you to Mr. Weston and Mr. Elton? Compare Mr. Martin with either of them. Compare their manner of carrying themselves, of walking, of speaking, of being silent. You must see the difference." "'Oh, yes! There is a great difference. 
"'But Mr. Weston is almost an old man. Mr. Weston must be between forty and fifty. "'Which makes his good manners the more valuable. The older a person grows, Harriet, the more important it is that their manners should not be bad, the more glaring and disgusting any loudness or coarseness or awkwardness becomes. What is possible in youth is detestable in later age. Mr. Martin is now awkward and abrupt. What will he be at Mr. Weston's time of life?" "'There is no saying, indeed,' replied Harriet, rather solemnly. "'But there may be pretty good guessing. He will be a completely gross, vulgar farmer, totally inattentive to appearances, and thinking of nothing but profit and loss." "'Will he, indeed? That will be very bad." How much his business engrosses him already is very plain from the circumstance of his forgetting to inquire for the book you recommended. He was a great deal too full of the market to think of anything else, which is just as it should be for a thriving man. What has he to do with books? And I have no doubt that he will thrive, and be a very rich man in time, and his being illiterate and coarse need not disturb us." "'I wonder he did not remember the book.' was all Harriet's answer, and spoken with a degree of grave displeasure which Emma thought might be safely left to itself. She therefore said no more for some time. Her next beginning was, "'In one respect, perhaps, Mr. Elton's manners are superior to Mr. Knightley's or Mr. Weston's. They have more gentleness. They might be more safely held up as a pattern. There is an openness, a quickness, almost a bluntness in Mr. Weston, which everybody likes in him, because there is so much good humour with it. But that would not do to be copied. Neither would Mr. Knightley's downright, decided, commanding sort of manner, though it suits him very well. His figure and look and situation in life seem to allow it. But if any young man were to set about copying him, he would not be sufferable. On the contrary, I think a young man might be very safely recommended to take Mr. Elton as a model. Mr. Elton is good-humoured, cheerful, obliging, and gentle. He seems to me to be grown particularly gentle of late. I do not know whether he has any design of ingratiating himself with either of us, Harriet, by additional softness, but it strikes me that his manners are softer than they used to be. If he means anything, it must be to please you. Did not I tell you what he said of you the other day? She then repeated some warm personal praise which she had drawn from Mr. Elton, and now did full justice to, and Harriet blushed and smiled, and said she had always thought Mr. Elton very agreeable. Mr. Elton was the very person fixed on by Emma for driving the young farmer out of Harriet's head. She thought it would be an excellent match, and only too palpably desirable, natural, and probable for her to have much merit in planning it. She feared it was what everybody else must think of and predict. It was not likely, however, that anybody should have equalled her in the date of the plan, as it had entered her brain during the very first evening of Harriet's coming to Hartfield. The longer she considered it, the greater was her sense of its expediency. Mr. Elton's situation was most suitable, quite the gentleman himself and without low connections, at the same time not of any family that could fairly object to the doubtful birth of Harriet. He had a comfortable home for her, and Emma imagined a very sufficient income for though the vicarage of Highbury was not large, he was known to have some independent property, and she thought very highly of him as a good-humoured, well-meaning, respectable young man, without any deficiency of useful understanding or knowledge of the world. She had already satisfied herself that he thought Harriet a beautiful girl, which she trusted, with such frequent meetings at Hartfield, was foundation enough on his side, and on Harriet's there could be little doubt that the idea of being preferred by him would have all the usual weight and efficacy and he was really a very pleasing young man, a young man whom any woman not fastidious might like. He was reckoned very handsome, his person much admired in general, though not by her, there being a want of elegance of feature which she could not dispense with. But the girl who could be gratified by a Robert Martin's riding about the country to get walnuts for her, might very well be conquered by Mr. Elton's admiration. End of chapter 4《Volume One, Chapter Five of Emma. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Emma by Jane Austen. Volume One, Chapter Five. I do not know what your opinion may be, Mrs. Weston," said Mr. Knightley. 
of this great intimacy between Emma and Harriet Smith, but I think it a bad thing." "'A bad thing? Do you really think it a bad thing? Why so?" "'I think they will neither of them do the other any good." "'You surprise me. Emma must do Harriet good, and by supplying her with a new object of interest, Harriet may be said to do Emma good. I have been seeing their intimacy with the greatest pleasure. How very differently we feel! Not think they will do each other any good. This will certainly be the beginning of one of our quarrels about Emma, Mr. Knightley." "'Perhaps you think I am come on purpose to quarrel with you, knowing Weston to be out, and that you must still fight your own battle." "'Mr. Weston would undoubtedly support me, if he were here, for he thinks exactly as I do on the subject. We were speaking of it only yesterday, and agreeing how fortunate it was for Emma, that there should be such a girl in Highbury for her to associate with. Mr. Knightley, I shall not allow you to be a fair judge in this case. You are so much used to live alone, that you do not know the value of a companion. And perhaps no man can be a good judge of the comfort a woman feels in the society of one of her own sex, after being used to it all her life. I can imagine your objection to Harriet Smith. She is not a superior young woman, which Emma's friend ought to be. But on the other hand, as Emma wants to see her better informed, it will be an inducement to her to read more herself. They will read together. She means it, I know." "'Emma has been meaning to read more ever since she was twelve years old. I have seen a great many lists of her drawing up at various times of books that she meant to read regularly through. And very good lists they were, very well chosen, and very neatly arranged, sometimes alphabetically, and sometimes by some other rule. The list she drew up when only fourteen, I remember thinking it did her judgment so much credit, that I preserved it some time, and I dare say she may have made out a very good list now. But I have done with expecting any course of steady reading from Emma. She will never submit to anything requiring industry and patience, and a subjection of the fancy to the understanding. Where Miss Taylor failed to stimulate, I may safely affirm that Harriet Smith will do nothing. You never could persuade her to read half so much as you wished. You know you could not." "'I dare say,' replied Mrs. Weston, smiling, "'that I thought so then. But since we have parted, I can never remember Emma's omitting to do anything I wished." "'There is hardly any desiring to refresh such a memory as that,' said Mr. Knightley feelingly, and for a moment or two he had done. "'But I,' he soon added, "'who have had no such charm thrown over my senses, must still see, hear, and remember. Emma is spoiled by being the cleverest of her family. At ten years old she had the misfortune of being able to answer questions which puzzled her sister at seventeen. She was always quick and assured, Isabella slow and diffident, and ever since she was twelve, Emma has been mistress of the house and of you all. In her mother she lost the only person able to cope with her. She inherits her mother's talents, and must have been under subjection to her." I should have been sorry, Mr. Knightley, to be dependent on your recommendation, had I quitted Mr. Woodhouse's family and wanted another situation. I do not think you would have spoken a good word for me to anybody. I am sure you always thought me unfit for the office I held." "'Yes,' said he, smiling, "'you are better placed here, very fit for a wife, but not at all for a governess. But you were preparing yourself to be an excellent wife all the time you were at Hartfield. You might not give Emma such a complete education as your powers would seem to promise, but you were receiving a very good education from her, on the very material matrimonial point of submitting your own will, and doing as you were bid, and if Weston had asked me to recommend him a wife, I should certainly have named Miss Taylor." <laughs> "'Thank you. There will be very little merit in making a good wife to such a man as Mr. Weston." Why, to own the truth, I am afraid you are rather thrown away, and that with every disposition to bear, there will be nothing to be borne. We will not despair, however. Weston may grow cross from the wantonness of comfort, or his son may plague him." "'I hope not that. It is not likely. No, Mr. Knightley, do not foretell vexation from that quarter." "'Not I, indeed. I only name possibilities. I do not pretend to Emma's genius for foretelling and guessing. I hope with all my heart the young man may be a Weston in merit, and a Churchill in fortune. 
But Harriet Smith! I have not half done about Harriet Smith. I think her the very worst sort of companion that Emma could possibly have. She knows nothing herself, and looks upon Emma as knowing everything. She is a flatterer in all her ways, and so much the worse, because undesigned. Her ignorance is hourly flattery. How can Emma imagine she has anything to learn herself, while Harriet is presenting such a delightful inferiority? And as for Harriet, I will venture to say that she cannot gain by the acquaintance. Hartfield will only put her out of conceit with all the other places she belongs to. She will grow just refined enough to be uncomfortable with those among whom birth and circumstances have placed her home. I am much mistaken if Emma's doctrines give any strength of mind, or tend at all to make a girl adapt herself rationally to the varieties of her situation in life. They only give a little polish. I either depend more upon Emma's good sense than you do, or am more anxious for her present comfort, for I cannot lament the acquaintance. How well she looked last night!" Oh! You would rather talk of her person than her mind, would you? Very well. I shall not attempt to deny Emma's being pretty." Pretty? Say beautiful, rather! Can you imagine anything nearer perfect beauty than Emma altogether, face and figure? I do not know what I can imagine, but I confess that I have seldom seen a face or figure more pleasing to me than hers. But I am a partial old friend." Such an eye! The true hazel eye! And so brilliant! Regular features, open countenance, with a complexion! Oh, what a bloom of full health, and such a pretty height and size, such a firm and upright figure! There is health, not merely in her bloom, but in her air, her head, her glance. One hears sometimes of a child being the picture of health. Now Emma always gives me the idea of being the complete picture of grown-up health. She is loveliness itself. Mr. Knightley is not she?" "'I have not a fault to find with her person,' he replied. "'I think her all you describe. I love to look at her. And I will add this praise, that I do not think her personally vain. Considering how very handsome she is, she appears to be little occupied with it. Her vanity lies another way. Mrs. Weston, I am not to be talked out of my dislike of Harriet Smith, or my dread of its doing them both harm. And I, Mr. Knightley, am equally stout in my confidence of its not doing them any harm. With all dear Emma's little faults, she is an excellent creature. Where shall we see a better daughter, or a kinder sister, or a truer friend? No, no. She has qualities which may be trusted. She will never lead any one really wrong. She will make no lasting blunder. Where Emma errs once, she is in the right a hundred times." "'Very well. I will not plague you any more. Emma shall be an angel, and I will keep my spleen to myself, till Christmas brings John and Isabella. John loves Emma with a reasonable, and therefore not a blind affection. And Isabella always thinks as he does, except when he is not quite frightened enough about the children. I am sure of having their opinions with me. I know that you all love her really too well to be unjust or unkind. But excuse me, Mr. Knightley, if I take the liberty. I consider myself, you know, as having somewhat of the privilege of speech that Emma's mother might have had. The liberty of hinting that I do not think any possible good can arise from Harriet Smith's intimacy, being made a matter of much discussion among you. Pray excuse me. But supposing any little inconvenience may be apprehended from the intimacy, it cannot be expected that Emma, accountable to nobody but her father, who perfectly approves the acquaintance, should put an end to it, so long as it is a source of pleasure to herself. It has been so many years my province to give advice, that you cannot be surprised, Mr. Knightley, at this little remains of office." "'Not at all,' cried he. "'I am much obliged to you for it. It is very good advice, and it shall have a better fate than your advice has often found, for it shall be attended to." Mrs. John Knightley is easily alarmed, and might be made unhappy about her sister. "'Be satisfied,' said he. I will not raise any outcry. I will keep my ill-humour to myself. I have a very sincere interest in Emma. Isabella does not seem any more my sister, has never excited a greater interest, perhaps hardly so great. There is an anxiety, 
a curiosity in what one feels for Emma. I wonder what will become of her." "'So do I,' said Mrs. Weston gently. "'Very much.' She always declares she will never marry, which of course means just nothing at all. But I have no idea that she has ever yet seen a man she cared for. It would not be a bad thing for her to be very much in love with a proper object. I should like to see Emma in love, and in some doubt of a return. It would do her good. But there is nobody hereabouts to attach her, and she goes so seldom from home." "'There does indeed seem as little to tempt her to break her resolution at present,' said Mrs. Weston, "'as can well be. And while she is so happy at Hartfield, I cannot wish her to be forming any attachment which would be creating such difficulties on poor Mr. Woodhouse's account. I do not recommend matrimony at present to Emma, though I mean no slight to the state, I assure you." Part of her meaning was to conceal some favourite thoughts of her own and Mr. Weston's on the subject as much as possible. There were wishes at Randall's respecting Emma's destiny, but it was not desirable to have them suspected, and the quiet transition which Mr. Knightley soon afterwards made to, "'What does Weston think of the weather? Shall we have rain?' convinced her that he had nothing more to say or surmise about Hartfield. End of chapter 5volume 1 chapter 6 of emma this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by elizabeth clett emma by jane austen volume 1 chapter 6 emma could not feel a doubt of having given harriet's fancy a proper direction and raised the gratitude of her young vanity to a very good purpose for she found her decidedly more sensible than before of Mr. Elton's being a remarkably handsome man, with most agreeable manners, and as she had no hesitation in following up the assurance of his admiration by agreeable hints, she was soon pretty confident of creating as much liking on Harriet's side as there could be any occasion for. She was quite convinced of Mr. Elton's being in the fairest way of falling in love, if not in love already. She had no scruple with regard to him. He talked of Harriet, and praised her so warmly, that she could not suppose anything wanting which a little time would not add. His perception of the striking improvement of Harriet's manner since her introduction at Hartfield was not one of the least agreeable proofs of his growing attachment. "'You have given Miss Smith all that she required,' said he. "'You have made her graceful and easy. She was a beautiful creature when she came to you, but in my opinion the attractions you have added are infinitely superior to what she received from nature.' "'I am glad you think I have been useful to her. But Harriet only wanted drawing out, and receiving a few, a very few, hints. She had all the natural grace of sweetness of temper and artlessness in herself. I have done very little.' "'If it were admissible to contradict a lady—' said the gallant Mr. Elton. "'I have, perhaps, given her a little more decision of character, have taught her to think on points which had not fallen in her way before.' "'Exactly so. That is what principally strikes me. So much superadded decision of character! Skilful has been the hand!' "'Great has been the pleasure, I am sure. I never met with a disposition more truly amiable.' "'I have no doubt of it and it was spoken with a sort of sighing animation, which had a vast deal of the lover. She was not less pleased another day with the manner in which he seconded a sudden wish of hers to have Harriet's picture. "'Did you ever have your likeness taken, Harriet?' said she. "'Did you ever sit for your picture?' Harriet was on the point of leaving the room, and only stopped to say with a very interesting naivete, "'Oh, dear no, never!' No sooner was she out of sight than Emma exclaimed, "'What an exquisite possession a good picture of her would be! I would give any money for it. I almost long to attempt her likeness myself. You do not know it, I dare say, but two or three years ago I had a great passion for taking likenesses, and attempted several of my friends, and was thought to have a tolerable eye in general. But from one cause or another I gave it up in disgust. But really I could almost venture if Harriet would sit to me. It would be such a delight to have her picture." "'Let me entreat you,' cried Mr. Elton. "'It would indeed be a delight. Let me entreat you, Miss Woodhouse, to exercise so charming a talent in favour of your friend. I know what your drawings are. 
How could you suppose me ignorant? Is not this room rich in specimens of your landscapes and flowers, and has not Mrs. Weston some inimitable figure pieces in her drawing-room at Randall's?" "'Yes, good man,' thought Emma, but what has all that to do with taking likenesses? You know nothing of drawing. Don't pretend to be in raptures about mine. Keep your raptures for Harriet's face." "'Well, if you give me such kind encouragement, Mr. Elton, I believe I shall try what I can do. Harriet's features are very delicate, which makes a likeness difficult, and yet there is a peculiarity in the shape of the eye and the lines about the mouth which one ought to catch." "'Exactly so. The shape of the eye and the lines about the mouth. I have not a doubt of your success. Pray, pray attempt it. As you will do it, it will indeed, to use your own words, be an exquisite possession." "'But I am afraid, Mr. Elton, Harriet will not like to sit. She thinks so little of her own beauty. Did you not observe her manner of answering me? How completely it meant! Why should my picture be drawn?" No, oh, yes, I observed it, I assure you. It was not lost on me. But still I cannot imagine she would not be persuaded." Harriet was soon back again, and the proposal almost immediately made, and she had no scruples which could stand many minutes against the earnest pressing of both the others. Emma wished to go to work directly, and therefore produced the portfolio containing her various attempts at portraits, for not one of them had ever been finished, that they might decide together on the best size for Harriet. Her many beginnings were displayed—miniatures, half-lengths, whole-lengths, pencil, crayon, and water-colours had all been tried in turn. She had always wanted to do everything, and had made more progress both in drawing and music than many might have done with so little labour as she would ever submit to. She played and sang, and drew in almost every style, but steadiness had always been wanting, and in nothing had she approached the degree of excellence which she would have been glad to command and ought not to have failed of. She was not much deceived as to her own skill either as an artist or a musician, but she was not unwilling to have others deceived, or sorry to know her reputation for accomplishment often higher than it deserved. There was merit in every drawing, in the least finished perhaps the most. Her style was spirited, but had there been much less, or had there been ten times more, the delight and admiration of her two companions would have been the same. They were both in ecstasies. A likeness pleases everybody, and Miss Woodhouse's performances must be capital. "'No great variety of faces for you,' said Emma. "'I had only my own family to study from. There is my father another of my father, but the idea of sitting for his picture made him so nervous that I could only take him by stealth, neither of them very like, therefore. Mrs. Weston again, and again, and again, you see. Dear Mrs. Weston, always my kindest friend on every occasion. She would sit whenever I asked her. There is my sister, and really quite her own little elegant figure, and the face not unlike. I should have made a good likeness of her, if she would have sat longer but she was in such a hurry to have me draw her four children that she would not be quiet. Then here come all my attempts at three of those four children. There they are, Henry and John and Bella, from one end of the sheet to the other, and any one of them might do for any of the rest. She was so eager to have them drawn that I could not refuse, but there is no making children of three or four years old stand still, you know nor can it be very easy to take any likeness of them, beyond the air and complexion, unless they are coarser feature than any of Mamma's children ever were. Here is my sketch of the fourth, who was a baby. I took him as he was sleeping on the sofa, and it is as strong a likeness of his cockade as you would wish to see. He had nestled down his head most conveniently. That's very like. I am rather proud of little George. The corner of the sofa is very good. Then here is my last unclosing a pretty sketch of a gentleman in small size, whole length. My last and my best! My brother, Mr. John Knightley! This did not want much of being finished, when I put it away in a pet, and vowed I would never take another likeness. I could not help being provoked, for after all my pains, and when I had really made a very good likeness of it, Mrs. Weston and I were quite agreed in thinking it very like, only too handsome, too flattering, but that was a fault on the right side. After all this came poor dear Isabella's cold approbation of, yes, it was a little like, but to be sure it did not do him justice. We had had a great deal of trouble in persuading him to sit at all. It was made a great favour of, 
and altogether it was more than I could bear. And so I never would finish it, to have it apologised over as an unfavourable likeness, to every morning visitor in Brunswick Square. And as I said, I did then forswear ever drawing anybody again. But for Harriet's sake, or rather for my own, and as there are no husbands and wives in the case at present, I will break my resolution now." Mr. Elton seemed very properly struck and delighted by the idea, and was repeating, "'No husbands and wives in the case at present, indeed, as you observe. Exactly so. No husbands and wives.' With so interesting a consciousness, that Emma began to consider whether she had not better leave them together at once. But she wanted to be drawing. The declaration must wait a little longer. She had soon fixed on the size and sort of portrait. It was to be a whole length in water-colours, like Mr. John Knightley's, and was destined, if she could please herself, to hold a very honourable station over the mantelpiece. The sitting began, and Harriet, smiling and blushing, and afraid of not keeping her attitude and countenance, presented a very sweet mixture of youthful expression to the steady eyes of the artist. But there was no doing anything, with Mr. Elton fidgeting behind her and watching every touch. She gave him credit for stationing himself where he might gaze and gaze again without offence, but was really obliged to put an end to it, and request him to place himself elsewhere. It then occurred to her to employ him in reading. If he would be so good as to read to them, it would be a kindness indeed. It would amuse away the difficulties of her part, and lessen the irksomeness of Miss Smith's. Mr. Elton was only too happy. Harriet listened, and Emma drew in peace. She must allow him to be still frequently coming to look. Anything less would certainly have been too little in a lover, and he was ready at the smallest intermission of the pencil to jump up and see the progress and be charmed. There was no being displeased with such an encourager, for his admiration made him discern a likeness almost before it was possible. She could not respect his eye, but his love and his complaisance were unexceptionable. The sitting was altogether very satisfactory. She was quite enough pleased with the first day's sketch to wish to go on. There was no want of likeness, she had been fortunate in the attitude, and as she meant to throw in a little improvement to the figure, to give a little more height and considerably more elegance, she had great confidence of its being in every way a pretty drawing at last, and of its filling its destined place with a credit to them both, a standing memorial of the beauty of one, the skill of the other, and the friendship of both with as many other agreeable associations as Mr. Elton's very promising attachment was likely to add. Harriet was to sit again the next day, and Mr. Elton, just as he ought, entreated for the permission of attending and reading to them again. "'By all means, we shall be most happy to consider you as one of the party.' The same civilities and courtesies, the same success and satisfaction, took place on the morrow, and accompanied the whole progress of the picture, which was rapid and happy. Everybody who saw it was pleased, but Mr. Elton was in continual raptures, and defended it through every criticism. "'Miss Woodhouse has given her friend the only beauty she wanted,' observed Mrs. Weston to him, not in the least suspecting that she was addressing a lover. "'The expression of the eye is most correct. But Miss Smith has not those eyebrows and eyelashes. It is the fault of her face that she has them not.' "'Do you think so?' replied he. I cannot agree with you. It appears to me a most perfect resemblance in every feature. I never saw such a likeness in my life. We must allow for the effect of shade, you know." "'You have made her too tall, Emma,' said Mr. Knightley. Emma knew that she had, but would not own it, and Mr. Elton warmly added, "'Oh, no! Certainly not too tall! Not in the least too tall! Consider she is sitting down, which naturally presents a different which, in short, gives exactly the idea—and the proportions must be preserved, you know. Proportions, foreshortening. Oh, no, it gives one exactly the idea of such a height as Miss Smith's. Exactly so, indeed." "'It is very pretty,' said Mr. Woodhouse. "'So prettily done, just as your drawings always are, my dear. I do not know anybody who draws so well as you do. The only thing I do not thoroughly like is, that she seems to be sitting out of doors, with only a little shawl over her shoulders, and it makes one think she must catch cold." "'But, my dear papa, it is supposed to be summer, a warm day in summer. Look at the tree." "'But it is never safe to sit out of doors, my dear." "'You, sir, may say anything,' cried Mr. Elton. 
but I must confess that I regard it as a most happy thought, the placing of Miss Smith out of doors, and the tree is touched with such inimitable spirit. Any other situation would have been much less in character. The naïveté of Miss Smith's manners, and altogether— Oh, it is most admirable! I cannot keep my eyes from it. I never saw such a likeness." The next thing wanton was to get the picture framed, and here were a few difficulties. It must be done directly. It must be done in London. The order must go through the hands of some intelligent person whose taste could be depended on, and Isabella, the usual doer of all commissions, must not be applied to, because it was December, and Mr. Woodhouse could not bear the idea of her stirring out of her house in the fogs of December. But no sooner was the distress known to Mr. Elton than it was removed. His gallantry was always on the alert. Might he be entrusted with the commission? What infinite pleasure he should have in executing it! He could ride to London at any time. It was impossible to say how much he should be gratified by being employed on such an errand. He was too good. She could not endure the thought. She would not give him such a troublesome office for the world." brought on the desired repetition of entreaties and assurances, and a very few minutes settled the business. Mr. Elton was to take the drawing to London, choose the frame, and give the directions, and Emma thought she could so pack it as to ensure its safety without much incommoding him, while he seemed mostly fearful of not being incommoded enough. "'What a precious deposit!' said he, with a tender sigh, as he received it. "'This man is almost too gallant to be in love,' thought Emma. I should say so, but that I suppose there may be a hundred different ways of being in love. He is an excellent young man, and will suit Harriet exactly. It will be an exactly so, as he says himself. But he does sigh and languish and study for compliments rather more than I could endure as a principal. I come in for a pretty good share as a second, but it is his gratitude on Harriet's account. End of chapter 6《Volume One, Chapter Seven of Emma. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Emma by Jane Austen. Volume One, Chapter Seven. The very day of Mr. Elton's going to London produced a fresh occasion for Emma's services towards her friend. Harriet had been at Hartfield as usual soon after breakfast, and after a time had gone home to return again to dinner. She returned, and sooner than had been talked of, and with an agitated, hurried look, announcing something extraordinary to have happened which she was longing to tell. Half a minute brought it all out. She had heard, as soon as she got back to Mrs. Goddard's, that Mr. Martin had been there an hour before, and finding she was not at home, nor particularly expected, had left a little parcel for her from one of his sisters, and gone away and on opening this parcel she had actually found, besides the two songs which she had lent Elizabeth to copy, a letter to herself, and this letter was from him, from Mr. Martin, and contained a direct proposal of marriage. Who could have thought it? She was so surprised she did not know what to do. Yes, quite a proposal of marriage, and a very good letter. At least she thought so, and he wrote as if he really loved her very much. But she did not know, and so she was come as fast as she could to ask Miss Woodhouse what she should do. Emma was half ashamed of her friend for seeming so pleased and so doubtful. "'Upon my word!' she cried. "'The young man is determined not to lose anything for want of asking. He will connect himself well, if he can.' "'Will you read the letter?' cried Harriet. "'Pray do. I'd rather you would.' Emma was not sorry to be pressed. She read and was surprised. The style of the letter was much above her expectation. There were not merely no grammatical errors, but as a composition it would not have disgraced a gentleman. The language, though plain, was strong and unaffected, and the sentiments it conveyed very much to the credit of the writer. It was short, but expressed good sense, warm attachment, liberality, propriety, even delicacy of feeling. She paused over it, while Harriet stood anxiously watching for her opinion, with a— well, well, and was at last forced to add, is it a good letter, or is it too short? Yes, indeed, a very good letter, replied Emma rather slowly. So good a letter, Harriet, that, everything considered, I think one of his sisters must have helped him. 
I can hardly imagine the young man whom I saw talking with you the other day could express himself so well, if left quite to his own powers. And yet, it is not the style of a woman. No, certainly it is too strong and concise, not diffuse enough for a woman. No doubt he is a sensible man, and I suppose may have a natural talent for— thinks strongly and clearly, and when he takes pen in hand, his thoughts naturally find proper words. It is so with some men. Yes, I understand the sort of mind, vigorous, decided, with sentiments to a certain point, not coarse. A better written letter, Harriet, returning it, than I had expected. Well, said the still waiting Harriet, well, and, and what shall I do? What shall you do? In what respect? Do you mean with regard to this letter? Yes. But what are you in doubt of? You must answer it, of course, and speedily. Yes, but what shall I say? Dear Miss Woodhouse, do advise me. Oh, no, no, the letter had much better be all your own. You will express yourself very properly, I am sure. There is no danger of your not being intelligible, which is the first thing. Your meaning must be unequivocal, no doubts or demurs, and such expressions of gratitude and concern for the pain you are inflicting as propriety requires, will present themselves unbidden to your mind, I am persuaded. You need not be prompted to write with the appearance of sorrow for his disappointment." "'You think I ought to refuse him, then?' said Harriet, looking down. "'Ought to refuse him? My dear Harriet, what do you mean? Are you in any doubt as to that? I thought—but I beg your pardon, perhaps I have been under a mistake. I certainly have been misunderstanding you, if you feel in doubt as to the purport of your answer. I had imagined you were only consulting me as to the wording of it." Harriet was silent. With a little reserve of manner, Emma continued, "'You mean to return a favourable answer, I collect?' "'No, I do not. That is, I do not mean—' What shall I do? What would you advise me to do? Pray, dear Miss Woodhouse, tell me what I ought to do." "'I shall not give you any advice, Harriet. I will have nothing to do with it. This is a point which you must settle with your own feelings." "'I had no notion that he liked me so very much,' said Harriet, contemplating the letter. For a little while Emma persevered in her silence. But beginning to apprehend the bewitching flattery of that letter might be too powerful, she thought it best to say, I lay it down as a general rule, Harriet, that if a woman doubts as to whether she should accept a man or not, she certainly ought to refuse him. If she can hesitate as to yes, she ought to say no directly. It is not a state to be safely entered into with doubtful feelings, with half a heart. I thought it my duty as a friend, and older than yourself, to say thus much to you. But do not imagine that I want to influence you. Oh, no, I am sure you are a great deal too kind to—but if you would just advise me what I had best do—no, no, I do not mean that. As you say, one's mind ought to be quite made up. One should not be hesitating. It is a very serious thing. It will be safer to say no, perhaps. Do you think I had better say no?" "'Not for the world,' said Emma, smiling graciously. Would I advise you either way? You must be the best judge of your own happiness. If you prefer Mr. Martin to every other person, if you think him the most agreeable man you have ever been in company with, why should you hesitate? You blush, Harriet. Does anybody else occur to you at this moment under such a definition? Harriet, Harriet, do not deceive yourself. Do not be run away with by gratitude and compassion. At this moment, whom are you thinking of? The symptoms were favourable. Instead of answering, Harriet turned away confused, and stood thoughtfully by the fire, and though the letter was still in her hand, it was now mechanically twisted about without regard. Emma waited the result with impatience, but not without strong hopes. At last, with some hesitation, Harriet said, "'Miss Woodhouse, as you will not give me your opinion, I must do as well as I can by myself, and I have now quite determined, and really almost made up my mind, to refuse, Mr. Martin, do you think I am right?" "'Perfectly, perfectly right, my dearest Harriet. You are doing just what you ought. While you were at all in suspense, I kept my feelings to myself, but now that you are so completely decided, I have no hesitation in approving. 
Dear Harriet, I give myself joy of this. It would have grieved me to lose your acquaintance, which must have been the consequence of your marrying Mr. Martin. While you were in the smallest degree wavering, I said nothing about it, because I would not influence. But it would have been the loss of a friend to me. I could not have visited Mrs. Robert Martin of Abbey Mill Farm. Now I am secure of you for ever." Harriet had not surmised her own danger, but the idea of it struck her forcibly. "'You could not have visited me!' she cried, looking aghast. "'No! To be sure you could not! But I never thought of that before. That would have been too dreadful! What an escape! Dear Miss Woodhouse, I would not give up the pleasure and honour of being intimate with you for anything in the world." "'Indeed, Harriet, it would have been a severe pang to lose you. But it must have been. You would have thrown yourself out of all good society. I must have given you up." "'Dear me! How should I ever have borne it? It would have killed me never to come to Hartfield any more." "'Dear affectionate creature! You banished to Abbey Mill Farm! You confined to the society of the illiterate and vulgar all your life! I wonder how the young man could have had the assurance to ask it. He must have a pretty good opinion of himself." "'I do not think he is conceited either, in general,' said Harriet, her conscience opposing such censure. "'At least, he is very good-natured, and I shall always feel much obliged to him, and have a great regard for—but that is quite a different thing from—and you know, though he may like me, it does not follow that I should—and certainly I must confess that since my visiting here I have seen people and if one comes to compare them, person and manners, there is no comparison at all. One is so very handsome and agreeable. However, I do really think Mr. Martin a very amiable young man, and have a great opinion of him, and his being so much attached to me, and his writing such a letter. But as to leaving you, it is what I would not do upon any consideration. Thank you, thank you, my own sweet little friend. We will not be parted. A woman is not to marry a man merely because she is asked, or because he is attached to her, and can write a tolerable letter." "'Oh, no! And it is but a short letter, too." Emma felt the bad taste of her friend, but let it pass with a, "'Very true, and it would be a small consolation to her, for the clownish manner which might be offending her every hour of the day, to know that her husband could write a good letter." Oh, yes, very! Nobody cares for a letter. The thing is to be always happy with pleasant companions. I am quite determined to refuse him. But how shall I do? What shall I say?" Emma assured her there would be no difficulty in the answer, and advised its being written directly, which was agreed to in the hope of her assistance. And though Emma continued to protest against any assistance being wanted, it was in fact given in the formation of every sentence. The looking over his letter again, and replying to it, had such a softening tendency, that it was particularly necessary to brace her up with a few decisive expressions, and she was so very much concerned at the idea of making him unhappy, and thought so much of what his mother and sisters would think and say, and was so anxious that they should not fancy her ungrateful, that Emma believed if the young man had come in her way at that moment, he would have been accepted after all. The letter, however, was written and sealed and sent. The business was finished, and Harriet was safe. She was rather low all the evening, but Emma could allow for her amiable regrets, and sometimes relieved them by speaking of her own affection, sometimes by bringing forward the idea of Mr. Elton. "'I shall never be invited to Abbey Mill again,' was said in a rather sorrowful tone. "'Nor, if you were, could I ever bear to part with you, my Harriet. You are a great deal too necessary at Hartfield to be spared to Abbey Mill and I am sure I should never want to go there, for I am never happy but at Hartfield." Some time afterwards it was, "'I think Mrs. Goddard would be very much surprised if she knew what had happened. I am sure Miss Nash would, for Miss Nash thinks her own sister very well married, and it is only a linen draper." "'One should be sorry to see greater pride or refinement in the teacher of a school, Harriet. I dare say Miss Nash would envy you such an opportunity as this of being married. Even this conquest would appear valuable in her eyes. As to anything superior for you, I suppose she is quite in the dark. The attentions of a certain person can hardly be among the tittle-tattle of Highbury yet. Hitherto I fancy you and I are the only people to whom his looks and manners have explained themselves." Harriet blushed and smiled, and said something about wondering that people should like her so much. The idea of Mr. Elton was certainly cheering. But still, after a time, she was tender-hearted again towards the rejected Mr. Martin. "'Now he has got my letter,' 
said she softly. I wonder what they are all doing, whether his sisters know. If he is unhappy, they will be unhappy too. I hope he will not mind it so very much. Let us think of those among our absent friends who are more cheerfully employed, cried Emma. At this moment, perhaps, Mr. Elton is showing your picture to his mother and sisters, telling how much more beautiful is the original, and after being asked for it five or six times, allowing them to hear your name, your own dear name. My picture! But he has left my picture in Bond Street. Has he so? Then I know nothing of Mr. Elton. No, my dear little modest Harriet, depend upon it, the picture will not be in Bond Street till just before he mounts his horse to-morrow. It is his companion all this evening, his solace, his delight. It opens his designs to his family, it introduces you among them, it diffuses through the party those pleasantest feelings of our nature, eager curiosity and warm prepossession. How cheerful, how animated, how suspicious, how busy their imaginations all are! Harriet smiled again, and her smiles grew stronger. End of chapter 7《Volume One, Chapter Eight of Emma. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Emma by Jane Austen. Volume One, Chapter Eight. Harriet slept at Hartfield that night. For some weeks past, she had been spending more than half her time there, and gradually getting to have a bedroom appropriated to herself. And Emma judged it best in every respect, safest and kindest to keep her with them as much as possible just at present. She was obliged to go the next morning for an hour or two to Mrs. Goddard's, but it was then to be settled that she should return to Hartfield, to make a regular visit of some days. While she was gone, Mr. Knightley called, and sat some time with Mr. Woodhouse and Emma, till Mr. Woodhouse, who had previously made up his mind to walk out, was persuaded by his daughter not to defer it, and was induced by the entreaties of both, though against the scruples of his own civility, to leave Mr. Knightley for that purpose. Mr. Knightley, who had nothing of ceremony about him, was offering by his short decided answers an amusing contrast to the protracted apologies and civil hesitations of the other. "'Well, I believe, if you will excuse me, Mr. Knightley, if you will not consider me as doing a very rude thing, I shall take Emma's advice and go out for a quarter of an hour. As the sun is out, I believe I had better take my three turns while I can. I treat you without ceremony, Mr. Knightley. We invalids think we are privileged people.' "'My dear sir, do not make a stranger of me.' I leave an excellent substitute in my daughter. Emma will be happy to entertain you. And therefore I think I will beg your excuse and take my three turns, my winter walk. You cannot do better, sir. I would ask for the pleasure of your company, Mr. Knightley, but I am a very slow walker, and my pace would be tedious to you. And besides, you have another long walk before you to Donwell Abbey. "'Thank you, sir, thank you. I am going this moment myself, and I think the sooner you go the better. I will fetch your greatcoat and open the garden door for you.' Mr. Woodhouse at last was off, but Mr. Knightley, instead of being immediately off likewise, sat down again, seemingly inclined for more chat. He began speaking of Harriet, and speaking of her with more voluntary praise than Emma had ever heard before. "'I cannot rate her beauty as you do,' said he. But she is a pretty little creature, and I am inclined to think very well of her disposition. Her character depends upon those she is with, but in good hand she will turn out a valuable woman." "'I am glad you think so. And the good hands, I hope, may not be wanting." "'Come,' said he, "'you are anxious for a compliment, so I will tell you that you have improved her. You have cured her of her schoolgirl's giggle. She really does you credit." "'Thank you. I should be mortified indeed if I did not believe I had been of some use. But it is not everybody who will bestow praise where they may. You do not often overpower me with it." "'You are expecting her again, you say, this morning?' "'Almost every moment. She has been gone longer already than she intended.' "'Something has happened to delay her. Some visitors, perhaps?' "'Highbury gossips! Tiresome wretches!' 
Harriet may not consider everybody tiresome that you would." Emma knew this was too true for contradiction, and therefore said nothing. He presently added, with a smile, "'I do not pretend to fix on times or places, but I must tell you that I have good reason to believe your little friend will soon hear of something to her advantage.' "'Indeed? How so? Of what sort?' "'A very serious sort, I assure you,' still smiling. "'Very serious. I can think of but one thing. Who is in love with her? Who makes you their confidant?' Emma was more than half in hopes of Mr. Elton's having dropped a hint. Mr. Knightley was a sort of general friend and adviser, and she knew Mr. Elton looked up to him. "'I have reason to think,' he replied, "'that Harriet Smith will soon have an offer of marriage, and from a most unexceptionable quarter. Robert Martin is the man. Her visit to Abbey Mill this summer seems to have done his business. He is desperately in love, and means to marry her.' "'He is very obliging,' said Emma but is he sure that Harriet means to marry him? Well, well, means to make her an offer, then. Will that do? He came to the Abbey two evenings ago on purpose to consult me about it. He knows I have a thorough regard for him and all his family, and I believe considers me as one of his best friends. He came to ask me whether I thought it would be imprudent in him to settle so early, whether I thought her too young, in short, whether I approved his choice altogether having some apprehension, perhaps, of her being considered, especially since you're making so much of her, as in a line of society above him. I was very much pleased with all that he said. I never hear better sense from any one than Robert Martin. He always speaks to the purpose, open, straightforward, and very well judging. He told me everything, her circumstances and plans, and what they all proposed doing in the event of his marriage. He is an excellent young man, both as son and brother. I had no hesitation in advising him to marry. He proved to me that he could afford it, and that being the case, I was convinced he could not do better. I praised the fair lady, too, and altogether sent him away very happy. If he had never esteemed my opinion before, he would have thought highly of me then, and, I dare say, left the house thinking me the best friend and counsellor man ever had. This happened the night before last. Now, as we may fairly suppose, he would not allow much time to pass before he spoke to the lady and as he does not appear to have spoken yesterday, it is not unlikely that he should be at Mrs. Goddard's to-day, and she may be detained by a visitor without thinking him at all a tiresome wretch." "'Pray, Mr. Knightley,' said Emma, who had been smiling to herself through a great part of this speech, "'how do you know that Mr. Martin did not speak yesterday?' "'Certainly,' replied he, surprised. "'I do not absolutely know it, but it may be inferred. Was not she the whole day with you?" "'Come,' said she, "'I will tell you something, in return for what you have told me. He did speak yesterday, that is, he wrote, and was refused." This was obliged to be repeated before it could be believed, and Mr. Knightley actually looked red with surprise and displeasure as he stood up in tall indignation and said, "'Then she is a greater simpleton than I ever believed her. What is the foolish girl about?' "'Oh, to be sure!' cried Emma. "'It is always incomprehensible to a man that a woman should ever refuse an offer of marriage. A man always imagines a woman to be ready for anybody who asks her.' "'Nonsense! A man does not imagine any such thing. But what is the meaning of this? Harriet Smith refused Robert Martin? Madness, if it is so! But I hope you are mistaken.' "'I saw her answer. Nothing could be clearer.' You saw her answer. You wrote her answer, too. Emma, this is your doing. You persuaded her to refuse him." "'And if I did, which, however, I am far from allowing, I should not feel that I had done wrong. Mr. Martin is a very respectable young man, but I cannot admit him to be Harriet's equal, and am rather surprised, indeed, that he should have ventured to address her. By your account he does seem to have had some scruples. It is a pity that they were ever got over." "'Not Harriet's equal!' exclaimed Mr. Knightley, loudly and warmly, and with calmer asperity added a few moments afterwards. "'No, he is not her equal indeed, for he is as much her superior in sense as in situation. Emma, your infatuation about that girl blinds you. What are Harriet Smith's claims, either of birth, nature, or education, to any connection higher than Robert Martin? 
She is the natural daughter of nobody knows whom, with probably no settled provision at all, and certainly no respectable relations. She is known only as parlour boarder at a common school. She is not a sensible girl, nor a girl of any information. She has been taught nothing useful, and is too young and too simple to have acquired anything herself. At her age she can have no experience, and with her little wit is not very likely ever to have anything can avail her. She is pretty, and she is good-tempered, and that is all. My only scruple in advising the match was on his account as being beneath his deserts and a bad connection for him. I felt that, as to fortune, in all probability he might do much better, and that as to a rational companion or useful helpmate he could not do worse. But I could not reason so to a man in love, and was willing to trust to there being no harm in her, to her having that sort of disposition which, in good hands like his, might be easily led aright and turn out very well. The advantage of the match I felt to be all on her side, and had not the smallest doubt, nor have I now, that there would be a general cry out upon her extreme good luck. Even your satisfaction I made sure of. It crossed my mind immediately that you would not regret your friends leaving Highbury for the sake of her being settled so well. I remember saying to myself, even Emma, with all her partiality for Harriet, will think this a good match. I cannot help wondering at your knowing so little of Emma to say any such thing. What? Think a farmer? And with all his sense and all his merit, Mr. Martin is nothing more. A good match for my intimate friend. Not regret her leaving Highbury for the sake of marrying a man whom I could never admit as an acquaintance of my own. I wonder you should think it possible for me to have such feelings. I assure you mine are very different. I must think your statement by no means fair. You are not just to Harriet's charms. They would be estimated very differently by others, as well as myself. Mr. Martin may be the richest of the two, but he is undoubtedly her inferior as to rank in society. The sphere in which she moves is much above his. It would be a degradation." "'A degradation, to illegitimacy and ignorance, to be married to a respectable, intelligent gentleman farmer. As to the circumstances of her birth, though in a legal sense she may be called nobody, it will not hold in common sense. She is not to pay for the offence of others, by being held below the level of those with whom she is brought up. There can scarcely be a doubt that her father is a gentleman, and a gentleman of fortune. Her allowance is very liberal, nothing has ever been grudged for her improvement or comfort. That she is a gentleman's daughter is indubitable to me. That she associates with gentlemen's daughters, no one I apprehend will deny. She is superior to Mr. Robert Martin. Whoever might be her parents, said Mr. Knightley, whoever may have had the charge of her, it does not appear to have been any part of their plan to introduce her into what you would call good society. After receiving a very indifferent education, she is left in Mrs. Goddard's hand to shift as she can, to move, in short, in Mrs. Goddard's line, to have Mrs. Goddard's acquaintance. Her friends evidently thought this good enough for her, and it was good enough. She desired nothing better herself. Till you chose to turn her into a friend, her mind had no distaste for her own set, nor any ambition beyond it. She was as happy as possible with the Martins in the summer. She had no sense of superiority then. If she has it now, you have given it. You have been no friend to Harriet Smith, Emma. Robert Martin would have never proceeded so far, if he had not felt persuaded of her not being disinclined to him. I know him well. He has too much real feeling to address any woman on the haphazard of selfish passion. And as to conceit, he is the farthest from it of any man I know. Depend upon it, he had encouragement." It was most convenient to Emma not to make a direct reply to this assertion. She chose rather to take up her own line of the subject again. "'You are a very warm friend, Mr. Martin, but, as I said before, are unjust to Harriet. Harriet's claims to marry well are not so contemptible as you represent them. She is not a clever girl, but she has better sense than you are aware of, and does not deserve to have her understanding spoken of so slightingly. Waving that point, however, and supposing her to be, as you describe her, only pretty and good-natured, 
Let me tell you that in the degree she possesses them they are not trivial recommendations to the world in general, for she is, in fact, a beautiful girl, and must be thought so by ninety-nine people out of a hundred, until it appears that men are much more philosophic on the subject of beauty than they are generally supposed. Till they do fall in love with well-informed minds instead of handsome faces, a girl with such loveliness as Harriet has a certainty of being admired and sought after, of having the power of choosing from among many, consequently a claim to be nice. Her good nature, too, is not so very slight a claim, comprehending as it does real, thorough sweetness of temper and manner, a very humble opinion of herself, and a great readiness to be pleased with other people. I am very much mistaken if your sex in general would not think such beauty, and such temper, the highest claims a woman could possess." "'Upon my word, Emma, to hear you abusing the reason you have is almost enough to make me think so, too. Better be without sense than misapply it as you do." "'Oh, to be sure!' cried she playfully. I know that is the feeling of you all. I know that such a girl as Harriet is exactly what every man delights in, what at once bewitches his senses and satisfies his judgment. Oh, Harriet may pick and choose. Were you yourself ever to marry, she is the very woman for you. And is she, at seventeen, just entering into life, just beginning to be known, to be wondered at because she does not accept the first offer she receives? No. Pray let her have time to look about her." I have always thought it a very foolish intimacy," said Mr. Knightley presently, though I have kept my thoughts to myself, but I now perceive that it will be a very unfortunate one for Harriet. You will puff her up with such ideas of her own beauty, and of what she has a claim to, that in a little while nobody within her reach will be good enough for her. Vanity working on a weak head produces every sort of mischief. Nothing so easy as for a young lady to raise her expectations too high. Miss Harriet Smith may not find office of marriage flow in so fast, though she is a very pretty girl. Men of sense, whatever you may choose to say, do not want silly wives. Men of family would not be very fond of connecting themselves with a girl of such obscurity, and most prudent men would be afraid of the inconvenience and disgrace they might be involved in, when the mystery of her parentage came to be revealed. Let her marry Robert Martin, and she is safe, respectable, and happy for ever. But if you encourage her to expect to marry greatly, and teach her to be satisfied with nothing less than a man of consequence and large fortune, she may be a parlour boarder at Mrs. Goddard's all the rest of her life, or at least, for Harriet Smith is a girl who will marry somebody or other, till she grow desperate, and is glad to catch at the old writing-master's son. We think so very differently on this point, Mr. Knightley, that there can be no use in canvassing it. We shall only be making each other more angry. But as to my letting her marry Robert Martin, it is impossible. She has refused him, and so decidedly, I think, as must prevent any second application. She must abide by the evil of having refused him, whatever it may be, and as to the refusal itself, I will not pretend to say that I might not influence her a little, but I assure you there was very little for me or for anybody to do. His appearance is so much against him, and his manner so bad that if she ever were disposed to favour him, she is not now. I can imagine that before she had seen anybody superior, she might tolerate him. He was the brother of her friends, and he took pains to please her, and altogether having seen nobody better, that must have been his great assistant, she might not, while she was at Abbey Mill, find him disagreeable. But the case is altered now. She knows now what gentlemen are, and nothing but a gentleman in education and manner has any chance with Harriet." Nonsense. Errant nonsense as ever was talked," cried Mr. Knightley. Robert Martin's manners have sense, sincerity, and good humour to recommend them, and his mind has more true gentility than Harriet Smith could ever understand." Emma made no answer, and tried to look cheerfully unconcerned, but was really feeling uncomfortable, and wanting him very much to be gone. She did not repent what she had done. She still thought herself a better judge of such a point of female right and refinement than he could be. But yet she had a sort of habitual respect for his judgment in general, which made her dislike having it so loudly against hers, and to have him sit just opposite to her in an angry state was very disagreeable. Some minutes passed in this unpleasant silence, with only one attempt on Emma's side to talk of the weather, but he made no answer. He was thinking. The result of his thoughts appeared at last in these words. "'Robert Martin has no great loss, if he can but think so. 
and I hope it will not be long before he does. Your views for Harriet are best known to yourself, but as you make no secret of your love of matchmaking, it is fair to suppose that views and plans and projects you have, and as a friend I shall just hint to you that if Elton is the man, I think it will be all labour in vain." Emma laughed and disclaimed. He continued, "'Depend upon it, Elton will not do. Elton is a very good sort of a man, and a very respectable vicar of Highbury, but not at all likely to make an imprudent match. He knows the value of a good income as well as anybody. Elton may talk sentimentally, but he will act rationally. He is as well acquainted with his own claims as you can be with Harriet's. He knows that he is a very handsome young man, and a great favourite wherever he goes, and from his general way of talking in unreserved moments, when there are only men present, I am convinced that he does not mean to throw himself away. I have heard him speak with great animation of a large family of young ladies that his sisters are intimate with, who all have twenty thousand pounds apiece." "'I am very much obliged to you,' said Emma, laughing again. If I had set my heart on Mr. Elton's marrying Harriet, it would have been very kind to open my eyes. But at present I only want to keep Harriet to myself. I have done with matchmaking indeed. I could never hope to equal my own doings at Randall's. I shall leave off while I am well." "'Good morning to you,' said he, rising and walking off abruptly. He was very much vexed. He felt the disappointment of the young man, and was mortified to have been the means of promoting it, by the sanction he had given, and the part which he was persuaded Emma had taken in the affair, was provoking him exceedingly. Emma remained in a state of vexation, too, but there was more indistinctness in the causes of hers than in his. She did not always feel so absolutely satisfied with herself, so entirely convinced that her opinions were right and her adversaries wrong, as Mr. Knightley. He walked off in more complete self-approbation than he left for her. She was not so materially cast down, however, but that a little time and the return of Harriet were very adequate restoratives. Harriet staying away so long was beginning to make her uneasy. The possibility of the young man's coming to Mrs. Goddard's that morning, and meeting with Harriet and pleading his own cause, gave alarming ideas. The dread of such a failure, after all, became the prominent uneasiness. And when Harriet appeared, and in very good spirits, and without having any such reason to give for her long absence, she felt a satisfaction which settled her with her own mind, and convinced her, that let Mr. Knightley think or say what he would, she had done nothing which woman's friendship and woman's feelings would not justify. He had frightened her a little about Mr. Elton, but when she considered that Mr. Knightley could not have observed him as she had done, neither with the interest, nor, she must be allowed to tell herself, in spite of Mr. Knightley's pretensions, with the skill of such an observer on such a question as herself, that he had spoken it hastily, and in anger, she was able to believe, that he had rather said what he had wished resentfully to be true, than what he knew anything about. He certainly might have heard Mr. Elton speak with more unreserve than she had ever done, and Mr. Elton might not be of an imprudent, inconsiderate disposition as to money matters. He might naturally be rather attentive than otherwise to them. But then Mr. Knightley did not make due allowance for the influence of a strong passion at war with all interested motives. Mr. Knightley saw no such passion, and of course thought nothing of its effects. But she saw too much of it to feel a doubt of its overcoming any hesitations that a reasonable prudence might originally suggest, and more than a reasonable, becoming degree of prudence, she was very sure did not belong to Mr. Elton. Harriet's cheerful look and manner established hers. She came back, not to think of Mr. Martin, but to talk of Mr. Elton. Miss Nash had been telling her something, which she repeated immediately with great delight. Mr. Perry had been to Mrs. Goddard's to attend a sick child, and Miss Nash had seen him, and he had told Miss Nash that as he was coming back yesterday from Clayton Park, he had met Mr. Elton, and found to his great surprise that Mr. Elton was actually on his road to London, and not meaning to return till the morrow, though it was the Whist Club night which he had been never known to miss before, and Mr. Perry had remonstrated with him about it, and told him how shabby it was in him, their best player, to absent himself, and tried very much to persuade him to put off his journey only one day. But it would not do. Mr. Elton had been determined to go on, and had said in a very particular way indeed that he was going on business which he would not put off for any inducement in the world, and told him so and something about a very enviable commission, and being the bearer of something exceedingly precious. Mr. Perry could not quite understand him, but he was very sure there must be a lady in the case, and he told him so. And Mr. Elton lonely looked very conscious and smiling, and rode off in great spirits. Miss Nash had told her all this, and had talked a great deal more about Mr. Elton, 
and said, looking so very significantly at her, that she did not pretend to understand what his business might be, but she only knew that any woman whom Mr. Elton could prefer, she should think the luckiest woman in the world, for beyond a doubt Mr. Elton had not his equal for beauty or agreeableness. End of chapter 8《Volume One, Chapter Nine of Emma. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Emma by Jane Austen. Volume One, Chapter Nine. Mr. Knightley might quarrel with her, but Emma could not quarrel with herself. He was so much displeased that it was longer than usual before he came to Hartfield again, and when they did meet, his grave looks showed that she was not forgiven. She was sorry, but could not repent. On the contrary, her plans and proceedings were more and more justified and endeared to her by the general appearances of the next few days. The picture, elegantly framed, came safely to hand soon after Mr. Elton's return, and being hung over the mantelpiece of the common sitting-room, he got up to look at it, and sighed out his half-sentences of admiration just as he ought. And as for Harriet's feelings, they were visibly forming themselves into as strong and steady an attachment as her youth and sort of mind admitted. Emma was soon perfectly satisfied of Mr. Martin's being no otherwise remembered than as he furnished a contrast with Mr. Elton, of the utmost advantage to the latter. Her views of improving her little friend's mind, by a great deal of useful reading and conversation, had never yet led to more than a few first chapters, and the intention of going on to-morrow. It was much easier to chat than to study, much pleasanter to let her imagination range and work at Harriet's fortune, than to be labouring to enlarge her comprehension, or exercise it on sober facts. And the only literary pursuit which engaged Harriet at present, the only mental provision she was making for the evening of life, was the collecting and transcribing all the riddles of every sort that she could meet with, into a thin quarto of hot-pressed paper, made up by her friend, and ornamented with ciphers and trophies. In this age of literature such collections on a very grand scale are not uncommon. Miss Nash, head-teacher at Mrs. Goddard's, had written out at least three hundred and Harriet, who had taken the first hint of it from her, hoped, with Miss Woodhouse's help, to get a great many more. Emma assisted with her invention, memory, and taste, and as Harriet wrote a very pretty hand, it was likely to be an arrangement of the first order, in form as well as quantity. Mr. Woodhouse was almost as much interested in the business as the girls, and tried very often to recollect something worth their putting in. So many clever riddles as there used to be when he was young! He wondered he could not remember them, but he hoped he should in time." And it always ended in, "'Kitty, a fair but frozen maid!' His good friend Perry, too, whom he had spoken to on the subject, did not at present recollect anything of the riddle kind, but he had desired Perry to be upon the watch, and as he went about so much, something, he thought, might come from that quarter. It was by no means his daughter's wish that the intellects of Highbury in general should be put under requisition. Mr. Elton was the only one whose assistance she asked. He was invited to contribute any really good enigmas, charades, or conundrums that he might recollect, and she had the pleasure of seeing him most intently at work with his recollections, and at the same time, as she could perceive, most earnestly careful that nothing ungallant, nothing that did not breathe a compliment to the sex, should pass his lips. They owed to him their two or three politest puzzles, and the joy and exultation with which at last he recalled, and rather sentimentally recited, that well-known charade, My first doth affliction denote, which my second is destined to feel, and my hold is the best antidote, that affliction to soften and heal, made her quite sorry to acknowledge that they had transcribed it some pages ago already. Why will not you write one yourself for us, Mr. Elton? said she. That is the only security for its freshness, and nothing could be easier to you." No, no! He had never written, hardly ever, anything of the kind in his life. The stupidest fellow—he was afraid not even Miss Woodhouse," he stopped a moment, or Miss Smith could inspire him. The very next day, however, he produced some proof of inspiration. 
He called for a few moments, just to leave a piece of paper on the table, containing, as he said, a charade, which a friend of his had addressed to a young lady, the object of his admiration, but which, from his manner, Emma was immediately convinced must be his own. "'I do not offer it for Miss Smith's collection,' said he. "'Being my friends, I have no right to expose it in any degree to the public eye, but perhaps you may not dislike looking at it.' The speech was more to Emma than to Harriet, which Emma could understand. There was deep consciousness about him, and he found it easier to meet her eye than her friend's. He was gone the next moment, after another moment's pause. "'Take it,' said Emma, smiling, and pushing the paper towards Harriet. "'It is for you. Take your own.' But Harriet was in a tremor, and could not touch it, and Emma, never loath to be first, was obliged to examine it herself. To Miss Sherard, my first displays the wealth and pomp of kings, lords of the earth, their luxury and ease. Another view of man my second brings, behold him there, the monarch of the seas. But ah, united, what reverse we have! Man's boasted power and freedom all are flown. Lord of the earth and sea, he bends a slave, and woman, lovely woman, reigns alone. Thy ready wit the word will soon supply, may its approval beam in that soft eye." She cast her eye over it, pondered, caught the meaning, read it through again to be quite certain, and quite mistress of the lines, and then, passing it to Harriet, sat happily smiling and saying to herself, while Harriet was puzzling over the paper in all the confusion of hope and dullness, "'Very well, Mr. Elton, very well indeed. I have read worse charades. Courtship! A very good hint. I give you credit for it. This is feeling your way. This is saying very plainly, Pray, Miss Smith, give me leave to pay my addresses to you. Approve my charade and my intentions in the same glance. May its approval beam in that soft eye. Harriet, exactly. Soft is the very word for her eye, of all epithets, the justice that could be given. Thy ready wit the word will soon supply. Hm! Harriet's ready wit! All the better! A man must be very much in love indeed to describe her so. Ah, Mr. Knightley, I wish you had the benefit of this. I think this would convince you. For once in your life you would be obliged to own yourself mistaken. An excellent charade indeed, and very much the purpose. Things must come to a crisis soon now. She was obliged to break off from these very pleasant observations, which were otherwise of a sort to run into great length, by the eagerness of Harriet's wondering questions. "'What can it be, Miss Woodhouse? What can it be? I have not an idea. I cannot guess it in the least. What can it possibly be? Do try to find it out, Miss Woodhouse. Do help me. I never saw anything so hard. Is it Kingdom? I wonder who the friend was, and who could be the young lady. Do you think it is a good one? Can it be woman? And woman, lovely woman, reigns alone. Can it be Neptune? Behold him there, the monarch of the seas. Or a trident? Or a mermaid? Or a shark? Oh, no, shark is only one syllable. It must be very clever, or we would not have brought it. Oh, Miss Woodhouse, do you think we shall ever find it out? Mermaids and sharks? Nonsense! My dear Harriet, what are you thinking of? Where would be the use of his bringing us a charade made by a friend upon a mermaid or a shark? Give me the paper and listen. For Miss Blank, read Miss Smith. My first displays the wealth and pomp of kings, lords of the earth, their luxury and ease. That is court. Another view of man my second brings. Behold him there, the monarch of the seas. That is ship, plain as it can be. Now for the cream. But ah, united! Courtship, you know. What reverse we have! Man's boasted power and freedom all are flown. Lord of the earth and sea he bends a slave, and woman, lovely woman, reigns alone. A very proper compliment. And then follows the application, which I think, my dear Harriet, you cannot find much difficulty in comprehending. Read it in comfort to yourself. There can be no doubt of its being written for you and to you." Harriet could not long resist so delightful a persuasion. 
She read the concluding lines, and was all flutter and happiness. She could not speak. But she was not wanted to speak. It was enough for her to feel. Emma spoke for her. "'There is so pointed and so particular a meaning in this compliment,' said she, "'that I cannot have a doubt as to Mr. Elton's intentions. You are his object, and you will soon receive the completest proof of it. I thought it must be so. I thought I could not be so deceived. But now it is clear. The state of his mind is as clear and decided as my wishes on the subject have been ever since I knew you. Yes, Harriet, just so long have I been wanting the very circumstance to happen which has happened. I could never tell whether an attachment between you and Mr. Elton were the most desirable or the most natural. Its probability and its eligibility have really so equalled each other. I am very happy. I congratulate you, my dear Harriet, with all my heart. This is an attachment which a woman may well feel pride in creating. This is a connection which offers nothing but good. It will give you everything that you want—consideration, independence, a proper home. It will fix you in the centre of all your real friends, close to Hartfield and to me, and confirm our intimacy for ever. This, Harriet, is an alliance which can never raise a blush in either of us." "'Dear Miss Woodhouse!' and, "'Dear Miss Woodhouse!' was all that Harriet, with many tender embraces, could articulate at first. But when they did arrive at something more like conversation, it was sufficiently clear to her friend that she saw, felt, anticipated, and remembered just as she ought. Mr. Elton's superiority had very ample acknowledgment. "'Whatever you say is always right,' cried Harriet. "'And therefore, I suppose, and believe, and hope it must be so. But otherwise I could not have imagined it. It is so much beyond anything I deserve. Mr. Elton, who might marry anybody! There cannot be two opinions about him. He is so very superior. Only think of those sweet verses. To Miss Blank! Dear me, how clever! Could it really be meant for me? I cannot make a question, or listen to a question about that. It is a certainty. Receive it on my judgment. It is a sort of prologue to the play, a motto to the chapter, and will soon be followed by matter-of-fact prose. It is a sort of thing which nobody could have expected, I am sure, a month ago. I had no more idea myself. The strangest things do take place. When Miss Smiths and Mr. Eltons get acquainted, they do indeed, and really it is strange. It is out of the common course that what is so evidently, so palpably desirable, what courts the prearrangement of other people, should so immediately shape itself into the proper form. You and Mr. Elton are by situation called together. You belong to one another by every circumstance of your respective homes. Your marrying will be the equal to the match at Randall's. There does seem to be a something in the air of Hartfield which gives love exactly the right direction, and send it into the very channel where it ought to flow. The course of true love never did run smooth. A Hartfield edition of Shakespeare would have a long note on that passage. That Mr. Elton should really be in love with me, me of all people, who did not know him, to speak to him at Michaelmas, and he the very handsomest man that ever was, and a man that everybody looks up to, quite like Mr. Knightley. His company so sought after, that everybody says he need not eat a single meal by himself if he does not choose it that he has more invitations than there are days in the week, and so excellent in the church. Miss Nash has put down all the texts he has ever preached from since he came to Highbury. Dear me, when I look back to the first time I saw him, how little did I think! The two abbots and I ran into the front room and peeped through the blind when we heard he was going by, and Miss Nash came and scolded us away, and stayed to look through herself. However, she called me back presently, and let me look too, which was very good-natured. And how beautiful we thought he looked! He was arm in arm with Mr. Cole. This is an alliance which, whoever, whatever your friends may be, must be agreeable to them, provided at least they have common sense, and we are not to be addressing our conduct to fools. If they are anxious to see you happily married, here is a man whose amiable character gives us every assurance of it. If they wish to have you settled in the same country and circle which they have chosen to place you in, here it will be accomplished, and if their only object is that you should, in the common phrase, be well married, here is the comfortable fortune, the respectable establishment, the rise in the world which must satisfy them." "'Yes, very true. How nicely you talk! I love to hear you. You understand everything. 
You and Mr. Elton are of one as clever as the other. This charade! If I had studied a twelve-month, I could never have made anything like it." I thought he meant to try his skill by his manner of declining it yesterday. I do think it is, without exception, the best charade I ever read. I never read one more to the purpose, certainly. It is as long again as almost all we have had before. I do not consider its length as particularly in its favour. Such things in general cannot be too short." Harriet was too intent on the lines to hear. The most satisfactory comparisons were rising in her mind. "'It is one thing,' said she presently, her cheeks in a glow, "'to have very good sense in a common way, like everybody else, and if there is anything to say, to sit down and write a letter, and say just what you must in a short way, and another to write verses and charades like this." Emma could not have desired a more spirited rejection of Mr. Martin's prose. "'Such sweet lines!' continued Harriet. "'These two last. But how shall I ever be able to return the paper, or say I have found it out? Oh, Miss Woodhouse, what can we do about that?' "'Leave it to me. You do nothing. He will be here this evening, I dare say. And then I will give it him back, and some nonsense or other will pass between us, and you shall not be committed. Your soft eyes shall choose their own time for beaming. Trust to me." "'Oh, Miss Woodhouse, what a pity that I must not write this beautiful charade into my book! I am sure I have not got one half so good." "'Leave out the last two lines, and there is no reason why you should not write it into your book." "'Oh! But those two lines are—' "'The best of all. Granted. For private enjoyment. And for private enjoyment keep them. They are not at all the less written, you know, because you divide them. The couplet does not cease to be, nor does its meaning change. But take it away, and all appropriation ceases, and a very pretty gallant charade remains, fit for any collection. Depend upon it, he would not like to have his charade slighted, much better than his passion. A poet in love must be encouraged in both capacities, or neither. Give me the book, I will write it down, and then there can be no possible reflection on you." Harriet submitted, though her mind could hardly separate the parts, so as to feel quite sure that her friend were not writing down a declaration of love. It seemed too precious an offering for any degree of publicity. "'I shall never let that book go out of my own hands,' said she. "'Very well,' replied Emma. "'A most natural feeling, and the longer it lasts, the better I shall be pleased. But here is my father coming. You will not object to my reading the charade to him. It will be giving him so much pleasure. He loves anything of the sort, and especially anything that pays a woman a compliment. He has the tenderest spirit of gallantry towards us all. You must let me read it to him." Harriet looked grave. "'My dear Harriet, you must not refine too much upon this charade. You will betray your feelings improperly, if you are too conscious and too quick, and appear to fix more meaning, or even quite all the meaning which may be affixed to it. Do not be overpowered by such a little tribute of admiration. If he had been anxious for secrecy, he would not have left the paper while I was by. But he rather pushed it towards me than towards you. Do not let us be too solemn on the business. He has encouragement enough to proceed, without our sighing out our souls over this charade. Oh, no! I hope I shall not be ridiculous about it. Do as you please." Mr. Woodhouse came in, and very soon led to the subject again by the recurrence of his very frequent inquiry of, "'Well, my dears, how does your book go on? Have you got anything fresh?' "'Yes, papa. We have something to read you, and something quite fresh. A piece of paper was found on the table this morning, dropped, we suppose, by a fairy, containing a very pretty charade, and we have just copied it in. She read it to him, just as he liked to have anything read, slowly and distinctly, and two or three times over, with explanations of every part as she proceeded, and he was very much pleased, and as she had foreseen, especially struck with the complimentary conclusion. "'Ay, that's very just indeed, that's very properly said, very true. Woman, lovely woman! It is such a pretty charade, my dear, that I can easily guess what fairy brought it. Nobody could have written so prettily but you, Emma." Emma only nodded and smiled. After a little thinking and a very tender sigh, he added, "'Ah! It is no difficulty to see who you take after. Your dear mother was so clever at all those things. If I had but her memory! But I can remember nothing, not even that particular riddle which you have heard me mention. I can only recollect the first stanza, and there are several. 
Kitty, a fair but frozen maid, kindled a flame I yet deplore. The hoodwinked boy I called to aid, though of his near approach afraid, so fatal to my suit before. And that is all that I can recollect of it. But it is very clever all the way through. But I think, my dear, you said you had got it. Yes, papa, it is written out on our second page. We copied it from the elegant extracts. It was Garrick's, you know. Ay, very true. I wish I could recollect more of it. Kitty, a fair but frozen maid. The name makes me think of poor Isabella, for she was very near being christened Catherine after her grandmamma. I hope we shall have her here next week. Have you thought, my dear, where you shall put her, and what room there will be for the children? Oh, yes, she will have her own room, of course, the room she always has, and there is the nursery for the children, just as usual, you know. Why should there be any change? I do not know, my dear, but it is so long since she was here, not since last Easter, and then only for a few days. Mr. John Knightley's being a lawyer is very inconvenient. Poor Isabella! She is sadly taken away from us all. And how sorry she will be when she comes not to see Miss Taylor here! She will not be surprised, papa, at least. I do not know, my dear. I am sure I was very much surprised when I first heard she was going to be married. We must ask Mr. and Mrs. Weston to dine with us while Isabella is here. Yes, my dear, if there is time. But, in a very depressed tone, she is coming only for one week. There will not be time for anything. It is unfortunate that they cannot stay longer. But it seems a case of necessity. Mr. John Knightley must be in town again on the twenty-eighth, and we ought to be thankful, papa, that we are to have the whole of the time they can give to the country, that two or three days are not to be taken out for the Abbey. Mr. Knightley promises to give up his claim this Christmas, though you know it is longer since they were with him than with us. It would be very hard indeed, my dear, if poor Isabella were to be anywhere but at Hartfield. Mr. Woodhouse could never allow for Mr. Knightley's claims on his brother, or anybody's claims on Isabella except his own. He sat musing a little while, and then said, "'But I do not see why poor Isabella should be obliged to go back so soon, though he does. I think, Emma, I shall try and persuade her to stay longer with us. She and the children might stay very well.' "'Ah, papa, that is what you have never been able to accomplish, and I do not think you ever will. Isabella cannot bear to stay behind her husband.' This was too true for contradiction. Unwelcome as it was, Mr. Woodhouse could give only a submissive sigh, and as Emma saw his spirits affected by the idea of his daughter's attachment to her husband, she immediately led to such a branch of the subject as must raise them. "'Harriet must give us as much of her company as she can while my brother and sister are here. I am sure she will be pleased with the children. We are very proud of the children, are we not, papa? I wonder which she will think the handsomest, Henry or John.' Ay, I wonder which she will. Poor little dears! How glad they will be to come! They are very fond of being at Hartfield, Harriet." "'I dare say they are, sir. I am sure I do not know who is not." "'Henry is a fine boy, but John is very like his mamma. Henry is the eldest. He was named after me, not after his father. John the second is named after his father. Some people are surprised, I believe, that the eldest was not, but Isabella would have him called Henry, which I thought very pretty of her. And he is a very clever boy, indeed. They are all remarkably clever, and they have so many pretty ways. They will come and stand by my chair and say, Grandpapa, can you give me a bit of string? And once Henry asked me for a knife, but I told him knives were only made for grandpapas. I think their father is too rough with them very often." "'He appears rough to you,' said Emma, "'because you are so very gentle yourself. But if you could compare him with other papas, you would not think him rough. He wishes his boys to be active and hardy, and if they misbehave he can give them a sharp word now and then, but he is an affectionate father. Certainly Mr. John Knightley is an affectionate father. The children are all fond of him.' "'And then their uncle comes in and tosses them up to the ceiling in a very frightful way.' But they like it, papa. There is nothing they like so much. It is such enjoyment to them, that if their uncle did not lay down the rule of their taking turns, whichever began would never give way to the other. Well, I cannot understand it. That is the case with us all, papa. One half of the world cannot understand the pleasures of the other. 
Later in the morning, and just as the girls were going to separate in preparation for the regular four o'clock dinner, the hero of this inimitable charade walked in again. Harriet turned away, but Emma could receive him with the usual smile, and her quick eye soon discerned in his the consciousness of having made a push, of having thrown a die, and she imagined he was come to see how it might turn up. His ostensible reason, however, was to ask whether Mr. Woodhouse's party could be made up in the evening without him, or whether he should be in the smallest degree necessary at Hartfield. If he were, everything else must give way, but otherwise his friend Cole had been saying so much about dining with him, had made such a point of it, that he had promised him conditionally to come. Emma thanked him, but could not allow of his disappointing his friend on their account. Her father was sure of his rubber. He re-urged, she re-declined, and he seemed then about to make his bow, when, taking the paper from the table, she returned it. "'Oh! Here's the charade you were so obliging as to leave with us. Thank you for the sight of it. We admired it so much, that I have ventured to write it into Miss Smith's collection. Your friend will not take it amiss, I hope. Of course I have not transcribed beyond the first eight lines.' Mr. Elton certainly did not very well know what to say. He looked rather doubtingly, rather confused, said something about honour, glanced at Emma and at Harriet, and then, seeing the book open on the table, took it up and examined it very attentively. With the view of passing off an awkward moment, Emma smilingly said, "'You must make my apologies to your friend, but so good a charade must not be confined to one or two. He may be sure of every woman's approbation while he writes with such gallantry.' "'I have no hesitation in saying,' replied Mr. Elton, though hesitating a good deal while he spoke, "'I have no hesitation in saying, at least if my friend feels at all as I do, I have not the smallest doubt that, could he see his little effusion honoured as I see it,' looking at the book again and replacing it on the table, "'he would consider it as the proudest moment of his life.' After this speech he was gone as soon as possible. Emma could not think it too soon, for with all his good and agreeable qualities, there was a sort of parade in his speeches which was very apt to incline her to laugh. She ran away to indulge the inclination, leaving the tender and the sublime of pleasure to Harriet's share. End of chapter 9by Jane Austen, Volume One, Chapter Ten. Though now the middle of December, there had yet been no weather to prevent the young ladies from tolerably regular exercise, and on the morrow Emma had a charitable visit to pay to a poor sick family who lived a little way out of Highbury. Their road to this detached cottage was down Vicarage Lane, a lane leading at right angles from the broad though irregular main street of the place and as may be inferred, containing the blessed abode of Mr. Elton. A few inferior dwellings were first to be passed, and then about a quarter of a mile down the lane rose the vicarage, an old and not very good house, almost as close to the road as it could be. It had no advantage of situation, but had been very much smartened up by the present proprietor, and such as it was, there could be no possibility of the two friends passing it without a slackened pace and observing eyes. Emma's remark was, there it is. There go you and your riddle-book one of these days." Harriet's was. "'Oh, what a sweet house! How very beautiful! There are the yellow curtains that Miss Nash admires so much.' "'I do not often walk this way now,' said Emma, as they proceeded. "'But then there will be an inducement, and I shall gradually get intimately acquainted with all the hedges, gates, pools, and pollards of this part of Highbury. Harriet, she found, had never in her life been inside the vicarage, and her curiosity to see it was so extreme, that, considering exteriors and probabilities, Emma could only class it as a proof of love, with Mr. Elton's seeing ready wit in her. "'I wish we could contrive it,' said she, "'but I cannot think of any tolerable pretence for going in. No servant that I want to inquire about of his housekeeper, no message from my father.' She pondered, but could think of nothing. After a mutual silence of some minutes, Harriet thus began again, "'I do so wonder, Miss Woodhouse, that you should not be married, or going to be married, so charming as you are.' Emma laughed, and replied, "'My being charming, Harriet, is not quite enough to induce me to marry. I must find other people charming—one other person, at least. And I am not only not going to be married at present, but have very little intention of ever marrying at all.' 
Ah, so you say, but I cannot believe it. I must see somebody very superior to any one I have seen yet to be tempted. Mr. Elton, you know, recollecting herself, is out of the question, and I do not wish to see any such person. I would rather not be tempted. I really cannot change for the better. If I were to marry, I must expect to repent it." "'Dear me! It is so odd to hear a woman talk so. I have none of the usual inducements of women to marry. Were I to fall in love, indeed, it would be a different thing. But I have never been in love. It is not my way, or my nature, and I do not think I ever shall. And without love I am sure I should be a fool to change such a situation as mine. Fortune I do not want, employment I do not want, consequence I do not want. I believe few married women are half as much mistress of their husband's house as I am of Hartfield, and never, never could I expect to be so truly beloved and important, so always first and always right in any man's eyes, as I am in my father's." "'But then to be an old maid at last, like Miss Bates!' "'That is as formidable an image as you could present, Harriet, and if I thought I should ever be like Miss Bates, so silly, so satisfied, so smiling, so prosing, so undistinguishing and unfastidious, and so apt to tell everything relative to everybody about me, I would marry to-morrow. But between us, I am convinced there can never be any likeness, except in being unmarried." "'But still, you will be an old maid, and that's so dreadful!' Never mind, Harriet, I shall not be a poor old maid, and it is poverty only which makes celibacy contemptible to a generous public. A single woman with a very narrow income must be a ridiculous, disagreeable old maid. The proper sport of boys and girls, but a single woman of good fortune is always respectable, and may be as sensible and pleasant as anybody else. And the distinction is not quite so much against the candour and common sense of the world as appears at first for a very narrow income has a tendency to contract the mind and sour the temper. Those who can barely live, and who live perforce in a very small and generally very inferior society, may well be illiberal and cross. This does not apply, however, to Miss Bates. She is only too good-natured and too silly to suit me. But in general she is very much to the taste of everybody, though single and though poor. Poverty certainly has not contracted her mind. I really believe, if she had only a shilling in the world, she would be very likely to give away sixpence of it. And nobody is afraid of her. That is a great charm." "'Dear me! But what shall you do? How shall you employ yourself when you grow old?' "'If I know myself, Harriet, mine is an active, busy mind, with a great many independent resources, and I do not perceive why I should be in more want of employment at forty or fifty than one and twenty. Woman's usual occupations of hand and mind will be as open to me then as they are now, or with no important variation. If I draw less, I shall read more. If I give up music, I shall take to carpet-work. And as for objects of interest, objects to the affections, which is in truth the great point of inferiority, the want of which is really the great evil to be avoided in not marrying, I shall be very well off, with all the children of a sister I love so much to care about. There will be enough of them, in all probability, to supply every sort of sensation that declining life can need. There will be enough for every hope and every fear. And though my attachment to none can equal that of a parent, it suits my ideas of comfort better than what is warmer and blinder. My nephews and nieces! I shall often have a niece with me." "'Do you know Miss Bates' niece? That is, I know you must have seen her a hundred times, but are you acquainted?' Oh, yes, we are always forced to be acquainted whenever she comes to Highbury. By the by, that is almost enough to put one out of conceit with a niece. Heaven forbid, at least, that I should ever bore people half so much about all the Knightleys together as she does about Jane Fairfax. One is sick of the very name of Jane Fairfax. Every letter from her is read forty times over. Her compliments to all friends go round and round again. And if she does but send her aunt the pattern of a stomacher, or knit a pair of garters for her grandmother, one hears of nothing else for a month. I wish Jane Fairfax very well, but she tires me to death." They were now approaching the cottage, and all idle topics were superseded. Emma was very compassionate, and the distresses of the poor were as sure of relief from her personal attention and kindness, her counsel and her patience, as from her purse. She understood their ways, could allow for their ignorance and their temptations. 
had no romantic expectations of extraordinary virtue from those for whom education had done so little, entered into their troubles with ready sympathy, and always gave her assistance with as much intelligence as good will. In the present instance it was sickness and poverty together which she came to visit, and after remaining there as long as she could give comfort or advice, she quitted the cottage with such an impression of the scene as made her say to Harriet as they walked away, "'These are the sights, Harriet, to do one good. How trifling they make everything else appear! I feel now as if I could think of nothing but these poor creatures all the rest of the day. And yet, who can say how soon it may all vanish from my mind?" "'Very true said Harriet. Poor creatures! One can think of nothing else." "'And really, I do not think the impression will soon be over,' said Emma, as she crossed the low hedge and tottering footstep which ended the narrow, slippery path through the cottage garden, and brought them into the lane again. "'I do not think it will,' stopping to look once more at all the outward wretchedness of the place, and recall the still greater within. "'Oh, dear no!' said her companion. They walked on. The lane made a slight bend, and when that bend was passed, Mr. Elton was immediately in sight, and so near as to give Emma time only to say further, "'Ah, Harriet, here comes a very sudden trial of our stability and good thoughts. Well,' smiling, "'I hope it may be allowed that if compassion has produced exertion and relief to the sufferers, it has done all that is truly important. If we feel for the wretched enough to do all we can for them, the rest is empty sympathy, only distressing to ourselves.' Harriet could just answer, "'Oh, dear, yes!' before the gentlemen joined them. The wants and sufferings of the poor family, however, were the first subject on meeting. He had been going to call on them. His visit he would now defer, but they had a very interesting parley about what could be done and what should be done. Mr. Relton then turned back to accompany them. "'To fall in with each other on such a narrative as this,' thought Emma, "'to meet in a charitable scheme, this will bring a great increase of love on each side. I should not wonder if it were to bring on the declaration. It must, if I were not here. I wish I were anywhere else." Anxious to separate herself from them as far as she could, she soon afterwards took possession of a narrow footpath, a little raised on one side of the lane, leaving them together in the main road. But she had not been there two minutes, when she found that Harriet's habits of dependence and imitation were bringing her up too, and that in short they would both be soon after her. This would not do. She immediately stopped under pretence of having some alteration to make in the lacing of her half-boot, and stooping down in complete occupation of the footpath, begged them to have the goodness to walk on, and she would follow in half a minute. They did as they were desired, and by the time she judged it reasonable to have done with her boot, she had the comfort of farther delay in her power, being overtaken by a child from the cottage, setting out according to warders with her pitcher, to fetch broth from Hartfield. To walk by the side of this child, and to talk to and question her, was the most natural thing in the world, or would have been the most natural, had she been acting just then without design. And by this means the others were still able to keep ahead, without any obligation of waiting for her. She gained on them, however, involuntarily. The child's pace was quick, and theirs rather slow, and she was the more concerned at it, from their being evidently in a conversation which interested them. Mr. Elton was speaking with animation, Harriet listening with a very pleased attention, and Emma, having sent the child on, was beginning to think how she might draw back a little more, when they both looked around, and she was obliged to join them. Mr. Elton was still talking, still engaged in some interesting detail, and Emma experienced some disappointment when she found that he was only giving his fair companion an account of the yesterday's party at his friend Cole's, and that she was come in herself for the Stilton cheese, the North Wiltshire, the butter, the celery, the beetroot, and all the dessert. This would soon have led to something better, of course," was her consoling reflection. Anything interests between those who love, and anything will serve as introduction to what is near the heart. If I could but have kept longer away!" They now walked on together quietly, till within view of the vicarage pales, when a sudden resolution, of at least getting Harriet into the house, made her again find something very much amiss about her boot, and fall behind to arrange it once more. She then broke the lace off short, and dexterously throwing it into a ditch, was presently obliged to entreat them to stop, and acknowledged her inability to put herself to right so as to be able to walk home in tolerable comfort. "'Part of my lace is gone,' said she, "'and I do not know how I am to contrive. I really am a most troublesome companion to you both, but I hope I am not often so ill-equipped. Mr. Elton, I must beg leave to stop at your house, and ask your housekeeper for a bit of ribbon or string, or anything just to keep my boot on.' 
Mr. Elton looked all happiness at this proposition, and nothing could exceed his alertness and attention in conducting them into his house, and endeavouring to make everything appear to advantage. The room they were taken into was the one he chiefly occupied, and looking forwards, behind it was another with which it immediately communicated. The door between them was open, and Emma passed into it with the housekeeper to receive her assistance in the most comfortable manner. She was obliged to leave the door ajar as she found it, but she fully intended that Mr. Elton should close it. It was not closed, however, it still remained ajar, but by engaging the housekeeper in incessant conversation, she hoped to make it practicable for him to choose his own subject in the adjoining room. For ten minutes she could hear nothing but herself. It could be protracted no longer. She was then obliged to be finished and make her appearance. The lovers were standing together at one of the windows. It had a most favourable aspect, and for half a minute Emma felt the glory of having schemed successfully. But it would not do. He had not come to the point. He had been most agreeable, most delightful. He had told Harriet that he had seen them go by, and had purposely followed them. Other little gallantries and allusions had been dropped, but nothing serious. Cautious, very cautious, thought Emma. He advances inch by inch, and will hazard nothing till he believes himself secure. Still, however, though everything had not been accomplished by her ingenious device, she could not but flatter herself that it had been the occasion of much present enjoyment to both, and must be leading them forward to the great event. End of chapter 10 Volume 1, Chapter 11 of Emma. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Emma by Jane Austen. Volume 1, Chapter 11. Mr. Elton must now be left to himself. It was no longer in Emma's power to superintend his happiness or quicken his measures. The coming of her sister's family was so very near at hand, that first in anticipation, and then in reality, it became henceforth her prime object of interest, and during the ten days of their stay at Hartfield it was not to be expected, she did not herself expect, that anything beyond occasional fortuitous assistance could be afforded by her to the lovers. They might advance rapidly if they would, however, they must advance somehow or other whether they would or no. She hardly wished to have more leisure for them. There are people, who the more you do for them, the less they will do for themselves. Mr. and Mrs. John Knightley, from having been longer than usual absent from Surrey, were exciting, of course, rather more than the usual interest. Till this year, every long vacation since their marriage had been divided between Hartfield and Donwell Abbey, but all the holidays of this autumn had been given to sea-bathing for the children, and it was therefore many months since they had been seen in a regular way by their Surrey connections, or seen at all by Mr. Woodhouse, who could not be induced to get so far as London, even for poor Isabella's sake, and who consequently was now most nervously and apprehensively happy in forestalling this too short visit. He thought much of the evils of the journey for her, and not a little of the fatigues of his own horses and coachmen, who were to bring some of the party the last half of the way. But his alarms were needless the sixteen miles being happily accomplished, and Mr. and Mrs. John Knightley, their five children, and a competent number of nursery-maids, all reaching Hartfield in safety. The bustle and joy of such an arrival, the many to be talked to, welcomed, encouraged, and variously dispersed and disposed of, produced a noise and confusion which his nerves could not have borne under any other cause, nor have endured much longer even for this. But the ways of Hartfield and the feelings of her father were so respected by Mrs. John Knightley that in spite of maternal solicitude for the immediate enjoyment of her little ones, and for their having instantly all the liberty and attendance, all the eating and drinking and sleeping and playing which they could possibly wish for, without the smallest delay, the children were never allowed to be long a disturbance to him, either in themselves, or in any restless attendance on them. Mrs. John Knightley was a pretty, elegant little woman, of gentle, quiet manners, and a disposition remarkably amiable and affectionate wrapped up in her family, a devoted wife, a doting mother, and so tenderly attached to her father and sister that, but for these higher ties, a warmer love might have seemed impossible. She could never see a fault in any of them. She was not a woman of strong understanding or any quickness, and with this resemblance of her father, she inherited also much of his constitution, was delicate in her own health, over-careful of that of her children, had many fears and many nerves, and was as fond of her own Mr. Wingfield in town as her father could be of Mr. Perry. They were alike, too, in a general benevolence of temper, and a strong habit of regard for every old acquaintance. 
Mr. John Knightley was a tall gentleman-like and very clever man, rising in his profession, domestic and respectable in his private character, but with reserved manners which prevented his being generally pleasing, and capable of being sometimes out of humour. He was not an ill-tempered man, not so often unreasonably cross as to deserve such a reproach, but his temper was not his great perfection and indeed, with such a worshipping wife, it was hardly possible that any natural defects in it should not be increased. The extreme sweetness of her temper must hurt his. He had all the clearness and quickness of mind which she wanted, and he could sometimes act an ungracious, or say a severe thing. He was not a great favourite with his fair sister-in-law. Nothing wrong in him escaped her. She was quick in feeling little injuries to Isabella, which Isabella never felt herself. Perhaps she might have passed over more had his manners been flattering to Isabella's sister, but they were only those of a calmly kind brother and friend, without praise and without blindness, but hardly any degree of personal compliment could have made her regardless of that greatest fault of all in her eyes which he sometimes fell into, the want of respectful forbearance towards her father. There he had not always the patience that could have been wished. Mr. Woodhouse's peculiarities and fidgetiness were sometimes provoking him to a rational remonstrance or sharp retort equally ill-bestowed. It did not often happen, for Mr. John Knightley had really a great regard for his father-in-law, and generally a strong sense of what was due to him. But it was too often for Emma's charity, especially as there was all the pain of apprehension frequently to be endured, though the offence came not. The beginning, however, of every visit displayed none but the properest feelings, and this being of necessity so short, might be hoped to pass away in unsullied cordiality. They had not been long seated and composed, when Mr. Woodhouse, with a melancholy shake of the head and a sigh, called his daughter's attention to the sad change at Hartfield, since she had been there last. "'Ah, my dear,' said he, "'poor Miss Taylor! It is a grievous business.' "'Oh, yes, sir!' cried she, with ready sympathy. "'How you must miss her! And dear Emma, too! What a dreadful loss to you both! I have been so grieved for you! I could not imagine how you could possibly do without her. It is a sad change, indeed. But I hope she is pretty well, sir.' "'Pretty well, my dear. I hope pretty well. I do not know but that the place agrees with her tolerably.' Mr. John Knightley here asked Emma quietly whether there were any doubts of the air at Randall's. Oh, no, none in the least. I never saw Mrs. Weston better in my life, never looking so well. Papa is only speaking his own regret." "'Very much to the honour of both,' was the handsome reply. "'And do you see her, sir, tolerably often?' asked Isabella, in the plaintive tone which just suited her father. Mr. Woodhouse hesitated. "'Not near so often, my dear, as I could wish.' Oh, papa, we have missed seeing them but one entire day since they married. Either in the morning or evening of every day, excepting one, have we seen either Mr. Weston or Mrs. Weston, and generally both, either at Randall's or here. And as you may suppose, Isabella, most frequently here. They are very, very kind in their visits. Mr. Weston is really as kind as herself. Papa, if you speak in that melancholy way, you will be giving Isabella a false idea of us all. Everybody must be aware that Miss Taylor must be missed, but everybody ought to be assured that Mr. and Mrs. Weston do really prevent our missing her by any means to the extent we ourselves anticipated, which is the exact truth." "'Just as it should be,' said Mr. John Knightley, "'and just as I hoped it was from your letters. Her wish of showing you attention could not be doubted, and his being a disengaged and social man makes it all easy. I have been always telling you, my love, that I had no idea of the change being so very material to Hartfield as you apprehended. And now you have Emma's account, I hope you will be satisfied." "'Why, to be sure,' said Mr. Woodhouse, "'yes, certainly. I cannot deny that Mrs. Weston—poor Mrs. Weston—does come and see us pretty often. But then, she is always obliged to go away again." "'It would be very hard upon Mr. Weston if she did not, papa. You quite forget poor Mr. Weston." "'I think, indeed,' said John Knightley, pleasantly, "'that Mr. Weston has some little claim. You and I, Emma, will venture to take the part of the poor husband. I, being a husband, and you not being a wife, the claims of the man may very likely strike us with equal force. As for Isabella, she has been married long enough to see the convenience of putting all the Mr. Westons aside as much as she can." "'Me, my love,' cried his wife, hearing and understanding only in part. Are you talking about me? I am sure nobody ought to be or can be a greater advocate for matrimony than I am. 
and if it had not been for the misery of her leaving Hartfield, I should never have thought of Miss Taylor, but as the most fortunate woman in the world. And as to slighting Mr. Weston, that excellent Mr. Weston, I think there is nothing he does not deserve. I believe he is one of the very best-tempered men that ever existed. Excepting yourself and your brother, I do not know his equal for temper. I shall never forget his flying Henry's kite for him that very windy day last Easter, and ever since his particular kindness last September twelvemonth in writing that note, at twelve o'clock at night, on purpose to assure me that there was no scarlet fever at Cobham, I have been convinced there could not be a more feeling heart, nor a better man in existence. If anybody can deserve him, it must be Miss Taylor." "'Where is the young man?' said John Knightley. "'Has he been here on this occasion, or has he not?' "'He has not been here yet,' replied Emma. "'There was a strong expectation of his coming soon after the marriage, but it ended in nothing, and I have not heard him mentioned lately.' "'But you should tell them of the letter, my dear,' said her father. "'He wrote a letter to poor Mrs. Weston to congratulate her, and a very proper, handsome letter it was. She showed it to me. I thought it very well done of him, indeed. Whether it was his own idea, you know, one cannot tell. He is but young, and his uncle, perhaps.' "'My dear papa, he is three-and-twenty. You forget how time passes.' Three-and-twenty? Is he indeed? Well, I could not have thought it. And he was but two years old when he lost his poor mother. Well, time does fly indeed, and my memory is very bad. However, it was an exceeding good, pretty letter, and gave Mr. and Mrs. Weston a great deal of pleasure. I remember it was written from Weymouth, and dated September 28th, and began, My dear Madam, but I forget how it went on, and it was signed F. C. Weston Churchill. I remember that perfectly. How very pleasing and proper of him! cried the good-hearted Mrs. John Knightley. I have no doubt of his being a most amiable young man. But how sad it is that he should not live at home with his father! There is something so shocking in a child's being taken away from his parents and natural home. I never could comprehend how Mr. Weston could part with him. To give up one's child, I really never could think well of anybody who proposed such a thing to anybody else." "'Nobody ever did think well of the Churchills, I fancy,' observed Mr. John Knightley coolly. "'But you need not imagine Mr. Weston to have felt what you would feel in giving up Henry or John. Mr. Weston is rather an easy, cheerful-tempered man than a man of strong feelings. He takes things as he finds them, and makes enjoyment of them somehow or other, depending, I suspect, much more upon what is called society for his comforts, that is, upon the power of eating and drinking, and playing whist with his neighbours five times a week, than upon family affection or anything that home affords." Emma could not like what bordered on a reflection on Mr. Weston, and had half a mind to take it up, but she struggled and let it pass. She would keep the peace, if possible and there was something honourable and valuable in the strong domestic habits, the all-sufficiency of home to himself, whence resulted her brother's disposition to look down on the common rate of social intercourse, and those to whom it was important. It had a high claim to forbearance. End of chapter 11this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Emma by Jane Austen. Volume 1, Chapter 12. Mr. Knightley was to dine with them, rather against the inclination of Mr. Woodhouse, who did not like that any one should share with him in Isabella's first day. Emma's sense of right, however, had decided it and besides the consideration of what was due to each brother, she had particular pleasure, from the circumstance of the late disagreement between Mr. Knightley and herself, in procuring him the proper invitation. She hoped they might now become friends again. She thought it was time to make up. Making up, indeed, would not do. She certainly had not been in the wrong, and he would never own that he had. Concession must be out of the question, but it was time to appear to forget that they had ever quarrelled and she hoped it might rather assist the restoration of friendship, that when he came into the room she had one of the children with her, the youngest, a nice little girl about eight months old, who was now making her first visit to Hartfield, and very happy to be danced about in her aunt's arms. It did assist, for though he began with grave looks and short questions, he was soon led on to talk of them all in the usual way, and to take the child out of her arms with all the unceremoniousness of perfect amity. 
Emma felt they were friends again, and the conviction giving her at first great satisfaction, and then a little sauciness, she could not help saying, as he was admiring the baby, "'What a comfort it is that we think alike about our nephews and nieces! As to men and women, our opinions are sometimes very different, but with regard to these children, I observe we never disagree. If you are as much guided by nature in your estimate of men and women, and as little under the power of fancy and whim in your dealings with them, as you are where these children are concerned, we might always think alike." "'Oh, to be sure! Our discordancies must always arise from my being in the wrong." Yes said he, smiling. And reason good. I was sixteen years old when you were born." "'A material difference, then,' she replied. And no doubt you were much my superior in judgment at that period of our lives. But does not the lapse of one and twenty years bring our understandings a good deal nearer?" "'Yes, a good deal nearer." "'But still not near enough to give me a chance of being right, if we think differently." I have still the advantage of you by sixteen years' experience, and by not being a pretty young woman and a spoiled child. Come, my dear Emma, let us be friends and say no more about it. Tell your aunt, little Emma, that she ought to set you a better example than to be renewing old grievances, and that if she were not wrong before, she is now." "'That's true,' she cried. "'Very true. Little Emma, grow up a better woman than your aunt. Be infinitely cleverer, and not half so conceited. Now, Mr. Knightley, a word or two more, and I have done. As far as good intentions went, we were both right, and I must say that no effects on my side of the argument have yet proved wrong. I only want to know that Mr. Martin is not very, very bitterly disappointed." "'A man cannot be more so,' was his short, full answer. "'Ah! Indeed, I am very sorry. Come. Shake hands with me." This had just taken place, and with great cordiality, when John Knightley made his appearance, and, "'How do you do, George?' and, "'John, how are you?' succeeded in the true English style, burying under a calmness that seemed all but indifference, the real attachment which would have led either of them, if requisite, to do everything for the good of the other. The evening was quiet and conversable, as Mr. Woodhouse declined cards entirely for the sake of comfortable talk with his dear Isabella, and the little party made two natural divisions. On one side he and his daughter, on the other the two Mr. Knightleys, their subjects totally distinct, or very rarely mixing, and Emma only occasionally joining in one or the other. The brothers talked of their own concerns and pursuits, but principally of those of the elder, whose temper was by much the most communicative, and who was always the greater talker. As a magistrate, he had generally some point of law to consult John about, or at least some curious anecdote to give, and as a farmer, as keeping in hand the home farm at Donwell, he had to tell what every field was to bear next year, and to give all such local information as could not fail of being interesting, to a brother whose home it had equally been the longest part of his life, and whose attachments were strong the plan of a drain, the change of a fence, the felling of a tree, and the destination of every acre for wheat, turnips, or spring corn, was entered into with as much equality of interest by John, as his cooler manners rendered possible. And if his willing brother ever left him anything to inquire about, his inquiries even approached a tone of eagerness. While they were thus comfortably occupied, Mr. Woodhouse was enjoying a full flow of happy regrets and fearful affection with his daughter. "'My poor dear Isabella,' said he, fondly taking her hand, and interrupting for a few moments her busy labours for some one of her five children. "'How long it is! How terribly long since you were here! And how tired you must be after your journey! You must go to bed early, my dear, and I recommend a little gruel to you before you go. You and I will have a nice basin of gruel together. My dear Emma, suppose we all have a little gruel." Emma could not suppose any such thing, knowing as she did that both the Mr. Knightleys were as unpersuadable on that article as herself, and two basins only were ordered. After a little more discourse and praise of gruel, with some wondering at its not being taken every evening by everybody, he proceeded to say, with an air of grave reflection, 
It was an awkward business, my dear, your spending the autumn at South End instead of coming here. I never had much opinion of the sea air." "'Mr. Wingfield most strenuously recommended it, sir, or we should not have gone. He recommended it for all the children, but particularly for the weakness in little Bella's throat, both sea air and bathing." "'Ah, my dear, but Perry had many doubts about the sea doing her any good. And as to myself, I have been long perfectly convinced, though perhaps I never told you so before, that the sea is very rarely of use to anybody. I am sure it almost killed me once." "'Come, come!' cried Emma, feeling this to be an unsafe subject. I must beg you not to talk of the sea. It makes me envious and miserable, I who have never seen it. South End is prohibited, if you please. My dear Isabella, I have not heard you make one inquiry about Mr. Perry yet, and he never forgets you." "'Oh! Good Mr. Perry! How is he, sir?' "'Why, pretty well. But not quite well. Poor Perry is bilious, and he has not time to take care of himself. He tells me he has not time to take care of himself, which is very sad. But he is always wanted all round the country. I suppose there is not a man in such practice anywhere. But then there is not so clever a man anywhere." "'And Mrs. Perry and the children, how are they? Do the children grow? I have a great regard for Mr. Perry. I hope he will be calling soon. He will be so pleased to see my little ones." "'I hope he will be here to-morrow, for I have a question or two to ask him about myself of some consequence. And, my dear, whenever he comes, you had better let him look at little Bella's throat." Oh, my dear sir, her throat is so much better that I have hardly any uneasiness about it. Either bathing has been of the greatest service to her, or else it is to be attributed to an excellent embrocation of Mr. Wingfield's, which we have been applying at times ever since August." It is not very likely, my dear, that bathing should have been of use to her. And if I had known you were wanting an embrocation, I would have spoken to—" "'You seem to me to have forgotten Mrs. and Miss Bates,' said Emma. I have not heard one inquiry after them." "'Oh, the good Bateses! I am quite ashamed of myself. But you mention them in most of your letters. I hope they are quite well. Good old Mrs. Bates! I will call upon her to-morrow, and take my children. They are always so pleased to see my children. And that excellent Miss Bates! Such thorough worthy people! How are they, sir?" "'Why, pretty well, my dear, upon the whole. But poor Mrs. Bates had a bad cold about a month ago." "'How sorry I am! But colds were never so prevalent as they have been this autumn. Mr. Wingfield told me that he has never known them more general or heavy, except when it has been quite an influenza." "'That has been a good deal the case, my dear, but not to the degree you mention. Perry says that colds have been very general, but not so heavy as he has very often known them in November. Perry does not call it altogether a sickly season." "'No, I do not know that Mr. Wingfield considers it very sickly except—' "'Ah, my poor dear child! The truth is, that in London it is always a sickly season. Nobody is healthy in London. Nobody can be. It is a dreadful thing to have you forced to live there. So far off, and the air so bad." "'No, indeed. We are not at all in a bad air. Our part of London is very superior to most others. You must not confound us with London in general, my dear sir. The neighbourhood of Brunswick Square is very different from almost all the rest. We are so very airy. I should be unwilling, I own, to live in any other part of the town. There is hardly any other that I could be so satisfied to have my children in. But we are so remarkably airy. Mr. Wingfield thinks the vicinity of Brunswick Square decidedly the most favourable as to air. Oh, my dear, it is not like Hartfield. You make the best of it, but after you have been a week at Hartfield, you are all of you different creatures. You do not look the same. Now I cannot say that I think you are any of you looking well at present." I am sorry to hear you say so, sir. But I assure you, excepting those little nervous headaches and palpitations which I am never entirely free from anywhere, I am quite well myself. And if the children were rather pale before they went to bed, it was only because they were a little more tired than usual from their journey and the happiness of coming. I hope you will think better of their looks to-morrow, for I assure you Mr. Wingfield told me 
that he did not believe he had ever sent us off altogether in such good case. I trust at least that you do not think Mr. Knightley looking ill," turning her eyes with affectionate anxiety towards her husband. "'Middling, my dear, I cannot compliment you. I think Mr. John Knightley very far from looking well." "'What is the matter, sir? Did you speak to me?' cried Mr. John Knightley, hearing his own name. "'I am sorry to find, my love, that my father does not think you looking well, but I hope it is only from being a little fatigued. I could have wished, however, as you know, that you had seen Mr. Wingfield before you left home." "'My dear Isabella,' exclaimed he hastily, "'pray do not concern yourself about my looks. Be satisfied with doctoring and coddling yourself and the children, and let me look as I choose.' "'I did not thoroughly understand what you were telling your brother,' cried Emma, "'about your friend Mr. Graham's intending to have a bailiff from Scotland to look after his new estate. What will it answer? Will not the old prejudice be too strong?' and she talked in this way so long and successfully that, when forced to give her attention again to her father and sister, she had nothing worse to hear than Isabella's kind inquiry after Jane Fairfax. And Jane Fairfax, though no great favoured with her in general, she was at that moment very happy to assist in praising. "'That sweet, amiable Jane Fairfax,' said Mrs. John Knightley. "'It is so long since I have seen her, except now and then for a moment accidentally in town. What happiness it must be to her good old grandmother and excellent aunt, when she comes to visit them! I always regret excessively on dear Emma's account that she cannot be more at Highbury. But now their daughter is married, I suppose Colonel and Mrs. Campbell will not be able to part with her at all. She would be such a delightful companion for Emma." Mr. Woodhouse agreed to it all, but added, "'Our little friend Harriet Smith, however, is just such another kind of pretty young person. You will like Harriet. Emma could not have a better companion than Harriet." "'I am most happy to hear it. But only Jane Fairfax one knows to be so very accomplished and superior, and exactly Emma's age." This topic was discussed very happily, and others succeeded of similar moment, and passed away with similar harmony, but the evening did not close without a little return of agitation. The gruel came, and supplied a great deal to be said, much praise and many comments, undoubting decision of its wholesomeness for every constitution, and pretty severe philippics upon the many houses where it was never met with tolerable. But unfortunately, among the failures which the daughter had to instance, the most recent, and therefore most prominent, was in her own cook at South End, a young woman hired for the time, who had never been able to understand what she meant by a basin of nice smooth gruel, thin, but not too thin. Often as she had wished for and ordered it, she had never been able to get anything tolerable. Here was a dangerous opening. Ah said Mr. Woodhouse, shaking his head and fixing his eyes on her with tender concern. The ejaculation in Emma's ear expressed, "'Ah! there is no end of the sad consequences of your going to South End. It does not bear talking of.' And for a little while she hoped he would not talk of it, and that a silent rumination might suffice to restore him to the relish of his own smooth gruel. After an interval of some minutes, however, he began with, I shall always be very sorry that you went to the sea this autumn, instead of coming here." "'But why should you be sorry, sir? I assure you, it did the children a great deal of good." "'And, moreover, if you must go to the sea, it had better not have been to South End. South End is a very unhealthy place. Parry was surprised to hear you had fixed upon South End." "'I know there is such an idea with many people. But, indeed, it is quite a mistake, sir. We all had our health perfectly well there, never found the least inconvenience from the mud, and Mr. Wingfield says it is entirely a mistake to suppose the place unhealthy, and I am sure he may be depended upon, for he thoroughly understands the nature of the air, and his own brother and family have been there repeatedly." "'You should have gone to Cromer, my dear, if you went anywhere. Perry was a week at Cromer once, and he holds it to be the best of all the sea-bathing places. A fine open sea, he says, and very pure air. By what I understand, you might have had lodgings there quite away from the sea, a quarter of a mile off, very comfortable. You should have consulted Perry." "'But, my dear sir, the difference of the journey! Only consider how great it would have been! An hundred miles, perhaps, instead of forty. "'Ah, my dear, as Perry says, where health is at stake, nothing else should be considered 
and if one is to travel there is not much to choose between forty miles and an hundred. Better not move at all, better stay in London altogether than travel forty miles to get into a worse air. That is just what Perry said. It seemed to him a very ill-judged measure." Emma's attempts to stop her father had been vain, and when he had reached such a point as this, she could not wonder at her brother-in-law's breaking out. "'Mr. Perry,' said he, in a voice of very strong displeasure, "'would do as well to keep his opinion till it is asked for. What does he make it any of his business to wonder at what I do, at my taking my family to one part of the coast or another? I may be allowed, I hope, the use of my judgment as well as Mr. Perry. I want his directions no more than his drugs." He paused, and growing cooler in a moment, added, with only sarcastic dryness, "'If Mr. Perry can tell me how to convey a wife and five children a distance of an hundred and thirty miles, with no greater expense or inconvenience than a distance of forty, I should be as willing to prefer Cromer to Southend as he could himself." "'True, true,' cried Mr. Knightley, with most ready interposition. "'Very true. That's a consideration indeed. But, John, as to what I was telling you of my idea of moving the path to Langham, of turning it more to the right, that it may not cut through the home meadows, I cannot conceive any difficulty. I should not attempt it, if it were to be the means of inconvenience to the Highbury people, but if you call to mind exactly the present line of the path. The only way of proving it, however, will be to turn to our maps. I shall see you at the Abbey to-morrow morning, I hope, and then we will look them over, and you shall give me your opinion." Mr. Woodhouse was rather agitated by such harsh reflections on his friend Perry, to whom he had, in fact, though unconsciously, been attributing many of his own feelings and expressions. But the soothing attentions of his daughters gradually removed the present evil, and the immediate alertness of one brother, and better recollections of the other, prevented any renewal of it. End of chapter 12《Volume One, Chapter Thirteen of Emma. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Emma, by Jane Austen, Volume One, Chapter Thirteen. There could hardly be a happier creature in the world than Mrs. John Knightley in this short visit to Hartfield, going about every morning among her old acquaintance with her five children, and talking over what she had done every evening with her father and sister. She had nothing to wish otherwise, but that the days did not pass so swiftly. It was a delightful visit, perfect in being much too short. In general their evenings were less engaged with friends than their mornings, but one complete dinner engagement, and out of the house too, there was no avoiding, though at Christmas. Mr. Weston would take no denial. They must all dine at Randall's one day. Even Mr. Woodhouse was persuaded to think it a possible thing in preference to a division of the party. How they were all to be conveyed, he would have made a difficulty if he could, but as his son and daughter's carriage and horses were actually at Hartfield, he was not able to make more than a simple question on that head. It hardly amounted to a doubt, nor did it occupy Emma long to convince him that they might in one of the carriages find room for Harriet also. Harriet, Mr. Elton, and Mr. Knightley, their own especial set, were the only persons invited to meet them. The hours were to be early, as well as the numbers few. Mr. Woodhouse's habits and inclination being consulted in everything. The evening before this great event—for it was a very great event that Mr. Woodhouse should dine out, on the twenty-fourth of December—had been spent by Harriet at Hartfield, and she had gone home so much indisposed with the cold, that, but for her own earnest wish of being nursed by Mrs. Goddard, Emma could not have allowed her to leave the house. Emma called on her the next day, and found her doom already signed with regard to Randall's. She was very feverish, and had a bad sore throat. Mrs. Goddard was full of care and affection. Mr. Perry was talked of, and Harriet herself was too ill and low to resist the authority which excluded her from this delightful engagement, though she could not speak of her loss without many tears. Emma sat with her as long as she could, to attend her in Mrs. Goddard's unavoidable absences, and raise her spirits by representing how much Mr. Elton's would be depressed when he knew her state and left her at last tolerably comfortable, in the sweet dependence of his having a most comfortless visit, and of their all missing her very much. She had not advanced many yards from Mrs. Goddard's door, when she was met by Mr. Elton himself, evidently coming towards it, and as they walked on slowly together in conversation about the invalid, of whom he, on the rumour of considerable illness, had been going to inquire, that he might carry some report of her to Hartfield, 
they were overtaken by Mr. John Knightley returning from the daily visit to Donwell, with his two eldest boys, whose healthy, glowing faces showed all the benefit of country run, and seemed to ensure a quick dispatch of the roast mutton and rice pudding they were hastening home for. They joined company and proceeded together. Emma was just describing the nature of her friend's complaint. A throat very much inflamed, with a great deal of heat about her, a quick low pulse, etc., and she was sorry to find from Mrs. Goddard that Harriet was liable to very bad sore throats, and had often alarmed her with them. Mr. Elton looked all alarm on the occasion, as he exclaimed, "'A sore throat! I hope not infectious! I hope not of a putrid infectious sort! Has Perry seen her? Indeed, you should take care of yourself as well as of your friend. Let me entreat you to run no risks. Why does not Perry see her?' Emma, who was not at all frightened herself, tranquillized the success of apprehension by assurances of Mrs. Goddard's experience and care. But as there must still remain a degree of uneasiness which she could not wish to reason away, which she would rather feed and assist than not, she added soon afterwards, as if quite another subject, "'It is so cold, so very cold, and looks and feels so very much like snow, that if it were to any other place or with any other party, I should really try not to go out to-day and dissuade my father from venturing. But as he has made up his mind, and does not seem to feel the cold himself, I do not like to interfere, as I know it would be so great a disappointment to Mr. and Mrs. Weston. But upon my word, Mr. Elton, in your case I should certainly excuse myself. You appear to me a little hoarse already, and when you consider what demand of voice and what fatigues to-morrow will bring, I think it would be no more than common prudence to stay at home and take care of yourself to-night. Mr. Elton looked as if he did not very well know what answer to make, which was exactly the case. For though very much gratified by the kind care of such a fair lady, and not liking to resist any advice of hers, he had not really the least inclination to give up the visit. But Emma, too eager and busy in her own previous conceptions and views to hear him impartially, or see him with clear vision, was very well satisfied with his muttering acknowledgment of its being, "'Very cold, certainly very cold!' and walked on, rejoicing in having extricated him from Randall's, and secured him the power of sending to inquire after Harriet every hour of the evening. "'You do quite right,' said she. "'We will make your apologies to Mr. and Mrs. Weston.' But hardly had she so spoken, when she found her brother was civilly offering a seat in his carriage, if the weather were Mr. Elton's only objection, and Mr. Elton actually accepting the offer with much prompt satisfaction. It was a done thing. Mr. Elton was to go, and never had his broad, handsome face expressed more pleasure than at this moment. Never had his smile been stronger, nor his eyes more exulting than when he next looked at her. "'Well,' said she to herself, "'this is most strange. After I had got him off so well to choose to go into company, and leave Harriet ill behind. Most strange, indeed. But there is, I believe, in many men, especially single men, such an inclination, such a passion for dining out. A dinner engagement is so high in the class of their pleasures, their employments, their dignities, almost their duties, that anything gives way to it. And this must be the case with Mr. Elton. A most valuable, amiable, pleasing young man, undoubtedly, and very much in love with Harriet. But still he cannot refuse an invitation. He must dine out whenever he is asked. What a strange thing love is! He can see ready wit in Harriet but will not dine alone for her." Soon afterwards Mr. Elton quitted them, and she could not but do him the justice of feeling that there was a great deal of sentiment in his manner of naming Harriet at parting, in the tone of his voice while assuring her that he should call at Mrs. Goddard's for news of her fair friend, the last thing before he prepared for the happiness of meeting her again, when he hoped to be able to give a better report, and he sighed and smiled himself off in a way that left the balance of approbation much in his favour. After a few minutes of entire silence between them, John Knightley began with, "'I never in my life saw a man more intent on being agreeable than Mr. Elton. It is downright labour to him where ladies are concerned. With men he can be rational and unaffected, but when he has ladies to please, every feature works.' "'Mr. Elton's manners are not perfect,' replied Emma. "'But where there is a wish to please, one ought to overlook, and one does overlook a great deal.' Where a man does his best with only moderate powers, he will have the advantage over negligent superiority. There is such perfect good temper and good will in Mr. Elton, as one cannot but value." "'Yes,' 
said Mr. John Knightley presently, with some slyness. He seems to have a great deal of good will towards you." Me? she replied with a smile of astonishment. Are you imagining me to be Mr. Elton's object? Such an imagination has crossed me, I own, Emma, and if it never occurred to you before, you may as well take it into consideration now. Mr. Elton in love with me! What an idea! I do not say it is so, but you will do well to consider whether it is or not, and to regulate your behaviour accordingly. I think your manners to him encouraging. I speak as a friend, Emma. You had better look about you, and ascertain what you do, and what you mean to do." "'I thank you. But I assure you, you are quite mistaken. Mr. Elton and I are very good friends, and nothing more." And she walked on, amusing herself in the consideration of the blunders which often arise from a partial knowledge of circumstances, of the mistakes which people of high pretensions to judgment are for ever falling into, and not very well pleased with her brother for imagining her blind and ignorant and in want of counsel. He said no more. Mr. Woodhouse had so completely made up his mind to the visit, that in spite of the increasing coldness, he seemed to have no idea of shrinking from it, and set forward at last most punctually with his eldest daughter in his own carriage, with less apparent consciousness of the weather than either of the others, too full of the wonder of his own going, and the pleasure it was to afford at Randall's to see that it was cold, and too well wrapped up to feel it. The cold, however, was severe and by the time the second carriage was in motion, a few flakes of snow were finding their way down, and the sky had the appearance of being so overcharged as to want only a milder air to produce a very white world in a very short time. Emma soon saw that her companion was not in the happiest humour. The preparing and the going abroad in such weather, with the sacrifice of his children after dinner, were evils, were disagreeables at least, which Mr. John Knightley did not by any means like. He anticipated nothing in the visit that could be at all worth the purchase, and the whole of their drive to the vicarage was spent by him in expressing his discontent. "'A man,' said he, "'must have a very good opinion of himself when he asks people to leave their own fireside, and encounter such a day as this for the sake of coming to see him. He must think himself a most agreeable fellow. I could not do such a thing. It is the greatest absurdity, actually snowing at this moment, the folly of not allowing people to be comfortable at home and the folly of people's not staying comfortably at home, and they can. If we were obliged to go out such an evening as this, by any call of duty or business, what a hardship we should deem it! And here we are, probably with rather thinner clothing than usual, setting forward voluntarily, without excuse, in defiance of the voice of nature, which tells man, in everything given to his view or his feelings, to stay at home himself, and keep all under shelter that he can. Here we are, setting forward to spend five dull hours in another man's house, with nothing to say or to hear that was not said and heard yesterday, and may not be said and heard again to-morrow. Going in dismal weather to return probably in worse, four horses and four servants taken out for nothing but to convey five idle, shivering creatures into colder rooms, and worse company than they might have had at home." Emma did not find herself equal to give the pleased assent, which no doubt he was in the habit of receiving, to emulate the, "'Very true, my love,' which must have been usually administered by his travelling companion, but she had resolution enough to refrain from making any answer at all. She could not be complying, she dreaded being quarrelsome, her heroism reached only to silence. She allowed him to talk and arrange the glasses, and wrapped herself up without opening her lips. They arrived, the carriage turned, the step was let down, and Mr. Elton, spruce, black, and smiling, was with them instantly. Emma thought with pleasure of some change of subject. Mr. Elton was all obligation and cheerfulness. He was so very cheerful in his civilities, indeed, that she began to think he must have received a different account of Harriet from what had reached her. She had sent while dressing, and the answer had been, much the same, not better. "'My report for Mrs. Goddard's,' said she presently was not so pleasant as I had hoped. Not better was my answer." His face lengthened immediately, and his voice was the voice of sentiment as he answered. "'No, no! I am grieved to find. I was on the point of telling you that when I had called at Mrs. Goddard's door, which I did the very last thing before I turned to dress, I was told that Miss Smith was not better, by no means better, rather worse, very much grieved and concerned. I had flattered myself that she must be better after such a cordial as I knew she had been given in the morning." Emma smiled and answered, "'My visit was of use to the nervous part of her complaint, I hope. 
when not even I can charm away a sore throat, it is a most severe cold indeed. Mr. Perry has been with her, as you probably heard." "'Yes, I imagined—that uh, is, I did not. He has been used to her in these complaints, and I hope to-morrow morning will bring us both a more comfortable report. But it is impossible not to feel uneasiness. Such a sad loss to our party to-day." "'Dreadful! Exactly so, indeed. She will be missed at every moment." This was very proper. The sigh which accompanied it was really estimable. But it should have lasted longer. Emma was rather in dismay when only half a minute afterwards he began to speak of other things, and in a voice of the greatest alacrity and enjoyment. "'What an excellent device,' said he, "'the use of a sheepskin for carriages! How very comfortable they make it! Impossible to feel cold with such precautions! The contrivances of modern days indeed have rendered a gentleman's carriage perfectly complete. One is so fenced and guarded from the weather, that not a breath of air can find its way unpermitted. Weather becomes absolutely of no consequence. It is a very cold afternoon, but in this carriage we know nothing of the matter. Ah! snows a little, I see." "'Yes,' said John Knightley. "'And I think we shall have a good deal of it.' "'Christmas weather,' observed Mr. Elton. Quite seasonable, and extremely fortunate we may think ourselves that it did not begin yesterday, and prevent this day's party, which it might very possibly have done, for Mr. Woodhouse would hardly have ventured had there been much snow in the ground. But now it is of no consequence. This is quite the season indeed for friendly meetings. At Christmas everybody invites their friends about them, and people think little of even the worst weather. I was snowed up at a friend's house once for a week. Nothing could be pleasanter. I went for only one night and could not get away till that very day sennight." Mr. John Knightley looked as if he did not comprehend the pleasure, but only said, coolly, "'I cannot wish to be snowed up a week at Randall's." At another time Emma might have been amused, but she was too much astonished now at Mr. Elton's spirits for other feelings. Harriet seemed quite forgotten in the expectation of a pleasant party. "'We are sure of excellent fires,' continued he, "'and everything in the greatest comfort. Charming people, Mr. and Mrs. Weston! Mrs. Weston, indeed, is much beyond praise, and he is exactly what one values, so hospitable, and so fond of society. It will be a small party, but where small parties are select, they are perhaps the most agreeable of any. Mr. Weston's dining-room does not accommodate more than ten comfortably, and for my part I would rather, under such circumstances, fall short by two than exceed by two. I think you will agree with me." turning with a soft air to Emma. "'I think I shall certainly have your approbation, though Mr. Knightley, perhaps, from being used to the large parties of London, may not quite enter into our feelings.' "'I know nothing of the large parties of London, sir. I never dine with anybody.' "'Indeed!' in a tone of wonder and pity. "'I had no idea that the law had been so great a slavery. Well, sir, the time must come when you will be paid for all this, when you will have a little labour and great enjoyment.' My first enjoyment," replied John Knightley, as they passed through the sweep-gate, will be to find myself safe at Hartfield again. End of chapter 13volume 1, chapter 14 of Emma. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Emma by Jane Austen, Volume One, Chapter Fourteen. Some change of countenance was necessary for each gentleman as they walked into Mrs. Weston's drawing room. Mr. Elton must compose his joyous looks, and Mr. John Knightley disperse his ill humour. Mr. Elton must smile less, and Mr. John Knightley more to fit them for the place. Emma only might be as nature prompted and show herself just as happy as she was. To her it was real enjoyment to be with the Westons. Mr. Weston was a great favourite, and there was not a creature in the world to whom she spoke with such unreserve as to his wife. Not any one to whom she related with such conviction of being listened to, and understood. Of being always interesting and always intelligible, the little affairs, arrangements, perplexities, and pleasures of her father and herself. She could tell nothing of Hartfield in which Mrs. Weston had not a lively concern, 
and half an hour's uninterrupted communication of all those little matters on which the daily happiness of private life depends, was one of the first gratifications of each. This was a pleasure which perhaps the whole day's visit might not afford, which certainly did not belong to the present half-hour. But the very sight of Mrs. Weston, her smile, her touch, her voice was grateful to Emma, and she determined to think as little as possible of Mr. Elton's oddities, or of anything else unpleasant, and enjoy all that was enjoyable to the utmost. The misfortune of Harriet's cold had been pretty well gone through before her arrival. Mr. Woodhouse had been safely seated long enough to give the history of it, besides all the history of his own and Isabella's coming, and of Emma's being to follow, and had indeed just got to the end of his satisfaction that James should come and see his daughter, when the others appeared, and Mrs. Weston, who had been almost wholly engrossed by her attentions to him, was able to turn away and welcome her dear Emma. Emma's project of forgetting Mr. Elton for a while made her rather sorry to find, when they had all taken their places, that he was close to her. The difficulty was great of driving his strange insensibility towards Harriet from her mind, while he not only sat at her elbow, but was continually obtruding his happy countenance on her notice, and solicitously addressing her upon every occasion. Instead of forgetting him, his behaviour was such that she could not avoid the internal suggestion of— can it really be as my brother imagined? Can it be possible for this man to be beginning to transfer his affections from Harriet to me? Absurd and insufferable! Yet he would be so anxious for her being perfectly warm, and would be so interested about her father, and so delighted with Mrs. Weston, and at last would begin admiring her drawings with so much zeal and so little knowledge, as seemed terribly like a would-be lover and made it some effort with her to preserve her good manners. For her own sake she could not be rude, and for Harriet's, in the hope that all would yet turn out right, she was even positively civil. But it was an effort, especially as something was going on amongst the others, in the most overpowering period of Mr. Elton's nonsense, which she particularly wished to listen to. She heard enough to know that Mr. Weston was giving some information about his son. She heard the words, "'My son,' and Frank, and my son, repeated several times over, and from a few other half-syllables very much suspected that he was announcing an early visit from his son. But before she could quiet Mr. Elton, the subject was so completely passed that any reviving question from her would have been awkward. Now it so happened that in spite of Emma's resolution of never marrying, there was something in the name, in the idea of Mr. Frank Churchill, which always interested her. She had frequently thought, especially since his father's marriage with Miss Taylor, that if she were to marry, he was the very person to suit her in age, character, and condition. He seemed, by this connection between the families, quite to belong to her. She could not but suppose it to be a match that everybody who knew them must think of. That Mr. and Mrs. Weston did think of it, she was very strongly persuaded, and though not meaning to be induced by him, or by anybody else, to give up a situation which she believed more replete with good than any she could change it for, she had a great curiosity to see him, a decided intention of finding him pleasant, of being liked by him to a certain degree, and a sort of pleasure in the idea of their being coupled in their friends' imaginations. With such sensations, Mr. Elton's civilities were dreadfully ill-timed. But she had the comfort of appearing very polite, while feeling very cross, and of thinking that the rest of the visit could not possibly pass, without bringing forward the same information again, or the substance of it, from the open-hearted Mr. Weston. So it proved. For when happily released from Mr. Elton, and seated by Mr. Weston at dinner, he made use of the very first interval in the cares of hospitality, the very first leisure from the saddle of mutton, to say to her, we want only two more to be just the right number. I should like to see two more here. Your pretty little friend, Miss Smith, and my son. And then I should say we were quite complete. I believe you did not hear me telling the others in the drawing-room that we are expecting Frank. I had a letter from him this morning, and he will be with us within a fortnight." Emma spoke with a very proper degree of pleasure, and fully assented to his proposition of Mr. Frank Churchill and Miss Smith making their party quite complete. He has been wanting to come to us," continued Mr. Weston, ever since September. Every letter has been full of it, but he cannot command his own time. 
He has those to please who must be pleased, and who, between ourselves, are sometimes to be pleased only by a good many sacrifices. But now I have no doubt of seeing him here about the second week in January. What a very great pleasure it will be to you! And Mrs. Weston is so anxious to be acquainted with him, that she must be almost as happy as yourself. Yes, she would be, but that she thinks there will be another put off. She does not depend upon his coming so much as I do. But she does not know the parties so well as I do. The case, you see, is—but this is quite between ourselves. I did not mention a syllable of it in the other room. There are secrets in all families, you know. The case is that a party of friends are invited to pay a visit at Enscombe in January, and that Frank's coming depends upon their being put off. If they are not put off, he cannot stir. But I know they will, because it is a family that a certain lady of some consequence at Enscombe has a particular dislike to. And though it is thought necessary to invite them once in two or three years, they always are put off when it comes to the point. I have not the smallest doubt of the issue. I am as confident of seeing Frank here before the middle of January, as I am of being here myself. But your good friend there," nodding towards the upper end of the table, "'has so few vagaries herself, and has been so little used to them at Hartfield, that she cannot calculate on their effects, as I have been long in the practice of doing." "'I am sorry there should be anything like doubt in the case,' replied Emma. But I am disposed to side with you, Mr. Weston. If you think he will come, I shall think so too for you know Enscombe." "'Yes, I have some right to that knowledge, though I have never been at the place in my life. She is an odd woman. But I never allow myself to speak ill of her, on Frank's account, for I do believe her to be very fond of him. I used to think she was not capable of being fond of anybody except herself, but she has always been kind to him, in her way, allowing for little whims and caprices, and expecting everything to be as she likes and it is no small credit, in my opinion, to him, that he should excite such an affection, for, though I would not say it to anybody else, she has no more heart than a stone to people in general, and the devil of a temper." Emma liked the subject so well, that she began upon it to Mrs. Weston, very soon after their moving into the drawing-room, wishing her joy, yet observing that she knew the first meeting must be rather alarming. Mrs. Weston agreed to it, but added that she should be very glad to be secure of undergoing the anxiety of a first meeting at the time talked of. For I cannot depend upon his coming. I cannot be so sanguine as Mr. Weston. I am very much afraid that it will all end in nothing. Mr. Weston, I dare say, has been telling you exactly how the matter stands." "'Yes. It seems to depend upon nothing but the ill-humour of Mrs. Churchill, which I imagine to be the most certain thing in the world." "'My Emma! replied Mrs. Weston, smiling. What is the certainty of caprice?" Then, turning to Isabella, who had not been attending before, "'You must know, my dear Mrs. Knightley, that we are by no means so sure of seeing Mr. Frank Churchill, in my opinion, as his father thinks. It depends entirely upon his aunt's spirits and pleasure—in short, upon her temper. To you, to my two daughters, I may venture on the truth. Mrs. Churchill rules at Enscombe, and is a very odd-tempered woman, and his coming now depends upon her being willing to spare him." "'Oh, Mrs. Churchill! Everybody knows Mrs. Churchill,' replied Isabella. "'And I am sure I never think of that poor young man without the greatest compassion. To be constantly living with an ill-tempered person must be dreadful. It is what we, happily, have never known anything of. But it must be a life of misery. What a blessing that she never had any children! Poor little creatures! How unhappy she would have made them!" Emma wished she had been alone with Mrs. Weston. She should then have heard more. Mrs. Weston would speak to her, with a degree of unreserve which she would not hazard with Isabella, and she really believed would scarcely try to conceal anything relative to the Churchills from her, excepting those views on the young man, of which her own imagination had already given her such instinctive knowledge. But at present there was nothing more to be said. Mr. Woodhouse very soon followed them into the drawing-room. To be sitting long after dinner was a confinement that he could not endure. Neither wine nor conversation was anything to him, and gladly did he move to those with whom he was always comfortable. While he talked to Isabella, however, Emma found an opportunity of saying, "'And so you do not consider this visit from your son as by any means certain? I am sorry for it. The introduction must be unpleasant whenever it takes place, and the sooner it could be over, the better." Yes, and every delay makes one more apprehensive of other delays. 
even if this family, the Braithwaites, are put off, I am still afraid that some excuse may be found for his disappointing us. I cannot bear to imagine any reluctance on his side, but I am sure there is a great wish on the Churchills to keep him to themselves. There is jealousy. They are jealous even of his regard for his father. In short, I can feel no dependence on his coming, and I wish Mr. Weston were less sanguine." "'He ought to come,' said Emma. "'If he could only stay a couple of days, he ought to come. And one can hardly conceive a young man's not having it in his power to do as much as that. A young woman, if she fall into bad hands, may be teased, and kept at a distance from those she wants to be with. But one cannot comprehend a young man's being under such restraint, as not to be able to spend a week with his father if he likes it." "'One ought to be at Enscombe, and know the ways of the family, before one decides upon what he can do,' replied Mrs. Weston. "'One ought to use the same caution, perhaps, in judging of the conduct of any one individual of any one family. But Enscombe, I believe, certainly must not be judged by general rules. She is so very unreasonable and everything gives way to her. But she is so fond of the nephew, he is so very great a favourite. Now, according to my idea of Mrs. Churchill, it would be most natural that while she makes no sacrifice for the comfort of the husband, to whom she owes everything, while she exercises incessant caprice towards him, she should frequently be governed by the nephew, to whom she owes nothing at all. My dearest Emma, do not pretend with your sweet temper to understand a bad one or to lay down rules for it, you must let it go its own way. I have no doubt of his having, at times, considerable influence, but it may be perfectly impossible for him to know beforehand when it will be." Emma listened, and then coolly said, "'I shall not be satisfied unless he comes.' "'He may have a great deal of influence on some points,' continued Mrs. Weston, "'and on others very little and among those on which she is beyond his reach, it is but too likely, may be, this very circumstance of his coming away from them to visit us. End of chapter 14 Volume 1, Chapter 15 of Emma. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Emma by Jane Austen. Volume One, Chapter Fifteen. Mr. Woodhouse was soon ready for his tea, and when he had drank his tea, he was quite ready to go home. And it was as much as his three companions could do to entertain away his notice of the lateness of the hour before the other gentlemen appeared. Mr. Weston was chatty and convivial, and no friend to early separations of any sort. But at last, the drawing room party did receive an augmentation. Mr. Elton, in very good spirits, was one of the first to walk in. Mrs. Weston and Emma were sitting together on a sofa. He joined them immediately, and with scarcely an invitation, seated himself between them. Emma, in good spirits, too, from the amusement afforded her mind by the expectation of Mr. Frank Churchill, was willing to forget his late improprieties, and be as well satisfied with him as before and on his making Harriet his first subject, was ready to listen with most friendly smiles. He professed himself extremely anxious about her fair friend, her fair, lovely, amiable friend. Did she know? Had she heard anything about her since their being at Randall's? He felt much anxiety. He must confess that the nature of her complaint alarmed him considerably. And in this style he talked on for some time very properly not much attending to any answer, but altogether sufficiently awake to the terror of a bad sore throat, and Emma was quite in charity with him. But at last there seemed a perverse turn. It seemed all at once as if he were more afraid of its being a bad sore throat on her account than on Harriet's, more anxious that she should escape the infection, than that there should be no infection in the complaint. He began with great earnestness to entreat her to refrain from visiting the sick chamber again for the present, to entreat her to promise him not to venture into any such hazard till he had seen Mr. Perry and learnt his opinion, and though she tried to laugh it off and bring the subject back into its proper course, there was no putting an end to his extreme solicitude about her. She was vexed. It did appear there was no concealing it, exactly like the pretence of being in love with her, instead of Harriet an inconstancy, if real, the most contemptible and abominable, and she had difficulty in behaving with temper. 
He turned to Mrs. Weston to implore her assistance. Would not she give him her support? Would not she add her persuasions to his, to induce Miss Woodhouse not to go to Mrs. Goddard's, till it was certain that Miss Smith's disorder had no infection? He could not be satisfied without a promise. Would not she give him her influence in procuring it? So scrupulous for others, he continued and yet so careless for herself. She wanted me to nurse my cold by staying at home to-day, and yet will not promise to avoid the danger of catching an ulcerated sore throat herself. Is this fair, Mrs. Weston? Judge between us. Have not I some right to complain? I am sure of your kind support and aid." Emma saw Mrs. Weston's surprise, and felt that it must be great at an address which, in words and manner, was assuming to himself the right of first interest in her. And as for herself, she was too much provoked and offended to have the power of directly saying anything to the purpose. She could only give him a look, but it was such a look as she thought must restore him to his senses, and then left the sofa, removing to a seat by her sister, and giving her all her attention. She had not time to know how Mr. Elton took the reproof, so rapidly did another subject succeed, for Mr. John Knightley now came into the room from examining the weather, and open on them all with the information of the ground being covered with snow, and of it still snowing fast, with a strong drifting wind, concluding with these words to Mr. Woodhouse. "'This will prove a spirited beginning of your winter engagement, sir. Something new for your coachmen and horses to be making their way through a storm of snow.' Poor Mr. Woodhouse was silent from consternation, but everybody else had something to say. Everybody was either surprised or not surprised, and had some question to ask, or some comfort to offer. Mrs. Weston and Emma tried earnestly to cheer him and turn his attention from his son-in-law, who was pursuing his triumph rather unfeelingly. "'I admired your resolution very much, sir,' said he, "'in venturing out in such weather, for of course you saw there would be snow very soon. Everybody must have seen the snow coming on. I admired your spirit, and I dare say we shall all get home very well. Another hour or two's snow can hardly make the road impassable. And we are two carriages. If one is blown over in the bleak part of the common field, there will be the other at hand. I dare say we shall all be safe at Hartfield before midnight." Mr. Weston, with triumph of a different sort, was confessing that he had known it to be snowing some time, but had not said a word lest it should make Mr. Woodhouse uncomfortable, and be an excuse for his hurrying away. As to there being any quantity of snow fallen or likely to fall to impede their return, that was a mere joke. He was afraid they would find no difficulty. He wished the road might be impassable, that he might be able to keep them all at Randall's, and with the utmost good will was sure that accommodation might be found for everybody, calling on his wife to agree with him, that with a little contrivance, everybody might be lodged, which she hardly knew how to do from the consciousness of there being but two spare rooms in the house. "'What is to be done, my dear Emma? What is to be done?' was Mr. Woodhouse's first exclamation, and all that he could say for some time. To her he looked for comfort, and her assurances of safety, her representation of the excellence of the horses and of James, and of their having so many friends about them, revived him a little. His eldest daughter's alarm was equal to his own. The horror of being blocked up at Randall's, while her children were at Hartfield, was full in her imagination, and fancying the road to be now just passable for adventurous people, but in a state that admitted no delay, she was eager to have it settled, that her father and Emma should remain at Randall's, while she and her husband set forward instantly through all the possible accumulations of drifted snow that might impede them. "'You had better order the carriage directly, my love,' said she. I dare say we shall be able to get along, if we set off directly, and if we do come to anything very bad, I can get out and walk. I am not at all afraid. I should not mind walking half the way. I could change my shoes, you know, the moment I got home, and it is not the sort of thing that gives me cold." "'Indeed,' replied he. "'Then, my dear Isabella, it is the most extraordinary sort of thing in the world, for in general everything does give you cold. Walk home. You are prettily shod for walking home, I dare say. It will be bad enough for the horses." Isabella turned to Mrs. Weston for her approbation of the plan. Mrs. Weston could only approve. Isabella then went to Emma, 
But Emma could not so entirely give up the hope of their all being able to get away, and they were still discussing the point, when Mr. Knightley, who had left the room immediately after his brother's first report of the snow, came back again and told them that he had been out of doors to examine, and could answer for there not being the smallest difficulty in their getting home whenever they liked it, either now or an hour hence. He had gone beyond the sweep, some way along the Highbury Road. The snow was nowhere above half an inch deep, in many places hardly enough to whiten the ground. A very few flakes were falling at present, but the clouds were parting, and there was every appearance of its being soon over. He had seen the coachman, and they both agreed with him in there being nothing to apprehend. To Isabella the relief of such tidings was very great, and they were scarcely less acceptable to Emma on her father's account, who was immediately set as much at ease on the subject as his nervous constitution allowed. But the alarm that had been raised could not be appeased so as to admit of any comfort for him while he continued at Randall's. He was satisfied of there being no present danger in returning home, but no assurances could convince him that it was safe to stay, and while the others were variously urging and recommending, Mr. Knightley and Emma settled it in a few brief sentences, thus. "'Your father will not be easy. Why do you not go?' "'I am ready, if the others are.' "'Shall I ring the bell?' "'Yes, do.' and the bell was rung, and the carriages spoken for. A few minutes more, and Emma hoped to see one troublesome companion deposited in his own house, to get sober and cool, and the other recover his temper and happiness when this visit of hardship were over. The carriage came, and Mr. Woodhouse, always the first object on such occasions, was carefully attended to his own by Mr. Knightley and Mr. Weston, but not all that either could say could prevent some renewal of alarm at the sight of the snow which had actually fallen, and the discovery of a much darker night than he had been prepared for. He was afraid they should have a very bad drive. He was afraid poor Isabella would not like it. And there would be poor Emma in the carriage behind. He did not know what they had best do. They must keep as much together as they could." And James was talked to, and given a charge to go very slow and wait for the other carriage. Isabella stepped in after her father. John Knightley, forgetting that he did not belong to their party, stepped in after his wife very naturally, so that Emma found, on being escorted and followed into the second carriage by Mr. Elton, that the door was to be lawfully shut on them, and that they were to have a tête-à-tête -tête drive. It would not have been the awkwardness of a moment, it would have been rather a pleasure, previous to the suspicion of this very day, she could have talked to him of Harriet, and the three-quarters of a mile would have seemed but one. But now she would rather it had not happened. She believed he had been drinking too much of Mr. Weston's good wine, and felt sure that he would want to be talking nonsense. To restrain him as much as might be, by her own manners, she was immediately preparing to speak with exquisite calmness and gravity of the weather and the night. But scarcely had she begun. Scarcely had they passed the sweep-gate and joined the other carriage, than she found her subject cut up, her hand seized, her attention demanded, and Mr. Elton actually making violent love to her, availing himself of the precious opportunity, declaring sentiments which must be already well known, hoping, fearing, adoring, ready to die if she refused him, but flattering himself that his ardent attachment and unequalled love and unexampled passion could not fail of having some effect, and in short, very much resolved on being seriously accepted as soon as possible. It really was so. Without scruple, without apology, without much apparent diffidence, Mr. Elton, the lover of Harriet, was professing himself her lover. She tried to stop him, but vainly. He would go on and say it all. Angry as she was, the thought of the moment made her resolve to restrain herself when she did speak. She felt that half this folly must be drunkenness, and therefore could hope it might only belong to the passing hour. Accordingly, with a mixture of the serious and the playful, which she hoped would best suit his half-and-half half state, she replied, "'I am very much astonished, Mr. Elton. This to me! You forget yourself. You take me for my friend. Any message to Miss Smith I shall be happy to deliver. But no more of this to me, if you please.' "'Miss Smith! Message to Miss Smith! What could she possibly mean?' and he repeated her words with such assurance of accent, such boastful pretense of amazement, that she could not help replying with quickness, "'Mr. Elton, this is the most extraordinary conduct, and I can account for it only in one way. You are not yourself, or you could not speak either to me or of Harriet in such a manner. 
Command yourself enough to say no more, and I will endeavour to forget it." But Mr. Elton had only drunk wine enough to elevate his spirits, not at all to confuse his intellects. He perfectly knew his own meaning, and having warmly protested against her suspicion as most injurious, and slightly touched upon his respect for Miss Smith as her friend, but acknowledging his wonder that Miss Smith should be mentioned at all, he resumed the subject of his own passion, and was very urgent for a favourable answer. As she thought less of his inebriety, she thought more of his inconstancy and presumption, and with fewer struggles for politeness replied, "'It is impossible for me to doubt any longer. You have made yourself too clear. Mr. Elton, my astonishment is much beyond anything I can express. After such behaviour as I have witnessed during the last month to Miss Smith, such attentions as I have been in the daily habit of observing, to be addressing me in this manner! This is an unsteadiness of character, indeed, which I had not supposed possible. Believe me, sir, I am far, very far, from gratified in being the object of such professions." "'Good heaven!' cried Mr. Elton. "'What can be the meaning of this? Miss Smith! I never thought of Miss Smith in the whole course of my existence. Never paid her any attentions, but as your friend. Never cared whether she were dead or alive, but as your friend. If she has fancied otherwise, her own wishes have misled her, and I am very sorry, extremely sorry. But Miss Smith, indeed! Oh, Miss Woodhouse! Who can think of Miss Smith when Miss Woodhouse is near? No, upon my honour, there is no unsteadiness of character. I have thought only of you. I protest against having paid the smallest attention to any one else. Everything that I have said or done for many weeks past has been with the sole view of marking my adoration of yourself. You cannot really seriously doubt it. No!" in an accent meant to be insinuating. I am sure you have seen and understood me. It would be impossible to say what Emma felt on hearing this, which of all her unpleasant sensations was uppermost. She was too completely overpowered to be immediately able to reply, and two moments of silence being ample encouragement for Mr. Elton's sanguine state of mind, he tried to take her hand again, as he joyously exclaimed, "'Charming, Miss Woodhouse! Allow me to interpret this interesting silence. It confesses that you have long understood me.' "'No, sir,' cried Emma, "'it confesses no such thing. So far from having long understood you, I have been in a most complete error with respect to your views till this moment. As to myself, I am very sorry that you should have been giving way to any feelings. Nothing could be farther from my wishes. Your attachment to my friend Harriet, your pursuit of her—pursuit, it appeared—gave me great pleasure, and I have been very earnestly wishing you success. But had I supposed that she were not your attraction to Hartfield, I should certainly have thought you judged ill in making your visits so frequent. Am I to believe that you have never sought to recommend yourself particularly to Miss Smith, that you have never thought seriously of her?" "'Never, madam,' cried he, affronted in his turn. "'Never, I assure you, I think seriously of Miss Smith. Miss Smith is a very good sort of girl, and I should be happy to see her respectably settled. I wish her extremely well, and no doubt there are men who might not object to— Everybody has their level, but as for myself, I am not, I think, quite so much at a loss. I need not so totally despair of an equal alliance as to be addressing myself to Miss Smith. No, madam, my visits to Hartfield have been for yourself only, and the encouragement I received. Encouragement! I give you encouragement! Sir, you have been entirely mistaken in supposing it. I have seen you only as the admirer of my friend. In no other light could you have been more to me than a common acquaintance. I am exceedingly sorry, but it is well that the mistake ends where it does. Had the same behaviour continued, Miss Smith might have been led into a misconception of your views. Not being aware, probably, any more than myself, of the very great inequality which you are so sensible of. But as it is, the disappointment is single, and I trust will not be lasting. I have no thoughts of matrimony at present. He was too angry to say another word, her manner too decided to invite supplication, and in this state of swelling resentment and mutually deep mortification, they had to continue together a few minutes longer, for the fears of Mr. Woodhouse had confined them to a foot-pace. If there had not been so much anger, there would have been desperate awkwardness, but their straightforward emotions left no room for the little zigzags of embarrassment. 
Without knowing when the carriage turned into Vicarage Lane, or when it stopped, they found themselves all at once at the door of his house, and he was out before another syllable passed. Emma then felt it indispensable to wish him a good night. The compliment was just returned, coldly and proudly, and under indescribable irritation of spirits, she was then conveyed to Hartfield. There she was welcomed with the utmost delight by her father, who had been trembling for the dangers of a solitary drive from Vicarage Lane, turning a corner which he could never bear to think of, and in strange hands, a mere common coachman, no James, and there it seemed as if her return only were wanted to make everything go well, for Mr. John Knightley, ashamed of his ill-humour, was now all kindness and attention, and so particularly solicitous for the comfort of her father, as to seem, if not quite ready to join him in a basin of gruel, perfectly sensible of its being exceedingly wholesome. And the day was concluding in peace and comfort to all their little party, except herself. But her mind had never been in such perturbation, and it needed a very strong effort to appear attentive and cheerful, till the usual hour of separating allowed her the relief of quiet reflection. End of chapter 15《ぼうぼう》Chapter Sixteen of Emma. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Emma by Jane Austen. Volume One, Chapter Sixteen. The hair was curled and the maid sent away, and Emma sat down to think and be miserable. It was a wretched business indeed. Such an overthrow of everything she had been wishing for. Such a development of everything most unwelcome. Such a blow for Harriet! That was the worst of all. Every part of it brought pain and humiliation of some sort or other. But compared with the evil to Harriet, all was light. And she would gladly have submitted to feel yet more mistaken, more in error, more disgraced by misjudgment than she actually was, could the effects of her blunders have been confined to herself. If I had not persuaded Harriet into liking the man, I could have borne anything. He might have doubled his presumption to me. But poor Harriet! How she could have been so deceived! He protested that he had never thought seriously of Harriet. Never! She looked back as well as she could. But it was all confusion. She had taken up the idea, she supposed, and made everything bend to it. His manners, however, must have been unmarked, wavering, dubious, or she could not have been so misled. The picture! How eager he had been about the picture! And the charade! And an hundred other circumstances! How clearly they had seemed to point at Harriet! To be sure, the charade, with its ready wit! But then, the soft eyes! In fact, it suited neither. It was a jumble without taste or truth. Who could have seen through such thick-headed nonsense? Certainly, she had often, especially of late, thought his manners to herself unnecessarily gallant. But it had passed as his way, as a mere error of judgment, of knowledge, of taste, as one proof among others that he had not always lived in the best society, that with all the gentleness of his address, true elegance was sometimes wanting. But till this very day she had never for an instant suspected it to mean anything but grateful respect to her as Harriet's friend. To Mr. John Knightley she was indebted for her first idea on the subject, for the first start of its possibility. There was no denying that those brothers had penetration. She remembered what Mr. Knightley had once said to her about Mr. Elton, the caution he had given, the conviction he had professed that Mr. Elton would never marry indiscreetly, and blushed to think how much truer a knowledge of his character had been there shown than any she had reached herself. It was dreadfully mortifying. But Mr. Elton was proving himself, in many respects, the very reverse of what she had meant and believed him proud, assuming, conceited, very full of his own claims, and little concerned about the feelings of others. Contrary to the usual course of things, Mr. Elton's wanting to pay his addresses to her had sunk him in her opinion. His professions and his proposals did him no service. She thought nothing of his attachment, and was insulted by his hopes. He wanted to marry well, and having the arrogance to raise his eyes to her, pretended to be in love. But she was perfectly easy as to his not suffering any disappointment that need be cared for. There had been no real affection either in his language or manners. 
sighs and fine words had been given in abundance, but she could hardly devise any set of expressions, or fancy any tone of voice, less allied with real love. She need not trouble herself to pity him. He only wanted to aggrandize and enrich himself, and of Miss Woodhouse of Hartfield, the heiress of thirty thousand pounds, were not quite so easily obtained as he had fancied, he would soon try for Miss Somebody Else with twenty, or with ten. But that he should talk of encouragement, and should consider her as aware of his views, accepting his attentions, meaning, in short, to marry him, should suppose himself her equal in connection or mind, look down upon her friend, so well understanding the gradations of rank below him, and be so blind to what rose above, as to fancy himself showing no presumption in addressing her. It was most provoking. Perhaps it was not fair to expect him to feel how very much he was her inferior in talent, and all the elegancies of mind. The very want of such equality might prevent his perception of it. But he must know that in fortune and consequence she was greatly his superior. He must know that the Woodhouses had been settled for several generations at Hartfield, the younger branch of a very ancient family, and that the Eltons were nobody. The landed property of Hartfield certainly was inconsiderable, being but a sort of notch in the Donwell Abbey estate, to which all the rest of Highbury belonged. But their fortune, from other sources, was such as to make them scarcely secondary to Donwell Abbey itself, in every other kind of consequence. And the Woodhouses had long held a high place in the consideration of the neighbourhood, which Mr. Elton had first entered not two years ago, to make his way as he could, without any alliances but in trade, or anything to recommend him to notice but his situation and his civility. But he had fancied her in love with him. That evidently must have been his dependence. And after raving a little about the seeming incongruity of gentle manners and a conceited head, Emma was obliged in common honesty to stop, and admit that her own behaviour to him had been so complacent and obliging, so full of courtesy and attention, as, supposing her real motive unperceived, might warrant a man of ordinary observation and delicacy, like Mr. Elton, in fancying himself a very decided favourite. If she had so misinterpreted his feelings, she had little right to wonder that he, with self-interest to blind him, should have mistaken hers. The first error and the worst lay at her door. It was foolish, it was wrong, to take so active a part in bringing any two people together. It was adventuring too far, assuming too much, making light of what ought to be serious, a trick of what ought to be simple. She was quite concerned and ashamed, and resolved to do such things no more. "'Here have I,' said she, "'actually talked poor Harriet into being very much attached to this man. She might never have thought of him but for me, and certainly never would have thought of him with hope, if I had not assured her of his attachment, for she is as modest and humble as I used to think him. Oh, that I might have been satisfied with persuading her not to accept young Martin! There I was quite right. That was well done of me. But there I should have stopped, and left the rest to time and chance. I was introducing her into good company, and giving her the opportunity of pleasing some one worth having. I ought not to have attempted more. But now, poor girl, her peace is cut up for some time. I have been but half a friend to her, and if she were not to feel this disappointment so very much, I am sure I have not an idea of anybody else who would be at all desirable for her. William Cox! Oh, no! I could not endure William Cox, a pert young lawyer!" She stopped to blush and laugh at her own relapse, and then resumed a more serious, more dispiriting cogitation upon what had been, and might be, and must be. The distressing explanation she had to make to Harriet, and all that poor Harriet would be suffering, with the awkwardness of future meetings, the difficulties of continuing or discontinuing the acquaintance, of subduing feelings, concealing resentment, and avoiding éclat, were enough to occupy her in most unmirthful recollections some time longer and she went to bed at last with nothing settled but the conviction of her having blundered most dreadfully. To youth and natural cheerfulness like Emma's, though under temporary gloom at night, the return of day will hardly fail to bring return of spirits. The youth and cheerfulness of morning are in happy analogy, and of powerful operation, and if the distress be not poignant enough to keep the eyes unclosed, they will be sure to open to sensations of softened pain and brighter hope. 
Emma got up on the morrow more disposed for comfort than she had gone to bed, more ready to see alleviations of the evil before her, and to depend on getting tolerably out of it. It was a great consolation that Mr. Elton should not really be in love with her, or so particularly amiable as to make it shocking to disappoint him. That Harriet's nature should not be of that superior sort in which the feelings are most acute and retentive, and that there could be no necessity for anybody's knowing what had passed except the three principals, and especially for her father's being given a moment's uneasiness about it. These were very cheering thoughts, and the sight of a great deal of snow on the ground did her further service, for anything was welcome that might justify their all three being quite asunder at present. The weather was most favourable for her though Christmas Day she could not go to church. Mr. Woodhouse would have been miserable had his daughter attempted it, and she was therefore safe from either exciting or receiving unpleasant and most unsuitable ideas. The ground covered with snow, and the atmosphere in that unsettled state between frost and thaw, which is of all others the most unfriendly for exercise, every morning beginning in rain or snow, and every evening setting into freeze, she was for many days a most honourable prisoner. No intercourse with Harriet possible but by note no church for her on Sunday any more than on Christmas Day, and no need to find excuses for Mr. Elton's absenting himself. It was weather which might fairly confine everybody at home, and though she hoped and believed him to be really taking comfort in some society or other, it was very pleasant to have her father so well satisfied with his being all alone in his own house, too wise to stir out, and to hear him say to Mr. Knightley, whom no weather could keep entirely from them, "'Ah, oh, Mr. Knightley! Why do you not stay at home like poor Mr. Elton?" These days of confinement would have been, but for her private perplexities, remarkably comfortable, as such seclusion exactly suited her brother, whose feelings must always be of great importance to his companions, and he had besides so thoroughly cleared off his ill-humour at Randall's, that his amiableness never failed him during the rest of his stay at Hartfield. He was always agreeable and obliging, and speaking pleasantly of everybody. But with all the hopes of cheerfulness, and all the present comfort of delay, there was still such an evil hanging over her in the hour of explanation with Harriet, as made it impossible for Emma to be ever perfectly at ease. End of chapter 16 Volume 1, Chapter 17 of Emma. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Emma by Jane Austen. Volume 1, Chapter 17. Mr. and Mrs. John Knightley were not detained long at Hartfield. The weather soon improved enough for those to move who must move, and Mr. Woodhouse having, as usual, tried to persuade his daughter to stay behind with all her children, was obliged to see the whole party set off, and return to his lamentations over the destiny of poor Isabella, which poor Isabella, passing her life with those she doted on, full of their merits, blind to their faults, and always innocently busy, might have been a model of right feminine happiness. The evening of the very day on which they went brought a note from Mr. Elton to Mr. Woodhouse, a long, civil, ceremonious note, to say, with Mr. Elton's best compliments, that he was proposing to leave Highbury the following morning in his way to Bath, where, in compliance with the pressing entreaties of some friends, he had engaged to spend a few weeks, and very much regretted the impossibility he was under, from various circumstances of weather and business, of taking a personal leave of Mr. Woodhouse, of whose friendly civilities he should ever retain a grateful sense, and had Mr. Woodhouse any commands, should be happy to attend to them. Emma was most agreeably surprised. Mr. Elton's absence just at this time was the very thing to be desired. She admired him for contriving it, though not able to give him much credit for the manner in which it was announced. Resentment could not have been more plainly spoken, than in a civility to her father, from which she was so pointedly excluded. She had not even a share in his opening compliments. Her name was not mentioned, and there was so striking a change in all this, and such an ill-judged solemnity of leave-taking in his graceful acknowledgments, as she thought at first could not escape her father's suspicion. It did, however. Her father was quite taken up with the surprise of so sudden a journey, and his fears that Mr. Elton might never get safely to the end of it, and saw nothing extraordinary in his language. It was a very useful note, for it supplied them with fresh matter for thought and conversation during the rest of their lonely evening. Mr. Woodhouse talked over his alarms, and Emma was in spirits to persuade them away with all her usual promptitude. 
She now resolved to keep Harriet no longer in the dark. She had reason to believe her nearly recovered from her cold, and it was desirable that she should have as much time as possible for getting the better of her other complaint before the gentleman's return. She went to Mrs. Goddard's accordingly the very next day, to undergo the necessary penance of communication. And a severe one it was. She had to destroy all the hopes which she had been so industriously feeding, to appear in the ungracious character of the one preferred, and acknowledge herself grossly mistaken and misjudging in all her ideas on one subject, all her observations, all her convictions, all her prophecies for the last six weeks. The confession completely renewed her first shame, and the sight of Harriet's tears made her think that she should never be in charity with herself again. Harriet bore the intelligence very well, blaming nobody, and in everything testifying such an ingenuousness of disposition, and lowly opinion of herself, as must appear with particular advantage at that moment to her friend. Emma was in the humour to value simplicity and modesty to the utmost, and all that was amiable, all that ought to be attaching, seemed on Harriet's side, not her own. Harriet did not consider herself as having anything to complain of. The affection of such a man as Mr. Elton would have been too great a distinction. She never could have deserved him, and nobody but so partial and kind a friend as Miss Woodhouse would have thought it possible. Her tears fell abundantly, but her grief was so truly artless, that no dignity could have made it more respectable in Emma's eyes and she listened to her and tried to console her with all her heart and understanding, really for the time convinced that Harriet was a superior creature of the two, and that to resemble her would be more for her own welfare and happiness than all that genius or intelligence could do. It was rather too late in the day to set about being simple-minded and ignorant, but she left her with every previous resolution confirmed of being humble and discreet, and repressing imagination all the rest of her life. Her second duty now, inferior only to her father's claims, was to promote Harriet's comfort, and endeavour to prove her own affection in some better method than by matchmaking. She got her to Hartfield, and showed her the most unvarying kindness, striving to occupy and amuse her, and by books and conversation, to drive Mr. Elton from her thoughts. Time, she knew, must be allowed for this being thoroughly done, and she could suppose herself but an indifferent judge of such matters in general, and very inadequate to sympathise in an attachment to Mr. Elton in particular. But it seemed to her reasonable that at Harriet's age, and with the entire extinction of all hope, such a progress might be made towards a state of composure, by the time of Mr. Elton's return, as to allow them all to meet again in the common routine of acquaintance, without any danger of betraying sentiments or increasing them. Harriet did think him all perfection, and maintained the non-existence of anybody equal to him in person or goodness, and did, in truth, prove herself more resolutely in love than Emma had foreseen. But yet it appeared to her so natural, so inevitable to strive against an inclination of that sort unrequited, that she could not comprehend its continuing very long in equal force. If Mr. Elton, on his return, made his own indifference as evident and indubitable as she could not doubt he would anxiously do, she could not imagine Harriet's persisting to place her happiness in the sight or the recollection of him. Their being fixed, so absolutely fixed, in the same place, was bad for each, for all three. Not one of them had the power of removal, or of effecting any material change of society. They must encounter each other, and make the best of it. Harriet was farther unfortunate in the tone of her companions at Mrs. Goddard's, Mr. Elton being the adoration of all the teachers and great girls in the school, and it must be at Hartfield only that she could have any chance of hearing him spoken of with cooling moderation, or repellent truth. Where the wound had been given, there must the cure be found, if anywhere. And Emma felt that, till she saw her in the way of cure, there could be no true peace for herself. End of chapter 17 Volume One, Chapter Eighteen of Emma. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Emma by Jane Austen. Volume One, Chapter Eighteen. Mr. Frank Churchill did not come. When the time proposed drew near, Mrs. Weston's fears were justified in the arrival of a letter of excuse. For the present, he could not be spared, to his very great mortification and regret but still he looked forward with the hope of coming to Randall's at no distant period. Mrs. Weston was exceedingly disappointed. 
much more disappointed, in fact, than her husband, though her dependence on seeing the young man had been so much more sober. But a sanguine temper, though for ever expecting more good than occurs, does not always pay for its hopes by any proportionate depression. It soon flies over the present failure, and begins to hope again. For half an hour Mr. Weston was surprised and sorry, but then he began to perceive that Frank's coming two or three months later would be a much better plan, better time of year, better weather, and that he would be able without any doubt to stay considerably longer with them than if he had come sooner. These feelings rapidly restored his comfort, while Mrs. Weston, of a more apprehensive disposition, foresaw nothing but a repetition of excuses and delays, and after all her concern for what her husband was to suffer, suffered a great deal more herself. Emma was not at this time in a state of spirits to care really about Mr. Frank Churchill's not coming, except as a disappointment at Randall's. The acquaintance at present had no charm for her. She wanted rather to be quiet and out of temptation. But still, as it was desirable that she should appear in general like her usual self, she took care to express as much interest in the circumstance, and enter as warmly into Mr. and Mrs. Weston's disappointment as might naturally belong to their friendship. She was the first to announce it to Mr. Knightley, and exclaimed quite as much as was necessary, or, being acting a part, perhaps rather more, at the conduct of the Churchills in keeping him away. She then proceeded to say a good deal more than she felt, of the advantage of such an addition to their confined society in Surrey, the pleasure of looking at somebody new, the gala day to Highbury and Tyre, which the sight of him would have made, and ending with reflections on the Churchills again, found herself directly involved in a disagreement with Mr. Knightley, and, to her great amusement, perceived that she was taking the other side of the question from her real opinion, and making use of Mrs. Weston's arguments against herself. "'The Churchills are very likely in fault.' said Mr. Knightley coolly. But I dare say he might come if he would. I do not know why you should say so. He wishes exceedingly to come. But his aunt and uncle will not spare him. I cannot believe that he has not the power of coming, if he made a point of it. It is too unlikely for me to believe it without proof. How odd you are! What has Mr. Frank Churchill done to make you suppose him such an unnatural creature? I am not supposing him at all an unnatural creature, in suspecting that he may have learnt to be above his connections, and to care very little for anything but his own pleasure, from living with those who have always set him the example of it. It is a great deal more natural than one could wish, that a young man, brought up by those who are proud, luxurious, and selfish, should be proud, luxurious, and selfish too. If Frank Churchill had wanted to see his father, he would have contrived it between September and January. A man at his age—what is he? three or four and twenty, cannot be without the means of doing as much as that. It is impossible." "'That's easily said and felt by you, who have always been your own master. You are the worst judge in the world, Mr. Knightley, of the difficulties of dependence. You do not know what it is to have tempers to manage." "'It is not to be conceived that a man of three or four and twenty should not have liberty of mind or limb to that amount. He cannot want money. He cannot want leisure. We know, on the contrary, that he has so much of both, that he is glad to get rid of them at the idlest haunts in the kingdom. We hear of him for ever at some watering-place or other. A little while ago he was at Weymouth. This proves that he can leave the Churchills." "'Yes, sometimes he can.' "'And those times are whenever he thinks it worth his while, whenever there is any temptation of pleasure.' "'It is very unfair to judge of anybody's conduct, without an intimate knowledge of their situation. Nobody who has not been in the interior of a family can say what the difficulties of any individual of that family may be. We ought to be acquainted with Enscombe, and with Mrs. Churchill's temper, before we pretend to decide upon what her nephew can do. He may, at times, be able to do a great deal more than he can at others." "'There is one thing, Emma, which a man can always do if he chooses, and that is, his duty. Not by manoeuvring and finessing, but by vigour and resolution. It is Frank Churchill's duty to pay this attention to his father. He knows it to be so, by his promises and messages. But if he wished to do it, it might be done. A man who felt rightly would say at once, simply and resolutely, to Mrs. Churchill, "'Every sacrifice of mere pleasure you will always find me ready to make to your convenience. But I must go and see my father immediately. I know he would be hurt by my failing in such a mark of respect to him on the present occasion. I shall therefore set off to-morrow.' 
If he would say so to her at once, in the tone of decision becoming a man, there would be no opposition made to his going." "'No,' said Emma, laughing. "'But perhaps there might be some made to his coming back again. Such language for a young man entirely dependent to use! Nobody but you, Mr. Knightley, would imagine it possible. But you have not an idea of what is requisite in situations directly opposite to your own. Mr. Frank Churchill, to be making such a speech as that to the uncle and aunt, who have brought him up, and are to provide for him! Standing up in the middle of the room, I suppose, and speaking as loud as he could! How can you imagine such conduct practicable?" "'Depend upon it, Emma. A sensible man would find no difficulty in it. He would feel himself in the right. And the declaration, made, of course, as a man of sense would make it, in a proper manner, would do him more good raise him higher, fix his interest stronger with the people he depended on, than all that a line of shifts and expedients can ever do. Respect would be added to affection. They would feel that they could trust him, that the nephew who had done rightly by his father would do rightly by them. For they know as well as he does, as well as all the world must know, that he ought to pay this visit to his father, and while meanly exerting their power to delay it, are in their hearts not thinking the better of him for submitting to their whims. Respect for right conduct is felt by everybody. If he would act in this sort of manner, on principle, consistently, regularly, their little minds would bend to his." "'I rather doubt that. You are very fond of bending little minds. But where little minds belong to rich people in authority, I think they have a knack of swelling out, till they are quite as unmanageable as great ones. I can imagine that if you, as you are, Mr. Knightley, were to be transported and placed all at once in Mr. Frank Churchill's situation, you would be able to say and do just what you have been recommending for him, and it might have a very good effect. The Churchills might not have a word to say in return. But then you would have no habits of early obedience and long observance to break through. To him who has, it might not be so easy to burst forth at once into perfect independence, and set all their claims on his gratitude and regard at naught. He may have as strong a sense of what would be right as you can have, without being so equal under particular circumstances to act up to it." "'Then it would not be so strong a sense. If it failed to produce equal exertion, it could not be an equal conviction." "'Oh, the difference of situation and habit! I wish you would try to understand what an amiable young man may be likely to feel in directly opposing those whom, as child and boy, he has been looking up to all his life." Our amiable young man is a very weak young man, if this be the first occasion of his carrying through a resolution to do right against the will of others. It ought to have been a habit with him by this time of following his duty, instead of consulting expediency. I can allow for the fears of the child, but not of the man. As he became rational, he ought to have roused himself and shaken off all that was unworthy in their authority. He ought to have opposed the first attempt on their side to make him slight his father. Had he begun as he ought, there would be no difficulty now." "'We shall never agree about him,' cried Emma. But that is nothing extraordinary. I have not the least idea of his being a weak young man. I feel sure that he is not. Mr. Weston would not be blind to folly, though in his own son. But he is very likely to have a more yielding, complying, mild disposition, than would suit your notions of a man's perfection. I dare say he has and though it may cut him off from some advantages, it will secure him many others." "'Yes, all the advantages of sitting still when he ought to move, and of leading a life of mere idle pleasure, and fancying himself extremely expert in finding excuses for it. He can sit down and write a fine, flourishing letter, full of professions and falsehoods, and persuade himself that he has hit upon the very best method in the world of preserving peace at home, and preventing his father's having any right to complain. His letters disgust me." "'Your feelings are singular. They seem to satisfy everybody else." "'I suspect they do not satisfy Mrs. Weston. They hardly can satisfy a woman of her good sense and quick feelings, standing in a mother's place, but without a mother's affection, to blind her. It is on her account that attention to Randall's is doubly due, and she must doubly feel the omission. Had she been a person of consequence herself, he would have come, I dare say and it would not have signified whether he did or no. Can you think your friend behind hand in these sort of considerations? Do you suppose she does not often say all this to herself? No, Emma, your amiable young man can be amiable only in French, not in English. 
He may be very aimable, have very good manners, and be very agreeable, but he can have no English delicacy toward the feelings of other people, nothing really amiable about him." "'You seem determined to think ill of him.' "'Me? Not at all,' replied Mr. Knightley, rather displeased. "'I do not want to think ill of him. I should be as ready to acknowledge his merits as any other man. But I hear of none, except what are merely personal, that he is well-grown and good-looking, with smooth, plausible manners." "'Well, if he have nothing else to recommend him, he will be a treasure at Highbury. We do not often look upon fine young men, well-bred and agreeable. We must not be nice, and ask for all the virtues into the bargain. Cannot you imagine, Mr. Knightley, what a sensation his coming will produce? There will be but one subject throughout the parishes of Donwell and Highbury, and one interest, one object of curiosity. It will be all Mr. Frank Churchill. We shall think and speak of nobody else." "'You will excuse my being so much overpowered. If I find him conversable, I shall be glad of his acquaintance. But if he is only a chattering coxcomb, he will not occupy much of my time or thoughts." "'My idea of him is, that he can adapt his conversation to the taste of everybody and has the power as well as the wish of being universally agreeable. To you he will talk of farming, to me of drawing or music, and so on to everybody, having that general information on all subjects which will enable him to follow the lead, or take the lead, just as propriety may require, and to speak extremely well on each. That is my idea of him." "'And mine,' said Mr. Knightley warmly is, that if he turn out anything like it, he will be the most insufferable fellow breathing. What! At three-and-twenty to be the king of his company, the great man, the practised politician, who is to read everybody's character, and make everybody's talents conduce to the display of his own superiority, to be dispensing his flatteries around that he may make all appear like fools compared with himself! My dear Emma, your own good sense could not endure such a puppy when it came to the point. I will say no more about him," said Emma. You turn everything to evil. We are both prejudiced, you against, I for him, and we have no chance of agreeing till he is really here. Prejudiced? I am not prejudiced. But I am very much, and without being at all ashamed of it. My love for Mr. and Mrs. Weston gives me a decided prejudice in his favour. He is a person whom I never think of from one month's end to another said Mr. Knightley, with a degree of vexation, which made Emma immediately talk of something else, though she could not comprehend why he should be angry. To take a dislike to a young man, only because he appeared to be of a different disposition from himself, was unworthy the real liberality of mind which she was always used to acknowledge in him. For with all the high opinion of himself, which she had often laid to his charge, she had never before for a moment supposed it could make him unjust to the merit of another. End of chapter 18 End of volume 1